Chapter 29 That night, the honored princept, Della Pinez, was awakened from an erotic dream by an urgent knock on her door. In the dream, Della had been with Ymir's harem, all seven of the women, which included the Winkin warrior now. Jenny Bell, Lily, Tori, Gatha, Ziziva, Ribby, and Curry, all naked and kneeling in some palace somewhere, in a room of red cushions and golden furniture. All their round bottoms were up, and all their sexes were wet and ready. Ymir was going to fuck every single one of the women, but first he was going to fuck Della. He was behind her, swollen with power, his cock rigid. The barbarian pushed her down. Della fell against Jenny Beljosen's shapely ass, her pubic hair trimmed to show the lips of her ohizi. Della could smell the swamp witch's sex. It seemed like a prophecy. Ymir growled as he pressed his ut into the princept for the first time. It was unbelievable. He stretched her out better than anyone. Then that fucking knocking woke her up. Della slid out of bed. Her nipples were hard and her panty were soaked. She put on a robe and hurried to her door. Opening it, she saw Onyeshka. The she-orc had her tusks out. More refugees from the swamp coast, but we have an elf queen also. And King Velus and one of his wives, as well as a retinue of their warriors. Della was having trouble concentrating. Her head was still full of both sleep and sex. She stood there without speaking. Why were all these visitors coming now? What had happened? Anyeshka spoke to fill the awkward silence. There are too many guests for the Imperial Palace. I suggest we ask for scholars to volunteer to move in with each other. Then we can use student housing for the ambassadors and refugees. Stormcry might have rooms. There are the fields of the farmers as well. The princept finally got a hold of her wits. All very good ideas. Tonight, we can put up tents in the practice fields. Fill sunfire first, then form, and then moons. If we have to, we can also use the flow field, but I'd like to use the arena only if we need to. I will dress and come down. In the morning, we can have Brodor get his best form scholars to build a shanty town against the Red Wall. I would rather that than disrupt the lives of our scholars. They have to prepare for their second exams. If only this could have waited until after the winter solstice festival. Anyeshka bowed and withdrew. Della washed her face, combed her hair, and put on a fresh pair of panty. She dressed in her robes and then used Moon's magic to float down to the first floor of the citadel. She hurried through the throne auditorium to the sun gate. There were travel-weary women there, wearing the lace and finery of the swamp coast. However, there was also an O'Learan carriage surrounded by sharp-faced elven archers. Human soldiers, mostly women, but some men, escorted another carriage, one that had come up from Crean. Anyeshka had roused other professors to help. Garum and his gruel wives started checking the travelers to make sure they were who they said they were. Issa Leal handled bringing in the elves. It seemed Lily's mother, Ellen Velia Nehenna herself, had come. Of course, the Queen of Greenholm wouldn't be staying in a tent on the sunfire field. They could change the reception room on the third floor into a room for the O'Learan royal. As for King Velis, he and his young wife Polly came to Della directly. King Velis brushed a hand over his big mustache, the subject of some controversy in more peaceful times. Princept, I'm sorry, but I had to come myself. It's important. Our spies on the Swamp Coast Queendom say that the Sorrow Coast is next, that Crean itself will be their next target. Nellie Bell Tucker, flanked by Ari Bellanderas, came rushing over to talk with Queen Polly. It seemed they were good friends. Ari and her cohort had her personal Jataksha soldiers with them, and the grim-faced winged women were on high alert, looking for any kind of danger. Most had the twin short swords, but some had spears. King Velis threw Nellie a long look.
which spoke volumes. It seemed the king was looking for another wife, and Nellie would be foolish not to jump at the chance. As a fishmonger's daughter, Nellie would never rule in Josen Town, no matter how much she schemed. She'd always only be an uppity servant to Ari and Darius. Della took that information in while agreeing to talk with King Velis in the morning, as long as he didn't mind spending the night in a tent on the sunfire field. Velis was still enough of a soldier to not complain about sleeping on the ground. Queen Ellen Velia approached Della next. Ellen Velia was older, but still stately and beautiful. Lily had gotten her platinum-spun hair and her emerald eyes from her mother. However, the queen wore her cuff, and she didn't have the mark of the sullied on her face. Ellen Velia bowed. Princept, it was mere coincidence that I arrived with the refugees. At this stage, Greenholm is safe, and our palace is protected by our soldiers. The elves had also closed their borders and hadn't offered a single soldier to the coalition of troops gathering at the southern border of the Holy Theranus Empire. Glaga the Blade, on the other hand, had cleared the fighting pits to send battalions of warriors to fight the demon conqueror. That surely made sense. Why fight in gladiatorial games when you could wet your sword with the blood of a demonic enemy? Della saw movement in the shadows. She thought it might be the spectral princept. But no, it was Jenny Beljosen. She stood near the door to the throne auditorium, smoking a caro stick. Her hood covered her pretty black hair. She seemed to have appeared there suddenly. Had she finally perfected her portal magic? Queen Ellen Velia cleared her throat. Is everything all right, most honored princept? Della smiled. Yes, I apologize. I'm wondering why you have come, your highness, especially since war plagues our continent's southern border. The Olyran woman blushed. It's my daughter. I need to speak with her as soon as possible. Anger filled the princept. She felt so keyed up so on edge after their difficult conversation about what forging the Eighth Ring might do. Then her sex dream offered her delights that had to wait. On top of that, her campus was awash in even more refugees. She was running a university, not a sanctuary. In two weeks, the examiners would come for second exams. During the coming winter solstice festival, they might have room, but not now. On top of all that... This O'Learan bitch wanted to reach out to her estranged daughter. It was poor timing, and Della told her so. Your Highness, you had a chance to speak to your daughter during the Kurzig Durga, but you chose not to. And while we had many dignitaries for the Death Grudge Tournament, we didn't have them camped in our practice fields. Your timing is suspicious. Queen Ellen Velia stepped forward and gripped Della's arm. I know my failings, I know my prejudices, and I can assure you, I know my hypocrisy. The death of Edrin Hyendel has affected me more than I can say. I want to mend fences while I can. Those green eyes search Della's face for kindness, for mercy, for understanding. The princept had never had children, could scarcely comprehend the idea, because she'd seen it before. Powerful people brought to their knees by familial obligations, both good and bad. Della might have shown the O'Learan some kindness, if not for how much Lily had suffered. If Lily agrees to see you, that is her affair. But you and I need to talk about Greenholm and the elven response to the demon conqueror in the Swamp Coast Queendom. The fact that you have secured your own borders and haven't offered to help gives me pause. Ellen Velia could have answered in any number of ways, some more polite than others. Instead, she nodded. I understand. I appreciate you letting me stay on your campus. I will accept both my daughter's wishes and yours. Then we understand each other, Della said sternly. We understand each other completely. The elven queen let go of the princept's arm. Yet Ellen Velia didn't glance away. Her eyes were full of pain, full of longing, 
And Della thought that maybe without her cuff on, the queen might kiss as sweetly as her daughter. But no, Ellen Velia was a true O'Learan, and Della had already explored that taboo with Ribby. It was the erotic dreams. Those dreams muddied the princeps's judgment. Another queen, Aribel Josen, laughed loudly, which was completely inappropriate, given the number of frightened people and the gravity of the situation. But then King Velus was laughing as well. Worse yet, Nellie giggled. Those fuckers. The world was on the edge of ruin, and they were acting like they were at a party. Issa Leal escorted the elven queen and her retinue into the imperial palace, guiding them to the reception room. They would hang curtains so the queen would have privacy. Della had an image of Queen Ellen Velia masturbating with a long glass phallus. Della felt the tingling, and then Jenny Bell drew close. Both were standing in the shadows thrown by the sunfire tower. So that was Lily's mother. I heard what you said, ma'am, and I have to say I'm glad. But unlike my fucking relatives, I think she was being honest. Ain't that a nice change of pace? You didn't talk to your sister, Della noted. Ain't got nothing to say to her. I severed my family connections the minute I claimed Ymir for my own. Best choice I ever made. Jenny Bell offered Della a hit off her caro stick. I didn't know you smoked, the princept said. She took it, against her better judgment, and inhaled the sweet smoke into her lungs. She exhaled. The swamp witch shrugged. I'm on again, off again with it. But I reckon that with the world falling apart, I might as well be on again. I'm the same, Della admitted. You appeared out of nowhere. Did you perfect portal magic? Jenny Bell laughed a little too loudly. Impossible doorways? Not yet, but I'm gonna figure it out. I can't fuck up my Dominus Studie, right? Ari Bell giggled more. Jenny shook her head. I heard more of my family were coming in, so I got up. But I don't see them. You want to try something with me tonight? We got to get this portal magic working. Nella knew it was the worst possible timing. After the dream, her loins ached. Being with Jenny after their kiss would be courting disaster. No, she couldn't allow herself to give in to temptation. And while Linny Lynn might be the spy, she might not. Someone else might be around, waiting for Della to sleep with a scholar so they could ruin her. At the same time, she knew she wasn't going to say no. She was going to take Jenny Bell to her apartment. They were going to drink wine, flirt. And if it came down to it, Della was going to either open portals in the world, or she was going to fuck this chesty swamp witch. She'd probably try to do both. Jenny Bell must have sensed something was off. If you don't want to, I'd understand, Princept. The swamp girl paused. You know, if you and I did figure out portal magic, and if we could set up wards, then what other people said wouldn't mean shit. You could do what you wanted, because you'd be able to protect all of them scared kings in their fancy palaces. The princept wasn't going to talk about sleeping with scholars out in the open, and she didn't want to be seen going up to her room together. Give me fifteen minutes, then come to my door. You know the way. Della left, buzzing with excitement. This was the worst possible time for her to give in to her temptation. Her school was crawling with refugees. Dignitaries from three powerful families were there. And Jenny was right. It seemed like the world was teetering on the edge. And yet, wasn't that always the case in her life? When she needed to be at her most moral, she would do the nastiest things. Up in her room, she poured herself a glass of wine. She smelled the musky perfume, and a part of her wanted to weep. Their sexy ghost had returned. Tonight you can play with a swamp coast woman, but it's not time for Ymir yet. Not yet.
You'll know when it's time. The princept shivered and drank half the glass. If you're here to watch me with Jenny Bell, I should invite Ymir up. We want to forge that last ring. We need you to translate the burned book. Where have you been, anyway? It's not time, and that's not the name of that book, Princept. It is the Accor Oriot, and it is a dark, dangerous thing. We have to wait. I know what must happen, dear Princept, but I don't look forward to this next part, for what my life must become, for what my death will be. Jenny Bell knocked. By the time the Princept answered the door, the spectral Serena Sia was gone. How could Serena die again? The Swamp Coast woman curtsied. It's an honor for me to get private tutoring after hours. And in your apartment? What you have in mind, Princept? The question came with a saucy smile. Dilla pulled the Swamp Witch inside. Let's work on the spell, girl. Then we can decide on what we want to do next. Della led Jenny up the stairs into her room. She poured Jenny a glass of the wine. No use working on the magic while we're thirsty. The Swamp Witch grinned. Of course not. She pulled the Cujan grimoire from a satchel and laid it on the table. It's flow magic. I can feel it. But this is the first of Ocho magic I've tried. What can you tell me? The princept opened the book up to a particular page. There. There is what we need to focus on. It starts with a flow cantrip, Jalu Delorum, and you focus on the flow, like you said. Then, when you can picture your destination, you open the portal to that place. For flow, I would imagine you use water, or ice, perhaps. But it don't work, Jenny complained. I can get the water into a circle, but if I try ice, it shatters apart. Della remembered something from Ymir's and Curry's stories about the night that Edrin died. You saw fire on Edrin's back patio, right? Have you tried sunfire? Jenny sipped her wine and set it down. Sunfire ain't my best. I can do a cantrip or two. Della had an idea. What if I give you the sunfire and you spin it into a portal? Perhaps that's the secret. It's a combination of magics, the flow to find the place, and sunfire to burn open the doorway. The impossible doorway, Jenny Bell murmured. Let's try it. Both of them finished their wine. Della couldn't keep her eyes off the swamp woman. In her dream, all the women had been on their hands and knees in front of Della. All of their asses had been in the air but the princept had licked Jenny Bell first, while Ymir slid his sex into hers. The lust was too much for the princept. She grabbed Jenny's wrist and pulled the swamp witch to her. I need another kiss first. I can't wait. Jenny giggled. Such a slutty teacher. I like feeling you up against me. We've all been talking about you about what we want to do to you when we graduate. Not sure I can wait that long. Della loved feeling Jenny Bell's big, pillowy tits pressing against her own. And then Della had that big ass in her hands. It was a bounty of pliant flesh. The two women kissed, and kissed hard. Jenny tasted like wine and caro. She smelled like perfume and horny girl. Before she knew it, Della had straddled Jenny's thigh and was rubbing herself on the scholar's leg. Jenny moaned. Then she didn't have the breath to moan. Neither did Della. Kissing this woman felt like heaven. It was Jenny that finally stepped back. Wait, I can't cast magic if I'm all sex drunk. Let's just do this and then get Ymir. He'll want to watch us. We can give him a show. That is a bad idea, Della gulped in a breath. You're temptation enough. If Ymir were in the room, if his cock was out, I don't think I could control myself. Jenny grinned. 
Oh, we'll keep you honest, Princept. We'll make a game of it. Della blinked. For a second, she really couldn't think. The swamp woman giggled. Jalu Delarum. Her focus ring flashed, and she started spinning her hands. The water in the air formed a circle, but Della could see that it would never coalesce. The princep then threw out a hand. Ignis Fashionara. She created a whirling ring of fire that turned Jenny's magic to steam. The temperature in the room soared. She'd used advanced sunfire magic just in case. The swamp woman hissed. Yes, I see it now. I see how it works. Jelu Devocho. She took that fire and increased the range. There was the scent of wood burning as the fire hit the floor. Adjust your flames, girl, Della admonished her. Let's not burn down my tower. Jenny did. She was sweating, and her more animal scent had overwhelmed her perfume. Della could see a room on the other side of the swirling flames. It was Ymir's bedroom. Impetuously, the princept hurled herself through that impossible door. Before she knew it, she was pulling Ymir out of his bed. Wake up, barbarian. Your swamp witch and I just might have saved us all. The barbarian was up, with a spell on his lips. But then he saw who it was. Della, by the axe man, what are you doing in my room? Lily was in that bed as well. She blinked. What's going on? Della didn't answer. She pulled him back through the circle of flames and into her apartment. She then saw he was naked, completely naked. Ymir crossed his arms. It seems Jenny has mastered her portal magic earlier than expected. Della couldn't answer. She was too busy looking at the beautiful man's oot. Chapter 30 Ymir stood in Della's apartment with the scent of burning wood in his nostrils. Jenny Bell's cheeks were flushed, and her eyes were bright. She'd been drinking. What else had she done in the princept's apartment? Della let her robes drop. She had on a camisole and her panty. And boots. We have mastered portal magic by combining the magics of two different schools. The author could have been far clearer on how the magic worked. Yeah, but it was pretty clear that Lucibel Coogin wanted to keep certain things a secret. Jenny wiped the sweat off her forehead. That was a lot. I'm not sure I could do that again anytime soon. It was your first time, child. Della smiled like she wasn't half naked. Ymir felt like he was dreaming. How else could he be suddenly standing naked next to the most honored princept? Della gripped Jenny's sweaty hand. Now, before we cast the portal magic, there was something we were doing. What was it? Jenny smiled at Della, then at Ymir. We were kissing, and I think we were going to do more, weren't we? Della moved behind Jenny. She kissed her neck and then her ear. The princept was staring at Ymir. I would like to maybe do a bit more. But you said we were going to play a game, one in which he wouldn't fuck me. Not until I graduate, Ymir agreed. We've gone over the questions before, but should you really be doing things with Jenny Bell? She's still a scholar. He knew the answer to that question. It would make Della a hypocrite, especially after what she'd said to Linny Lynn. However, Ymir didn't care. The princept gripped Jenny Bell's chest through the girl's dress. I know, Ymir, I shouldn't but I can't get enough of these tits. I want to look at them. I want to suck on them. Ymir's cock was hard. It pointed at the ceiling. With every word, it got hotter. Della wasn't finished. One hand cupped Jenny's pussy, hidden by the skirt. And I want to watch you fuck her. 
Jenny caught her hand, but instead of throwing it aside, she made sure the princept pushed harder on her ohi. But you can't fuck Della, Ymir. That's the game. You can put your dick in me, but not Della. Agreed? Agreed. Della hadn't been able to fully answer the three questions. That made what they were doing dangerous. But it wasn't as if Ymir could stop. Naked, seeing the two women there, his hard cock throbbed. He'd made love to Lily that night, but he was always ready for more. The elf girl's juices were still tacky on him, and he knew he smelled like her. Della pulled the dress up and over Jenny's head. The swamp woman was in her lingerie, a brassiere and panty. She, too, had her boots on. But the princept couldn't wait. She undid the brassiere, freeing Jenny's breasts. They were so full, so big, with such nice nipples. Della then pulled the panty down and off the girl. The princept put the underwear to her nose, inhaling Jenny's intimate scent. Does she smell nice, Della? Ymir asked. You should call me Princept. You should tell me how dirty I am to be sniffing the penny of my scholars. Ymir couldn't wait. He stroked himself. Very well, Princept. You shouldn't like smelling Jenny's cunt, but you do, don't you? Yes, Della yelped. But I have the real thing in front of me. She pulled Jenny over and threw her on the bed. The swamp woman went to get on her back, but Della didn't let her. She got Jenny on all fours, with her big tits hanging down. Jenny was crossways on the bed. Ymir walked over, right in front of Jenny's face. She gazed longingly at his cock. Della slapped the swamp woman's big, juicy ass. You can suck on it if you want. I'll get your pussy ready. Ymir stepped forward, and Jenny engulfed him in her mouth. Jenny might have grown up knowing the touch of women, but after three years together, she handled him well. Her mouth was warm and tight, and he couldn't help but grab her soft hair. While he claimed her mouth, Della fingered her hard. Can you taste Lily on me? Ymir asked. Jenny dropped his dick from her mouth. Yes, I love it. I love little Lily's sweet pussy. Then she had his oot back in her mouth. Ymir watched the princeps' muscles flex. A line of sweat dripped off the side of Della's face to splash on Jenny's ass. Her skin was red from where Della had slapped her. Della gave Ymir a wicked grin. You've been fucking her a lot, haven't you? I have three fingers in her. Let me try four. Jenny let out a muffled scream as the princept added another digit. Della fucked Jenny more, which made the swamp witch tighten her lips around his cock. Then the princept stepped back. She tossed off her camisole and made a show of painting her tits with Jenny Bell's girl cum. She smells so good. She tastes even better. Della sucked the cream off her fingers as she wiggled out of her panty. Della went back to fingering Jenny, but the princept also played with the swamp woman's big tits. Jenny loved rough nipple play. Ymir grabbed Jenny and stopped her motion. He was about to come, and he didn't want that. He needed to savor this. Every time Della broke and joined them, he wasn't sure if it was for the last time. He thought that maybe even after he graduated, the princept might still be reticent in joining them. Would she become a part of his harem? He could only dream of such a thing happening. The reality was Della had been alone for a long time, and she'd been married to her school for decades. To shift that would be hard for her. Della slapped the girl's ass again. I think she's ready for you. Jenny let out a shriek. But I haven't come yet. What if I want to come? Please, Princept, please let me come. Della laughed meanly. 
Okay, then, you little slut. Ymir and I will watch you come. But then he's going to fuck you, and you're going to lick my pussy. The princept grabbed her and positioned the swamp girl so she was in the middle of the bed, her face resting on the pillows near the headboard. Her ass was high in the air. Rub yourself, girl. Show your princept how you can make yourself come. Jenny Bell reached between her legs and rubbed her clit in big circles. Ymir loved the sight of her creamy slit, the swirl of her pink butthole, and her horny clit. He was surprised to feel Della behind him. She reached around and grabbed his big oot. You're such a big boy, she whispered. Why have I resisted such a big cock for so long? You know why, Ymir growled. Della stroked him. His pre-cum had made her hands slick. He thought about stopping her from pleasuring him. It would have been the right thing to do. But Ymir felt like he was beyond morality. Her hand felt so good around him. Then there was the sight of Jenny Bell about to come. She was gasping, rubbing herself, waving her ass around like she was hoping he'd break away from the princept and stick his oot into her. Then Jenny stopped rubbing stopped breathing, and he watched her holes convulse as her orgasm took her into a world of indescribable pleasure. Watching his horny wife made Ymir want to come. Della knew her way around a cock. She stopped seconds before he spewed. Then she forced him forward and onto the bed. Ymir grabbed Jenny and easily slipped into her clinging sex. She was looser now, after Della's hard fingering, but she was tight enough to feel like paradise around his throbbing cock. He thrust in and out of her. At the same time, Ymir thought about how many nights Della lay in this bed, touching herself, thinking of him and coming. And what about the many lovers that Della had had over the years? Helicia Heen, Beryl Delfino, Queen Dee Dee and her horny fairies, who just loved to play with their butterholes. The thoughts made him fuck Jenny harder. Della was to the side, pulling on Jenny's nipples, forcing her fingers into Jenny's mouth, and watching as Ymir slid his cock in and out of her. Jenny gagged at one point, and Della took her fingers out. The princept got her face in front of Jenny's. Am I being too hard, slut? Maybe, Jenny whimpered. You said you'd let me lick your pussy. Such a greedy little slut, Della purred. Do you want to eat your princept's pussy? Yes, please. Ymir paused, gripping Jenny's hips and forcing her not to move. He wasn't going to last much longer. Della got in front of the swamp woman and spread her legs. Ymir finally got a good view of his princept's oheezy. She had clipped her white hair down so her lips were clearly visible, as was her clit. She had such a classically shaped pussy. Jenny Bell didn't pause. She dove in and buried her face between the princept's legs. Della grabbed Jenny's hair and rode her face, her eyes on Ymir the whole time. Her nipples were so hard on her firm tits. How could she have such firm tits after 250 years? The princept closed her eyes, her face a mask of lust. I can't wait. I can't wait to come, and I can't wait for Ymir to fuck me. And then Della was coming. That made him come. There was no way for him to hold back. He shoved himself deep inside Jenny, and he gave himself over to the ecstasy. His orgasm lasted so long, felt so good, and all the while he was staring at Della's body, he was going to fuck her. He had to. 
You're filling her pussy full of cum, Della whimpered. You're coming in her ohisi. Ymir then watched the slutty princept come again. Della pushed Jenny Bell's face away from her twat. The swamp girl's mouth and chin were dripping. The princept got off the bed and knelt on the floor. Come here, Ymir. Come and let me taste her off your cock. Come and let me taste your cum. Again, this was taking things dangerously close to the edge. But seeing Della, sweaty and naked, blooms on her cheeks, made him lose control. He pulled his shaft out of Jenny and stood on the floor next to the bed. He was still hard. He'd rarely felt so full of tingles. Jenny Bell slid onto her side, smiling up at him with her wet face. Should I stop you two? You both agreed you couldn't have sex. Though technically speaking, this ain't sex. Once again, Della had her fingers around his shaft. This isn't sex. I just want to suck on him. I just want to feel him in my mouth again. She gripped him and sniffed his thighs, sniffed his balls, and then licked her way up his creamy dick. How do I taste? Jenny Bell asked. So fucking good, slut. You taste so fucking good. But he tastes better. Della then brought her lips around his head, her tongue swirling over his helmet. She knew what she was doing. She was a master. Jenny Bell wasn't just going to watch. She got down on the floor next to Della, and this time, it was the swamp woman who played with the princeps tits and fingered her pussy, until Della stopped sucking on him. Your turn, Jenny. I don't want to be greedy. Jenny grinned. But you cleaned him off. I won't taste his cum. I won't taste myself. The swamp woman then took a turn pleasuring Ymir. Both of them did, going back and forth, until Della couldn't wait. She clutched a handful of Jenny's hair, and she pulled her off him. I have to taste him, Jenny, but I want to come when I taste him. Get under me, bitch. Let me ride your face while I suck the cum out of Ymir's cock. Jenny did as she was told. There was a rug around Della's bed. Jenny laid down on it. Her breasts sagged to the side as she spread her legs to rub her clit again. At the same time, Della straddled Jenny's face. The princept wasn't messing around. She stroked Ymir hard, growling as she sucked on him. She would take him deep into her throat, choking, gagging, and then back off with spit hanging from her lips. That only helped her jack him off harder. It wasn't enough for Della. She leaned forward and took him in her mouth. Ymir was too full of lust to stop her. Della was whimpering, whining, orgasming as she sucked hard on him. It was clear she wanted his cum, and she wanted her own pussy to cum. He'd just orgasmed, but the princept's mouth felt too good on him. He unloaded into Della's mouth. She swallowed every drop. At the time, she was grunting her way through her own orgasm. Jenny's orgasmic grunts were muffled as she rubbed herself. Her legs were stiff out in front of her. After the blissful spasms left him, Ymir's legs felt so weak he had to sit. He tried to get on the bed, missed it, and wound up on the floor on his ass. Della collapsed on the bare floor. Jenny Bell sat with her back to the bed, hugging her knees. Both women still had their boots on. That made them look even sexier. Ymir chuckled. So, it seems you two have mastered portal magic. Jenny rolled her eyes. I wouldn't say we mastered it, and it's going to take some practice before I can do it on my own. But yeah, we made a start. Della lay on her side. Her face was flushed from the sex. Of course, in the official record, we won't be able to mention how opening the portal led to hot fucking. We'll have to leave that out. She then stared into Ymir's eyes. 
This is the last time, Ymir. Do you hear me? No more until you graduate. I have refugees and world events to attend to. And in two weeks, you have your second exam. Jenny crawled over and kissed Della's cheek. But Della, we could have such a wonderful winter solstice festival together. Are you sure? Ymir answered for her. She's sure. The princept then told him what Serena Sia had said, that she was waiting for the right time to translate the burned book. It seemed waiting was in his future. He would be waiting for all sorts of things, including the affections of his princept. Chapter 31 Ymir stood in front of the potioneer's table in his second exam, mixing together various liquids and compounds, though he thought the entire idea of taking tests during a time of war was stupid. It had been two weeks since his night with Della, where once again he felt her lips around his sex. Those two weeks had been filled with classes, study, and an endless parade of refugees. Horencia the Raven had solidified her hold on the swamp coast, she picked her favorites among the conquered peoples, and those that fought her either died in their beds or were forced to flee to the borders. There were rumors of green fire and the choking stench of roses. The coalition of Orc and Holy Theranus Empire troops on the border, along with armies from the Sorrow Coast Kingdom and the Farmington Collective, stood strong. They dug trenches and built walls, but almost everyone assumed that the next demon attack would include portal magic. Thanks to Jenny Bell and Della, all of the universities across Thera were studying the Flo Devocho sorcery to try to recreate the portal magic, as well as perfect the wards to prevent anyone from teleporting into their barracks and palaces. Creating wards to guard castles wasn't going to be easy. Ymir loved Jenny's excitement. She'd made such progress on her Dominus Studie. That took some of the sting out of seeing her sister on a daily basis. It was still rough on her, though. Gatha didn't hide the rage in her eyes when she saw Jenny suffering. Seeing the cold hatred between the two sisters brought back too many memories for the she-orc. Lily also had her challenges. She couldn't find the strength to see her mother. Queen Ellen Velia was being patient. She wasn't leaving. Neither were King Vellus and his little wife, Polly, who got along so well with Nellie Bell Tucker. From the looks Nellie was giving King Vellus, despite his mustache, it was only a matter of time before the monarch added another woman to his harem. Ymir had to pull himself from his reverie. The examiner was standing behind him while he worked on his potions. The examiner had on a mask shaped like an open palm, the symbol of flow magic as well as a black cloak. Who she was didn't matter. Ymir and his potioneer's table were surrounded by darkness, an unnatural black summoned by the examiner. Ymir used a sunfire burner to melt the ice taken from the top of the flow tower. That would create the infinity ice. He also had Vamor powder burning. A vial of aquavidim, a precious brandy brewed only by the Olira, would be the main ingredient. It was a special potion to increase the power of his flow magic, to see through the veil. Ymir, though, also had the veiled tear ring. He thought about wearing all of the Akiric rings for his exams, but they still weren't ready to expose their work just yet. Ymir finished three potions. One, he drank down. It burned his throat, which he enjoyed. He liked the taste of the aquavidim. He muttered, Jalu Jalarum. He'd made the potion well. He felt connected to the examiner's mind. He didn't plumb the depths of her intellect, since that wasn't the assignment. He did wave his hands and change the darkness into a map. He placed the potioneer's table, himself, and the examiner at the top of the Diuvan Mountains. He then poured all that he had learned into the mind of the examiner, the good kings giving way to the Pentacore, the five demon kings who ruled different parts of that faraway continent, Ecom on the Dawn Coast, which included a place called Falwater, largely forgotten until recently, Deve in the Nectar grasslands, Treen in the Morbu and Skor forests, Chotvar in the Diuvan mountains, 
but the greatest of the Pentacor was Pancham in the far west, the Ashchima Wastes. But those weren't their real names. Ymir kept their real names, Shai Amalia, Haley Gold, Bly, Kyla, and Lucy the Last, hidden in his mind. The demons had created different races in an attempt to solve the problem of the Great Disease, otherwise known as the Withering. Things called Firebloods, or the Kenkar, or the Morbi, which were demonic monkey men. The Snow Nagas were another example, as were the Sukra Jin, the four-armed demon people living in the Ashchima Wastes. He then drew comparisons between Ethra, also known as Zid, and Reta, known as Ridrita to the Zidians. For example, Zid had the good kings, while Ridrita had the heavenly Kopax. Both had been splintered once those good governments were destroyed by demons. Ethra broke into different regions. Reta reduced their countries to city-states. And both had their demons. The minute Ymir thought about Shapta, who might not have ever existed, the test changed to quiz him on demonology. The darkness around him returned, and from it emerged something out of legend, a grongy demon, which was an old swamp story from the mangrove forests of the Barrier River near the city of Pansaloka. The grongy had four faces and a dozen arms, each ending in a single sharpened bone point. It walked on hooves like a goat. Ymir marveled at how many myths there were about demons. Most of them were about as true as your typical ghost story. What better way to hide true evil than to shroud it in a bunch of nonsense? Ymir knew what would dispel the grongy demon. He took his second potion, one he'd learned from the forbidden book he'd been reading with Tori, and threw the elixir into the demon's nightmare faces. Eight red eyes, four fang-filled mouths, four clownishly large noses. But then another devil came out of the darkness. This was an elven spirit from the Viridis Peninsula. It was a woman in a white gown with the head of a snake. Ymir remembered the magic this needed, and he took simple salt and tossed it while using a flow cantrip. Jelu Inanis. The snake-headed woman vanished. More ghouls surrounded him. Some were from Farmington Collective stories, monsters who killed crops and ate livestock. Others were from the Aquaterab, big-eyed monstrosities who pulled you down into the blue dark to smother you. Others were from the dwarves, devilish miners, who caused cave-ins or led you into caverns where they purposefully made you lost. A shambling despoir came forward. It was enormous, covered in shadowy fur that stank of corruption. Ymir summoned a battle axe made of ice. Using Moon's magic, he walked on air and dodged the thing's rusty red claws. Ymir drove the blade into the thing's head. It was the one weak spot. With its skull cleaved in half, it vanished. Ymir floated back to the ground and dispelled his ice axe. He held up a hand. I can name all the demons and I can dispel them, but I want to get on with my Dominus Studie. I've taken exam after exam, and while they were interesting at first, I grow weary of them. The examiner stood silent in her mask. Finally, she asked, and how would you like to show me the progress you've made on your Dominus Studie? The phantasms around them vanished. Sunfire torches flickered on, giving them light. It was the simple stone square room again. Ymir was about to change that. He could have used the gather breath ring to steal soul energy from the examiner, but instead he drank down his last potion. The magic ignited a cold fire in his core. Jelu Fashionara. Ymir formed an ice sculpture of the Night of Fire. On the rooftops of Castle Skyreach, the Vimperagel Aquador and his armored Corvidae fought Lenala Hana and her fellowship of the enraged. Egil fought Fion Yamal, the clansman who didn't have a duja, but he did have a barbarian's quickness and savagery. Egil had tried to use the crystal null ring, but nothing had happened. Egil might have used the other rings, but Fion didn't relent. The Vemper ended up fighting for his life. Ymir explained the characters, 
the series of events, and then he pointed at an archway. It was where Edrin Hyendel stood, a coward who had been too afraid to fight. There were eight in the main attack team, Ymir explained. Seven of the fellowships squared off against the Corvidae. A soulless barbarian fought Egil Acrador, but Edrin was there as well. He didn't fight, though. Lucky there was someone else there. Ymir fashioned the dragon, Unger, and he added frozen flames to the sculpture. This is the history I want to write, the true story of the Night of Fire, the biographies and the legacy. Unger wasn't killed that night. He lived on, becoming the leader of the Silent Scream and creating the Midnight Guild, all to manipulate events. The examiner took a long time to comment. A dragon manipulating us? It sounds like the stories of the Game Master. What documents do you have? I have Edrin Hyendel's library, his fictional account. But more than that, scholars and magicians for centuries have been unable to scry that night. I can. How? the examiner asked. Ymir grinned, head raised high. You will see once I finish my Dominus Studie. The examiner had a warning for him. You will not pass without proof. Ymir walked up and stared into the mild brown eyes of the examiner. I don't care about passing. I've almost gotten what I needed from this school. It's my home, and I love its people, but graduation means very little to me. But I'll have proof. I'll make my princept proud. And he said no more. Of course he passed his second exam. He'd passed all of his exams easily, except that first one. But then he'd been sabotaged by Nellie Bell Tucker. It was a slight he'd ignored. Maybe he shouldn't have. Leaving the dungeons of the float tower, Ymir came out to a cold, misty rain. The winter solstice lights twinkled here and there. The entire campus had been decorated. Even the shantytown surrounding the college had its festive cheer. Ymir was struck by both the hope of that, celebrating even in a time of sorrow, and the magic involved. The sorcery gave them literal light in the darkness. And to think, his clan would be so frightened of the powers involved. He'd grown up in such a different place. He thought he'd get a drink to celebrate. Ziziva might be able to step away from the store, or Tori might be making a new batch of the Amorazilka, and the various products they manufactured for their business. He took a right and traipsed down the sea stair market in his waterproof robes, which still had the leather work that he'd added. His clothes were like his soul now, a mixture of magical cloth and deer leather, the old and the new. Even the fact that he was thinking in metaphors was striking. Yes, he had changed. His life was so different now. He thought of what Grandfather Bear always said. The truth is buried in the heart of a good story. What was the truth in the story of his life? When he'd been cursed by the demon, one of Egil Acrador's wives, as it turned out, he'd thought his life was over. He'd come to the magic school to get rid of the curse. Instead, he'd embraced it. That curse had led him down a path of mystery, magic, and love, the love of seven women. The truth? He'd not shied away from the strange path the Axemen had hewed for him. And though forging this eighth ring was dangerous, he wasn't about to stop. The exams no longer meant anything to him. The true test was forging this one last ring. The sea stair market had ropes of twinkling lights everywhere, People wore jaunty hats and dressed in reds and greens. There was finery and sweetness everywhere. The heavy scent of wood fires mixed with the perfume of candy and food. The paradise tree would be busier than ever. Many people gave their loved ones sweets from their shop. Some even traveled great distances to buy candy from Ymir's shop. Even with war and demons, that hadn't changed. Ymir was standing at the steps, taking in all the sights, sounds, and smells, when he saw Ari Bell sashaying toward him. Her walk was ridiculous. 
She was cruel and stupid and arrogant. Darius, Nellie, and Odd Corey trailed behind her. Ymir didn't see her Winkin guard right away. They were there, though, a few circling in the rainy sky above. Others sat on the tops of the buildings. There were twelve of them, mostly hard-faced women, but there were a few sullen men as well. All wore the Winkin armor. Ari smiled at him. I wanted to come and wish you a happy winter solstice, Ymir, and maybe talk to you about joining my queendom as my husband. Ymir knew every word was elk shit. Why had she really come to talk with him? Chapter 32 Ymir had started out his career playing the twisted games of a swamp woman. In the end, he'd won the heart of Jenny Beljosen. But with these water-toothed terrors in front of him, Ari, Nelly, Darius, and Odd Corey, he knew they didn't have any hearts. And if they did, they were like the smelly tundra mud of late August, when the ground frost finally melted completely and the summer foliage started to rot away. Ymir noticed Roger Nilnap standing in the back. Why was he friends with those heartless shit beetles? Ymir smiled at Ari. But you don't have a queendom. Shapta has your palace and your city. Isn't that right? Ari shrugged. But we have people here. They see me as their queen. It's called a diaspora. Ymir threw a glance at the Kujan boy. It's a good word. I'm assuming you came up with it, Darius. Nelly threw an elbow into Ari. Oh, he called it. Darius was looking at him closely, and Ymir didn't like it. Odd Corey smirked. Ymir preferred that boy smirking rather than talking. Ymir would have found this pointless, but all four of them had been drinking. He could smell it on them, and they had the bluster of someone just this side of drunk. Drunk people talked. If there was anything going on, he might learn something. Ymir smiled. No, Ari Bell, you are right. You are the queen of the Swamp Coast diaspora. Was it very difficult losing Josentown to the invading army? Another shrug. We'll get it back. We have someone talking to Queen Shapta. They want me to do it, but I don't want to. I find that boring. Darius, though. Darius would talk to her. Wouldn't you? Ari grabbed his arm, flung it over her shoulder, and leaned into him. Ymir didn't point out that she called Shapta a queen and not a king. Horencia the raven was a queen. He also found it interesting that she was so willing to talk about secret communications with the demon conqueror. You know, your highness, perhaps I could talk to Queen Shapta. I thought about taking my harem and dealing with her directly. There had been some idle chatter about such a thing, but Ymir wasn't going to do a thing until he forged the Eighth Ring. Besides, for now, Horencia hadn't moved on them. Darius sighed. It's King Shapta, right? You made a mistake, Ari. Ari giggled. What's the difference between a king or a queen anyway? Odd Cory guffawed. A big demon cock. Darius nodded at Ymir. The way I heard it, on the night Edrin Hyenda was killed, you only fought a few rat wings, a hell knight, and a little spider. But you all almost died. Big spider, Ymir grinned. We didn't almost die. You have heard incorrectly. So is there a way I can talk with King Shapta? Ari rolled her eyes, and Ymir saw this sisterly resemblance. We'd not use our people for you. We only use them for us. I'm going to get my queendom back eventually. We're going to use diplomatic relations. She looked at Nellie. It was a long look. Ymir could understand its meaning. Ari had no real diplomatic sense. However, if Nellie was able to marry King Velis, she might be able to forge some kind of empire with Ari, comprised of the Swamp Coast and the Sorrow Coast. But to do that, she would first need Herencia to relinquish control of her country. 
Could Ari have made a deal with the demon conqueror? Ymir thought it was possible. The four heartless people in front of him didn't care about Thera. They only cared about their own scheming. How likely was an alliance? Herencia had tried to take Josentown once and failed. Ari Bell's forces and her Jataksha mercenaries had pushed the demon conqueror off the continent, at least initially. Could that have been on purpose? It would make a good mask. Curry flew down and landed. She stood behind Ymir. She spoke in a long line of Jataxian. She'd learned a good amount of pigeon. The girl had a good mind. But she didn't want the four to know what she said. Above them, on the rooftops, the other Jataksha murmured amongst each other. Jelu Jalorum. Ymir cast the spell that would allow him to understand the Winkin. We should leave, Ymir, Curry said. I know the Winkin warriors above us. They serve General Sharkandrik's Machu of the Tensuyuk. But now that General Sharkan is dead, they've chosen a lieutenant. A bad lieutenant. Zusimire Ora Pesola. She is a cruel, small-minded person. Why are you speaking my name, betrayer? The pigeon had a heavy accent. One of the Winkin flew down. She had a long spear with a hook on one end. She removed an ornate helmet. Ratty brown hair fell down to her shoulders. She had a scarred face, which only added to the nasty look she was giving Curry. You will not speak my name. Ymir felt the violence in the air. He stuck his hand in his pouch and found the crystal null ring. He got it on one finger and he put on the flesh steel. If this Zusimire decided to try to hurt his wife, he would hurt her. He expected Curry to shrink away. She didn't. She stood proudly, chin up, wings outstretched. I am eating fruit you would not know of, Lieutenant. It is fruit grown by the gardener himself. I am sure of it. While you serve a selfish child, I serve the Kopak. I serve someone who will bring peace to the world. Zusimire laughed in Curry's face. You are an arrogant sky rat to think you eat of the gardener's fruit. You are a dirty orphan girl. The general never should have let you join us. You should have died with your parents. I wouldn't even use you as a quickening girl. Ymir easily found the Winkin woman's douche. He pulled away the energy. She fell to the ground. He enjoyed the quiet for a moment before Zusimire's soldiers fluttered down. Ymir whipped off his robes and his shirt and sprouted his own wings. At the same time, he armed himself with a double-bladed battle axe made of ice. The axe looked fiercer than a normal gruel blade. Curry pulled her short swords, and they both whirled so they were back to back. They might have tried to fly upward, but they would have been flying into a phalanx of spears. Ari yelped at the show of weapons. Darius and Nellie stepped in front of her. Odd Cory turned and ran down an alley, leaving his supposed friends. Roger Nelnap stood near the alley. He shook his head at the coward. One of the Winkin knelt. What did you do to the lieutenant? She simply fainted, Ymir said. The curry coach at Chamba told her she is in service to me, and I will be Kopak. The news overwhelmed her senses. The lieutenant finally opened her eyes. It took a bit for her to get to her feet. She leaned on her spear. I don't know what sorcery you have. Ymir cut her off. You don't know a thing about my sorcery. You will treat Lakuri Kochachamba with respect. She is in my Elu. She lives in my Wasi. And when I rule, she will rule as well. You had best be kind, and I will try to forget the vile things you said. For your sake, you had better hope my memory is not too keen. Ari finally called out, Lieutenant Zussi, it's fine. You just leave that dumb barbarian and his girlfriend alone. Wife, Ymir shot back. 
Zussi flew off the ground and returned to the rooftops around them. There was even more chattering. Curry slammed her swords into her sheath. Her eyes were hard bits of flint in her face. Her face had turned to stone, as though if she showed any emotion, it would crack and she could cry. The encounter with this Lieutenant Zussi had clearly shaken her. Ari laughed. So, you want to be some kind of angel king, do you? Kopak is king, and you have them their wings. The seven angels are in Ethra, Ymir said. Too bad the seven angels weren't there to fight the Pentacor. Ari giggled. Are you speaking pigeon? Or are you speaking your dumb barbarian language? Well, Ymir, either way, I'm thinking the only way you'll ever be any kind of king is if you join my harem. Come on, Ymir. I know you would just love to share me with Darius. Ymir had had enough of Ari and that sneering boy. He accessed both of their douges and took just enough of their energy to send them to the cobblestones. He walked by a baffled Nellie, who took a step back. Ymir patted her back. It looks like your friends have had too much to drink. Roger shook his head and laughed. When are you idiots going to learn not to mess with Ymir? I have that same question, Roger. But then I wonder why you wear so much perfume and why you are friends with them. The boy sighed. I wonder that too. About my friends, not about my cologne. I like it. That made Ymir laugh. He gathered up his shirt and robes and launched himself off the steps. Curry followed him. They soared up above the market. It was even prettier up high, just under the clouds. The whole campus was a festival of lights. They soared upward, circling the Librarium Citadel, until they were over the shanty town outside of the Red Wall. Rodor had done a good job with the temporary buildings, the tents, and the sunfire torches and fire pits. Winter solstice lights sparkled here and there. Hope amidst the despair. Bravery despite the fear. Light in the darkness. Ymir flew back over the sunfire field, past the lights of the Imperial Palace, and then back down to the sea stair market. The flight had cleared his head, and it felt good to be outside. He could have flown directly to the paradise tree, but he wanted to give Curry a moment. He landed outside the candy shop. Curry landed with him. Then, a second later, she fell into his arms. She held him tightly. He smelled her wings first, and then her body. She had become so familiar to him. His life was already so full, and he was so busy, that he never thought for a second he had enough room in his days for another woman. How wrong he was. Curry had to cry for a moment. Then she whispered into his ear, Did you mean those things you said? Ymir eased her back. I did. You are a member of my Elu. You must have known that. You are with us. You are in our Wasi. You and I sometimes share a bed. You are with us, Curry, if you want to be. He had many fond memories of sleeping with her in her nest, which was far more comfortable than he would have thought. He would listen to the fire crackling in the stove, and he would pull the winged woman close. Their sleep was a long night of embracing and love. If nothing else, it saved them from Ribby snoring. Outside the apartment, you could hardly hear it. Then again, the mermaid was snoring less. I do want to be with you, Curry's voice cracked. It was like she was being torn apart. I am with you, but it can't last. It won't. It's too good. I might not be able to... She couldn't finish the sentence. Ymir thought he could finish it for her. You might not be able to eat of the gardener's fruit. It was how the Winkin talked about embracing their destiny, not unlike how Ymir walked the path the Axeman had hewn for him. What is your fate? Ymir asked. Curry broke down, sobbing. 
she couldn't say more. Ymir held her. It was sad that amidst the happiness of the winter solstice decorations, with friends drinking and eating good food, that Curry would weep so. The anguished woman pointed at the door. Go inside. I'll be along. I just need to dry my tears. And I need to gather my strength. I'm sorry to always be so weak around you. I wish I were stronger. You are strong, Ymir said. He kissed her. Strength of character, strength of mind, strength of wing. You have all three. He opened the door to the shop, and he was surprised to see Gertie in her winkle self fly over to him on tiny wings of gossamer. She was completely naked and squealing with laughter. Ziziva chased after her little baby. Gertie, Gertie, come back here, baby. Such a funny baby flying. Gertie turned, a surprised look on her face. She must have forgotten her mother was there. She also forgot to fly. Ymir was there to catch her. He turned his little baby around to admire her new wings. Is this normal? Ziziva giggled. Big Ymiri dearie knows all about magic rings that are bad, bad, bad. But he doesn't know a thing about his own little baby, who is good, good, good. Gertie shifted to her verum self. The wings were gone, but suddenly Ymir was holding on to a baby. She snuggled into his chest. He held her tight. Curry came in, followed by Ribby. The mermaid had a cloak for once. She didn't need it for warmth. It seemed only for fashion. The mermaid marched right up to Ymir. And where have you been? Did you pass your second exam? You know, Ymir, you can't just disappear for hours on end. You have a family now. Ziziva giggled and gave Ribby a kiss. A family and a Gertie. Gertie got her wings today. Walking is next, but flying is first. Ribby whisked Gertie away from Ymir. Your wings? Too bad you can't get a tail. She glanced at Curry. Wings are nice. It's okay to just have wings. There had been a time when Ribby wouldn't have cared about hurting Curry's feelings. The mermaid was far more considerate now. Ymir enjoyed the moment with his wives, with his baby, who was growing up. The little encounter with Ari and her Winken mercenaries certainly gave him a lot to think about. He had so many questions. For one, it seemed Ari Bell knew that King Shopta wasn't a king. Did Ari know it was actually Horencia the Raven? He didn't know, but he hoped they would get some answers soon. That night, he dreamed of Serena Sia coming to him. She was naked. When she pressed her body up against him, her tits scorched him. She grabbed his hand and slammed it between her legs. Soon there will be fire, Ymir. Soon there will be sin. Enjoy the winter solstice lights you see in the darkness. For when the darkness comes, it will be black. Black as night. Black as pitch. Let the sleeper wake from the dream. Ymir woke up in Curry's nest with Serena's perfume in his nose. He was surprised the ghostly woman wasn't there with them. She would, though. She would be there soon. Chapter 33 Lakuri Kocha Chamba woke up early on the day of the winter solstice. Ymir and his Elu had stayed up late, eating cookies, drinking wine, singing songs. Lily sang like an angel. It was a joy to hear her. She filled every word of the winter solstice songs with such heart and passion. And that had been after dancing until midnight at the festival in the throne auditorium. Ymir had invited Curry to the dance, but she hadn't been able to muster the courage. Not when Queen Aribel was there with Lieutenant Zusi. Curry had feasted with them in the feasting hall to celebrate winter solstice eve. Tori ran around, serving their table and everyone else. They ate big roasts of greasy meat in a thick sauce, root vegetables, spicy leaf vegetables, sweet fruit dishes, and creamy beans. Curry had eaten so much. Now, the next morning, she needed some exercise. 
she put on her armor and flew off into a gray day. It wasn't raining yet, but the fog was thick. She flew to a perch she found near a window of the throne auditorium. She could see down into the throne room, but she also had views of the spire and dome of the librarium citadel, rising up out of the fog as clouds swirled around the pretty gold, stone, and steel. Long windows allowed a peek inside, but moisture was running off the glass and rivulets. Curry had sat in that same place the night before. Now the throne auditorium was empty, but the night before, it had been a party of lights, music, and dancing. The teachers, the students, and all the very important people had looked so happy. Though many had lost everything, they still celebrated, passionately. Curry understood that. When war came to you, when you've seen so much death, surviving makes every breath so much better. Everything tasted better. The world smelled better. You were alive. Della Panez was beautiful in a gown that was rather conservative, given her nature. However, it was to be expected. She was the Koya, the queen of the school. She needed to have a regal air about her. And that other teacher, Linny Lynn Albatross, she looked beautiful as well. However, there was something broken inside her. Curry could feel it. While having Linny Lynn watch her have sex had been exciting at the time, Curry didn't want to repeat it. She didn't trust Professor Albatross. Ymir didn't either. When Curry had watched the revelers dancing, she'd had to smile. The moves were simple. Jatakshian dancing was far more complex. They danced with their feet and danced with their wings, on the stone and in the sky. Nevertheless, she enjoyed her time peering through the window. It seemed more natural that it should be that way. Curry was used to being the outsider, the orphan, the unworthy. At first, Curry had found it strange that they would celebrate the light at the darkest time of the year. It was ironic. The Jataksha rejoiced in the warm light of the longest day of the year. It was a time of festivities and treats, where even the lowliest of the Winkin would get Zokolati. There were reenactments of the grand hero Lalindra Nemenri slaying the last dragon. It was said that Lalindra Nemenri had the wings of the rainbow and it was the shining beauty of her wings that helped her achieve her victory. That same light was celebrated on that long, wonderful summer day. This cold, short, miserable day wasn't anything to be happy about. But then Curry realized that maybe the wingless people praised the light because the days were short. It was a reminder to be hopeful. Like those who survived the war, the world would survive the winter. Curry wished she could feel happier, but she hadn't felt right since Lieutenant Zussi said those awful things to her. Curry had known she'd be despised. The minute she broke ranks and flew through the portal, she knew that her own kind would hate her forever. Still, hearing it from the lips of the cruel woman had broken Curry's heart. It hadn't stopped there. Zussi wished death on her. To say out loud that Curry should have died with her parents, it was awful, but even worse, Zusi had said it in front of Ymir. But then the Kopak had told Curry that she was part of his Elu, even though she hadn't slept with his other women. Just Ymir, just her Kopak. It was enough to keep her huke healthy, which made her entire body healthy. Physically, Curry had been feeling wonderful. Things had been good. Curry had become a part of Ymir's Elu. She helped Ziziva and Ribby at the Paradise Tree. And, in truth, she was better at serving customers than the mermaid. Ribby, though, was gentle with Curry. The winged warrior didn't understand why at first. The fishwoman could be so curt and difficult with others. But then Ymir explained that there had been a time when Ribby was despised by his wives. Ribby had earned her way into their hearts. It gave Curry hope. The strange little woman, Tariah Welldeep, also gave Curry hope. She was the most tearful woman Curry had ever met. She worked tirelessly, joyously, 
and never spoke ill of anyone. She'd sigh and laugh at certain people, mostly other girls who worked in the feasting hall, but she was always nice to Curry. Lily was kind as well, but so quiet and mysterious in her own way. Curry loved to listen to the elven woman sing, loved to listen to her stories, and Lily had sketched a picture of Curry that had made the winged woman cry. It was of her sitting at the top of the librarium citadel, looking inside the windows. Lily had captured Curry's loneliness, her sorrow, but the drawing also showed Curry's interest in the world and its people. All that love would only make Curry's fate crueler. Curry found herself staring at the spire at the top of the librarium citadel. That would be where Curry would eat the fruit the gardener had grown for her. But in her vision, it would be in ruins. The very top of the citadel would be destroyed. She hoped that wouldn't be the case. She prayed that Jenny Bell would find portal magic to protect them. Dealing with Jenny Bell was odd. Jenny was kind to Curry, but also distant. The swamp woman was mostly preoccupied with her dominus studie. When she wasn't working, Jenny talked about other people. The beauty of the princept, how difficult Ziziva could be, and how much Jenny hated her sister. There was real animosity there. Curry thought that was sad. However awful this Ari Bell was, family could be such a powerful thing. Curry had seen the strength that family brought other people, but Curry hadn't experienced it herself. Not until old Paya, and then Ymir. Curry longed for her sisters, her blood mother, her love mothers, her father. Jenny had a sister, but she couldn't talk to her. Curry wasn't the only person disturbed by Jenny's hurt and hatred. Gatha would often growl about Ari Bell's presence at the school. Something had happened with Gatha and her sister. Curry didn't know what it was, but it had scarred the she orc's soul. But then others had lost sisters. Ymir's sister had died, and Jenny had another sister who had journeyed into the sky beyond the sky. It was where the gardener showed them all his seeds all his fruit, and you saw every world that had ever been and ever would be. The sky beyond the sky, the sky beyond the ocean of stars, was a beautiful place, and when Curry felt like she might give herself to the despair, she would think of seeing her family again, her father, her sisters, her blood mother, in that paradise. Soon. It would be soon. But first, Curry had her own project. She was learning pigeon, and she was learning to read and write. Gatha was a very good warrior, but she might have been a better teacher. She was patient when she needed to be patient, and she was stern when she needed to be stern. She knew just when to push Curry and when to let her go slow. Gatha was wonderful and so sexy, but Curry couldn't give in to her perversion. She had to be strong. Ymir gave her what she needed. It might be nice to have other lovers, but no, the one was enough. Curry realized she'd been going through all of Ymir's wives. Who had she missed? He had so many. Curry hadn't thought about Ziziva. The fairy could be so silly, but it was clear that was just a mask. The real Ziziva was clever, strong, and a fiercely protective mother. Curry's heart broke when she held Gertie. She would never have a child with Ymir, whether daughter or son. It was not the fruit the gardener had grown for her. At times, Curry thought the fruit of her fate was bitter. But no, there was sweetness to it. She was an orphan girl who would save the Kopak, and he in turn would save the world. Curry left her perch and flew around the campus around all four towers, over the imperial palace, around the citadel, and then back over the feasting hall and back to her nest on the side of the zoo. Back in her wassy, Curry took off her armor. It was chilly, so she stoked the fire and sat in her nest to admire the view. The fog had turned to gray rain. The droplets washed down onto the dark sea. The light seemed as fragile as her heart. 
She had to tell Ymir about her visions. But no, she couldn't. He would try to stop her. He would try to save her. The fragile light grew brighter. That short day would come, rain or not. Curry had that same determination. She had that same strength in her. She would fulfill her destiny. Someone knocked on her door. Curry pulled her wings in tight and crept over. She was in her underclothes, thick cotton and comfortable. She was covered, but without her armor, she never felt quite dressed. Opening the door, she was greeted by Tori's happy face. And not just Tori, but Gertie as well. Tori rambled off many, many words, but Curry had to slow her down. Wait, Tori, I no speak pigeon well. Tori held Gertie in her left arm. She bopped her forehead with her right hand. Jalujalarum. Yes, I forgot the spell. Now we can talk properly. Good morning, Miss Curry, and happy winter solstice. Me and Gertie thought you might want to have some cookies and some cave. I noticed you went to bed earlier than we did. You know, it's a special day. The little baby held out her hands. Curry took the child and held her to her chest. She smelled the baby and kissed her dear, soft head. Yes, it is a celebration of the light, though it's mostly darkness. I find that strange. Tori's smile brightened. Me too. We don't have the winter solstice where I come from. We're underground, mostly. We have our holidays, don't get me wrong, but they follow the rhythms of the rock. Now, do you want me to bring your cookies to you, or you want to come up to the kitchen? Gertie gurgled and smiled. Curry couldn't help it. She gently gave the baby back to the little woman. You are too kind to me. All of you are too kind. I will miss you all so very much. It's bitter. I don't want the fruit to be bitter, but it is very bitter. Sudden tears dribbled down Curry's cheeks. It was embarrassing. It felt unfair that she cried so much in front of other people. And Tori was the wrong person to cry in front of. She hustled into the nest and closed the door. She then sat them both down in front of the stove. You're going to tell me everything, Curry. I know you've been holding back. Ymir has questions, but he's too much of a man to sit you down and listen. Me? I know some of your vision. While all these other people are having their crazy sex dreams, I've got a few glimpses of what's to come. I'd like to think Fluffy is finally getting friendly with me, but that's probably not the case. Gertie switched into her tiny form, complete with her translucent wings. The little fairy baby flew up and landed on Curry's shoulder. The winged woman felt the tiny baby trying to hug her. Even Gertie wanted her to feel better. That wasn't working, so Gertie turned into her verum self, which forced Curry to grab her before she fell too far. She let the baby sit on her lap. Tori had a colorful winter solstice cookie for her. That would quiet the baby for a time. Where's her mother? Curry asked. Zizava is sleeping, and she made it clear she is sleeping in. She's been working at the store nonstop. We need to hire help, but Zizava wants exactly the right person. She keeps saying that Nan Honeysweet is very particular about who she works with. We all know Nan is just knowing lore. And ain't it odd that it's Zizava Honeygood and Nan Honeysweet? Not very creative, if you ask me. Tori's cheerfulness made Curry feel better for a moment. But the wide little woman wasn't about to change the subject so easily. Tell me, Curry, about your fate. A smile later, let's not make me get tough with you. Curry dropped her head. You can't tell Ymir. You can't tell anyone. Please, promise me. I promise, Tori said. I don't like secrets, but in this case, you can't keep carrying this weight on your own. It wasn't a dream, Curry whispered. I saw it like I am sitting here. It was during the first attack on Josentown. 
I was with General Sharkandrik's Machu and the Tenth Suyuk, and I had just killed a Hell Knight. It was then that the battlefield changed. I stood in the ruins of the Librarium Citadel, the top floor. Books were burning underneath me. There was rain, snow, fire. The three moons filled the sky, like they would break the sky. Despite them, there was darkness, such darkness. There was a dark thing coming back from the dead. Curry didn't want to say too much in front of the baby. Gertie was too little to understand anything, but still, it felt evil to talk about death and darkness around such an innocent little soul. Then, Ymir is fighting the evil, but by that time, I die. I am dead, but I have to be there. Why? Tori asked. It was hard for Curry to put the vision into words. The exact moments weren't clear. It was more of a feeling or a dream. Curry steeled herself. I've seen Ymir use his magic rings. He has one more to make. But to make it, he'll need me to die. Tori's mouth fell open, and Gertie began to cry. Chapter 34 Ymir sat in front of a delicious stuffed bird meal. He and his Elu were packed in his bedroom turned dining room. The kitchen was much too small to relax in, so Tori demanded they use the biggest room. Moving all his furniture down to Ribby's room was easy. They used Moon's magic to levitate his bed and desk and push it down the steps. That wasn't the only modifications they'd made. Lily had practiced her form magic by creating sculptures in the stone, which were lit by candles. To show how versatile she was, the Oliran artist played a complicated stringed instrument and sang more winter solstice songs. It was like they were in a king's feasting hall. Meanwhile, Tori had enlisted the help of Curry, Gatha, and Jenny Bell to bring food down from the kitchen. The table was packed with not only the stuffed birds, but a cheesy noodle dish and a rich mixture of breading, meats, and nuts. There were mushroom delicacies from Tori's home, the Ruby Stonehold. Gatha had a sweet berry gelatin dish, which Gertie loved. Ziziva fed the hungry baby from the table. Ribby sat next to her. Both claimed to be too tired from working at the Paradise Tree to help. Ymir thought it was more like they were embracing the fact that they were pampered princesses. He could see Jenny looking at them with some envy. However, Jenny Bell had promised Tori she'd help. When Lily went to stop playing songs for them so she could help, they all agreed she should keep playing. When they were all seated, with their wine glasses ready for the toast, Tori stopped them. Hold up! The front door just opened! They heard footsteps coming down. Then a voice. Hello to the house. Am I interrupting? It was Della. The princept came down the steps and stopped halfway down. She was in a light blue gown with gray trim. It was very formal, yet she was wearing black boots. Her hair was fixed, and she had a headband of blue and gray. Those weren't her normal sunfire colors. This was a gown she'd chosen just to enhance her appearance. Ymir could imagine what she was seeing. The sculptures, the candles, the full table overflowing with food, with him at the head. His wives were around him. To make it even better, the sun was setting. Though it was cloudy and raining, there was a line of red on the horizon. Della looked troubled. I don't want to intrude. Tori was up in a flash. As if you could. Come on, Princept. I thought there was a feast for the dignitaries, all them important people doing all their important things. Before Della could say a word, Tori was already scurrying up through the zoo to get to the kitchen. Della looked pained. I made my appearance at the feast. I was there a very appropriate amount of time. But then I wanted to see what you all were doing. If you hadn't eaten, I would have invited you. Jenny Bell grinned and shook her head. Like Tori wouldn't cook. I'm glad you're here. As for those other people, 
Fuck them. I'll get enough of their company at that big summit meeting next week. That's when it is, right? When we talk about Shopta? Della nodded. Yes, but I think you mean Horencia the Raven. You all are invited. Ymir found that mildly amusing. He'd go there, and he'd bring his wives with him. He was not a normal scholar. He'd never been a normal scholar. Tori came down with a plate, and they made room. Della sat at the opposite end of the table from Ymir. The little woman sat down next to the princept. They all grabbed their glasses. It was Ymir who toasted. To the axeman's strength. To the shield maiden's kindness. To the wolf's red cock. We celebrate the light like we celebrate life. To life. To life, his wives and Della agreed. Then Ymir smelled Serena Sia's perfume. Her voice was a whisper only Ymir could hear. Eat well, clansmen. Enjoy your life at this moment. But once you finish your dessert, we will talk about death. For I know the secret of the Eighth Ring now. I know every word of the Akor Oriat. The burned book, Ymir muttered. That fucking ghost had terrible timing. Then they talked, ate, talked some more, ate some more, and drank glass after glass of the wine. The princept had lost her formality again. She asked them to address her as Della. Her being there felt so natural and right. She looked like she was having a good time. She didn't seem like her normal, rigid self. She wasn't angry, she wasn't stern, and she smiled often. She kept catching him staring. She would smile, and he would smile back. The night of the portal magic hadn't been a mistake exactly, but it wasn't honoring her desire to respect herself. They could wait the few months they had left. It wasn't that long. Della complained about the coming summit meeting and the dignitaries, who had been there for weeks. They kept pushing off the meeting, waiting for the demon conqueror in the south to do something. That didn't happen. Della said that King Velus was happy to be at Old Ironbound, if only to flirt with Nellie Bell Tucker. And his wife Polly liked Nellie just as much as he did, the old pervert. Uri Bell and Darius Bow had nowhere else to go. And as for Queen Ellen Velia, she was doing penance, it seemed, for treating Lily so horribly. And so the weeks had passed as they waited. In seven days, they would all talk, no matter what. The princept then changed the subject. The feast was meant to be a party and not a place to air her grievances. It wasn't that kind of holiday. Gertie surprised everyone by wanting to get on the floor. She didn't crawl, though. She steadied herself, got a determined look on her little face, and took two big steps. She fell, but instead of crying, she giggled. Then she pulled herself up on her chair and did it again. Everyone was watching her, Ymir and the eight women. When she took three big steps without teetering over, they all cheered. That surprised Gertie, and she fell onto her backside. Her big, spitty grin was adorable. With the main meal over, Tori enlisted more help clearing the table. This time, Ziziva, Ribby, and Lily helped. Ymir sat in his chair and held his child. Only Della was left in the room, just the two of them. She sipped from her glass. And look at you, Ymir, king of the castle. Ymir shrugged. Curry would say I'm the kopak of my wasi, the king of my home. I'm not sure what the word for castle is. What are you going to do once you graduate? Della asked. Ymir laughed. You've asked that same question for over three years now. Gertie had worn herself out. She slept in Ymir's arms. I've never liked a single answer you've given me, the princept said. What do you want? This. Ymir glanced around the room, at the wonderful woman across from him, at the baby in his lap. I want this. 
a family, your wives, the baby. Ymir agreed with every word. Yes, all of that. But you and your school have opened up something else inside me. A desire to keep learning, to keep growing in power, and to inflict my will upon the world. To improve the world? Della asked. Ymir had to grin. Sure, improve the world. I want to make sure what I want, I get. And that includes keeping this school safe, and to stop some demon from trifling with the homelands of my wives. Good enough, the princept said. Still, I find myself unsatisfied. Wait until I graduate. All of Ymir's wives returned with various cakes, pies, and the multitude of cookies that Tori had been baking for days on end. They also brought caif and big glasses of milk. Ribby drank hers down and then poured herself another. I love fucking cow juice, especially after something sweet. You know, where I come from, cow milk is a delicacy. A new market! Ziziva went from her winkle self to her verum self. She dragged a chair over to sit close to Ymir. We can sell the milk to the mermaids. Or we can just milk the mermaids. She was a little tipsy, and she giggled at her own joke. She didn't seem too concerned about waking Gertie. The baby snoozed on. Ribby laughed a bit too hard. You can milk a mermaid. I know that firsthand. But you should definitely buy her dinner first. That made her laugh harder. Tori made a face. Can we please not talk about this? And for the record, I've had sea cow milk, thanks to our rib rib. It was very rich, a little tangy, and I'm not sure how good the whipped cream would be. Curry seemed a little lost. The milk? Her pigeon was so accented, it was delightful. Do you drink milk in Rata? Tori asked. Curry thought for a minute. In the mountains, yes, there is animals. They have milk and wool for us. There are sky herders. And we have chinichanka. Chinichanka, Ziziva giggled. It's a fun word to say. Chinichanka. And what is it, Curry? Della asked. It is like bat, but bigger. It eats the fruit and leaves. Sky ranchers can make them, Curry searched for the right word, can make the Chinichanka friends, maybe. Tame, Gatha growled, or domesticated. The she-orc grinned. I would try giant bat milk. On the steps, we drink mare's milk, or boil horse meat in the milk. We also have the gurgo. That would be yogurt. Tori said. I like my cow juice sweet rather than tangy. What about you, Ymir? You don't have cows or horses, but you have elk and something else. Big things with antlers that you ride. Oh, Telkir. Mostly we make a sharp cheese. Drinking the straight milk isn't pleasant. Even then, the cheese isn't for the weak. When you bite it, it bites back. I do sometimes miss the food of my home, especially Nene and Cece Berries. Ymir noticed Lily and Jenny whispering, and they were whispering about him. When he caught them, both sat straight up in their chairs, looking guilty. What were they talking about? Tori noticed that the princept hadn't said much. She turned to include her. What about you, Della? What are your thoughts about milk? In my cave, the princept said. I like it a bit too much. However, I think I'd like to hear more about milking a mermaid. I am intrigued and slightly aroused. She grinned at her own joke while everyone laughed, including Ribby. Part of the humor was the joke, but it was more that it was coming from their princept. Tori squeezed her eyes shut. Oh, great. You too, Della? I thought you'd bring a bit more class to our little family. Not really the princept said. However, I kept the joke fairly clean. Now, if Khaki and Gluck were here, 
they would of course talk about milking a merman. I've heard about their ribald sense of humor. Ymir chuckled. I've seen those two she-orcs put a blush on Gatha's face. Never, the she-ork roared. But if we want to talk about milky titties, I can offer you any number of erotic stories. It's rather common as far as those things go. Tori bounced to her feet. And that's my cue to start cleaning up. She laughed at herself and Gatha's obsession with her erotica. Not a second later, a cold breeze blew through the room. Candles were extinguished. In the shadows, they saw the ghostly form of Serena Sia. It's time, Ymir. Della will need to retrieve the book so we can continue our work. Did you hear that? He asked them. Ziziva did. She scooped Gertie out of Ymir's lap. Oh, yes, I did. And when darkness talks, I walk. Me and Gertie will be downstairs. Have fun with your ghosty, ghosty friend. Ziziva disappeared down the steps. She'd have to wake up Gertie to get her back into her winkle self. But the little baby was so good-natured, it wouldn't be a problem. In some ways, Ymir thought Gertie was taking after Tori rather than him or her mother. Curry went pale. Sweat beaded on her forehead. Strangely, Tori went over and touched the winged warrior's shoulder. It's okay. We're all going to be okay. Sometimes, like Fluffy, the monstrous things aren't so monstrous. Though I don't like dealing with dark magic. And this is dark, dark magic. Tori's cheer was gone as she loaded up plates. Getha helped her, as did Lily and Ribby. They all loved the Dwab so much, and they knew if they didn't help, Tori would do all the work herself without complaining once. Jenny Bell stood up. Well, how about we try another portal? That would get you to the Illuminate Spire faster, right? Della stood and drew a hand through her white hair. Yes, we need to keep practicing. Opening portals is useful, but what we really need is a ward to prevent anyone from opening a portal into Old Ironbound. It's gonna be for magic, Jenny said. We should work with Tori. For now, let's do this portal. She gave Ymir a worried look. Are you sure you want to be dealing with that dead woman? I could tell you a hundred stories about when working with demons turned into a shit show. Serena's white teeth gleamed in the darkness. I am no demon, Miss Joson. Actually, I am the bane of demons. Now, if you could cast your own forbidden magic, we can get started. See, Ymir said, we're not dealing with demons. Yet, Jenny sighed. Ymir reached into his pouch and put the rings on the table. He put on the crystal null, the winter flame, and yellow scorch, Cast your magic. I want to feel the energy involved. He immediately sensed Jenny's and Della's magical souls. Jenny's core brightened as she started the process. Jelu Jalarum. She opened the flow magic and spun a circle of ice in the air, near the wall and away from the table. Ignis Fashionara. Della circled her sunfire flames into Jenny's ice. The heat was so intense that the ice didn't melt to the floor but turned into a mist. Even that mist disappeared. Jelu Devocho, Jenny called out. Ymir felt the amwabs in the air change, going from cold to hot in an instant, almost as intense as what he could do with the Akiric rings. He felt Della's douche of fire, but it was Jenny's core that was doing all the work, fueling the hole she'd created in reality. He could intuitively feel how the magic worked. He would try it eventually. He could also give Jenny the winter flame and yellow scorch rings to practice with. That would give her both the flow and the sunfire she needed. Through the flames, Ymir could see into Della's apartment. It was powerful magic, especially for a one-time assassin. No wonder the portal magic had been forbidden, then lost. Such sorcery would alter the very fabric of the world. 
Distance wouldn't mean a thing. Privacy would be lost. And if you could open a portal to anywhere on Raxid, you could open a portal to other worlds as well. Ymir thought of the stair. That seemed like only one more portal. Della hurried through the impossible door and into her apartment. They watched her climb the circular staircase that led up to the illuminate spire. When the princept returned, Jenny closed the portal. The swamp witch was sweating. Well, now, that was a new record. I kept it open for a long-ass time. Ymir found himself back in his chair, with his own sand parchment out. The burned book was open in front of him. Serena Sia read it over his shoulder. Her smell was more intense, but so was her freezing breath. He shivered, but didn't get up. He wasn't sure how long they had, and so he let Serena work. She would read, and he would write, and they slowly unraveled the mysteries of the book. The festive cheer was gone. It was the work of the dead. Chapter 35 Ymir turned from the table to see the gray light of a rainy dawn. It had rained unceasingly the entire night while he and Serena worked. The ghost was gone. Ymir was left with the piles of sand parchment, notes written in a fast hand. They knew how to fashion the last ring. Jenny Bell had sat with him the entire time, watching him write and listening to Serena's whispers, that wasn't all that surprising, since the Swamp Witch didn't think he should be forging this last ring. Neither did Lily, but she'd slept with Ribby down in her room below. Gatha had her own room, as did Tori, and they both left. Ziziva was with Gertie. The princept sat near Jenny Bell the entire night. That was as it should be. However, if anyone was watching, they would have seen Della enter the zoo and not come out. They still weren't certain who the spy was, but so far, no one had ruined her. The real surprise was Curry. Tori had tried to get the winged woman to go to bed in her nest, but the Jataksha wouldn't move. Ymir wasn't sure how much she understood, since she was still learning to speak pigeon. Her feelings were also a mystery. She sat with a stoic face. Tori knew something about the Winkin's face, but he wasn't going to force the Dwab to tell him just like he wouldn't demand the truth from Curry, He trusted her. For now, he had a lot to consider, some of it troubling. He'd asked Serena to skip past the instructions on how to make the first seven rings. Egil had crafted them in a different order. He started with the gather breath and the crystal knoll. Then he created the black ice ring and then the flesh steel. With the gather breath, he could power both of those other artifacts, then he did the veil tear, which allowed him the ability to see into the past, present, and future. The next two rings, the winter flame and yellow scorch, he created because he knew he would need them to deal with the Aquaterab when they attacked his coastline fortress. By that time, he had his harem of seven women, from Horencia the Raven to Lucy the Last. When Egil Acrador finally forged the last ring, he was able to give himself and his wives eternal life. They could lose their bodies, but they couldn't lose their souls. They would endure. The Ring of the Awakened was a power source, though it was far more complex than that. It woke Egil to a life he'd never known before, just as it woke different powers in the rings. For example, the Gather Breath Ring could channel power back and forth between those who were tapped into the power. It also enhanced the crystal knoll. You could steal energy from people and add it to your own duja. It described such powers as vampiric. Golnash the Betrayer might have had that power, but then he had those magic coins to augment his power. Yes, the Ring of the Awakened was powerful, but making it would be difficult, if not impossible. For the first time, Ymir wondered if it was worth it. Then he remembered his Four Roads vision. He would wear all eight of the Akiric rings. He would return victorious to the Axe Tundra. What would he do once he got there? He didn't know, but he trusted that vision. He felt like it was the Shield Maiden giving him a glimpse of his future 
during these uncertain times. Ymir sat with the three women, a human, a half-elf, and a winkin. Jelu Jalaram, he whispered. He cast the translation spell for curry. Jenny frowned, clearly troubled. I'm not sure I got anything. How about you tell me, real slow and in your own words, how we're going to make this last fucking ring? Ymir sifted through the parchment and found the instructions. Part of him wished Serena Sia was there to discuss the specifics. Another part of him was glad she was gone. While she smelled good, her cold spirit had been almost insufferable. He'd felt killing winter winds with less teeth. He cleared his throat. If one wishes to awaken to eternal life, one will embrace the dream of the ring. At the crossroads of the worlds, in the stink of the universe, gather the wet kisses of the world's people, the spit of the seven races, in a blessed Morthor clay mold. It must know fire, it must know ice, it must be blessed by the sky and damned by the earth. Ymir had a diagram of the mold, and he thought Tori might get them Morthor clay. It was rare, found in only the deepest of dwarven caves, where ancient lakes had already dried. That mold had to be frozen, then heated, and then struck by lightning before being buried in sand. Della named the seven races. Jenny, Lily, Tori, Gatha, Ribby, Ziziva, and Curry. We have seven races. It's interesting that Egil only had human wives, but he owned the entire realm, so getting seven women to spit for him wouldn't have been hard. Jenny shook her head. This is bad. Not that part, but the final thing. The thing we don't want to talk about. Ymir shrugged. This first part isn't bad. The next part isn't either. At the crossroads of the worlds, in the stink of the universe, one who is dead but lives again must bless the ring of the awakened with their breath. That is the first of the three blessings. The blessing of the resurrected, the blessing of the innocent, the blessing of the impure. Both the innocent soul and the impure soul must give their sin to the ring. Ritualistic sex, Jenny said. A lot of these summoning spells require a sexual ritual. We haven't covered that in my demonology class yet, Ymir said with a grin. I think such a ritual would involve more touching than a voyeur would like. My sin, Curry said quietly. It is my perversion you will need. I am the innocent soul. I've never... I have always been pure in my way. I have never indulged. She put her hands to her face and lowered her head to the table. Her wings came around to cover herself. Ymir and Jenny both exchanged glances. Della stood up, went over, and put her hand on the winged woman. It was an act of love and gentleness. But it was coming from someone who had done evil before. The impure soul is me. Della said in an even voice. Ymir couldn't argue. He knew of Della's history of murder and lust. She had a code now, certainly. However, if anyone at Old Ironbound was impure, it was her. And he knew exactly what her greatest sin would be. It troubled him some, but they were missing the point. We can figure out the more sexual aspects of the ritual later. We need to resurrect someone. I think we know who that will be. No one said anything. Della looked like she might be on the verge of tears. Jenny Bell shook her head. Fine. We need to fashion the mold, spit, then find this crossroads place. Resurrect a dead woman. Curry sins. Della sins. Fine. All of that will get us started. But let's talk about what comes next, shall we? Ymir was loath to talk about it. The last step is the forging in the lightning and the slaughter. The forging requires the death of love. The death of love is repeated often. For Egil, that meant killing his sister. Della nodded. Read that other part, about Honoria. Ymir sifted through the pages. There was a note. It was Egil writing about his sister Honoria. 
She was the resurrected woman. Hers was the blessing of the innocent. And it was Egil who was the blessing of the impure. So before Egil brought his sister back from the dead, they never had sex. That was enough to get the ring ready. Then, under the light of the three full moons, at the top of what would become the moon's tower, he created this last ring at Old Ironbound, back when he'd used it as a fortress. Standing there, he bathed the Morthor mold in lightning. He killed his sister, and the ring was forged. The death of love. Curry straightened and blinked away tears. What this Vemper did was evil. You are not evil, Ymir. And when the time comes, the ring will be forged, and all will be right. You will use your rings to save the world. As the Kopak. Ymir frowned at the pain on the Winkin's face. As the Kopak. Curry seemed less upset, and he was glad. He didn't quite understand what her perversion was, but he thought she would give them the blessing of the innocent. How about we just stop? Jenny Bell asked. Let's not bring anyone back to life. Let's not kill anyone. How about that? We've come too far, Della whispered. Ymir will not quit. This is his chance to be with his family forever. His seven wives. Lily will be very happy. I'm sure she's had that very real elven sadness about the short lives of those she loves. Ymir felt himself frowning. Immortality. But Egil died, and I thought I killed the lonely demon in the crack. But I don't think that brave Curla is dead. Neither is the Vemper. I think when we forge the Ring of the Awakened, the Sleeper will awaken from the dream. Egil will return, and I think I know where brave Curla is as well. Well, fuck me, Rocky, Jenny echoed one of Tori's favorite curses. Then we've got to stop this shit right now. We don't want Egil Acrador back here, not even for a second. He'd want to kill everyone to get his empire back. No, when the three moons are full in the sky, Curry whispered, the citadel will be in ruins. We will have to forge the Eighth Ring, or else Horencia the Raven will destroy this school and kill everyone in it. It's all so clear to me. Ymir knew exactly what Curry thought the fruit of her fate would be. He saw it clearly on her face. It will not be you, Lakuri Kochachamba. You will not be the sacrifice. Curry smiled peacefully. Perhaps not. It was a lie. Curry's mind was made up. It would be the death of her love for him. Great, Jenny said suddenly. We have another dumb prophecy. Under the light of the three full moons, which is going to happen in three weeks, if we don't create the eighth ring, Herencia kills us all. Della didn't seem upset at all. She spoke in a matter-of-fact voice. Herencia was bound to come back here. But let's think about this. Linny Lin and the White Rose Society want the demons to return. They want empire, and perhaps an end to the withering. Scholars have speculated for centuries that it was Egil Acrador who cast the magic to cause the withering. He wanted all the women for himself. If he returned, those who back him would have power, money, and children. Sons. Ymir saw where this was going. Ari Bell knows that Shapta is a woman. I think she's talked to her. Fucking Ari, Jenny cursed in disgust. Ymir found himself in deep thought. He had various plans forming, but he didn't know the sequence. He did know that Herencia the Raven wouldn't simply attack them, not until all eight of the rings were forged. She would wait. Why go through the trouble of resurrection, ritual sex, and sacrifice, when someone else would do it for her. It was why she was lingering in Josentown. And Herencia would know the Ring of the Awakened could only be forged when the moons were full. She would probably time her attack to correspond with that night. Ymir thought of one of the classic principles of warfare. If you know your enemy, and if you know yourself, you can win every battle. He knew himself. He knew his enemy. It would be risky but he was going to forge the eighth ring. 
and he had the perfect sacrifice in mind. He knew a lot, but he still had some questions. For example, were the Akira Corps just the demon wives of the Vemper, living beyond the veil? And why had they all been having erotic dreams since the summer? Della provided one more answer. In the Illuminate Spire, there is a recipe for a resurrection potion. We know who we should resurrect. Perhaps this was her game all along. Serena Sia, Ymir said. Jenny Bell gripped her head dramatically. She's been helpful, sure, but are we really going to do a little necromancy? That shit is far more forbidden than my portal magic. And trust me, resurrection spells can fuck you up. Even us swamp witches don't mess with Lady Death. Ymir couldn't argue that. However, he trusted Serena. He flipped to the last few pages of the burned book. Serena hadn't read the last chapter of the Accor Oriot. She'd vanished before she could finish. Was it her decision? Or was she enslaved to other forces? It did make Ymir pause. What kind of secrets was she keeping from them? He shut the book, glad not to see the hideous writing that only the dead could read. Tell me about the potion, Ymir said. Jenny Bell let out a grunt. Fucking barbarian. Della grinned impishly. I've said those same words on many occasions, Miss Josen. Let me say them again. Fucking barbarian. There was mischief in the princeps' eyes, but there was also a certain amount of heat. She was impure. She was going to sin. And Ymir would sin right along with her. Chapter 36 A week later, school had started. There was no more news concerning Horencia the Raven, but regardless of the uneasy peace, Ymir was on his seventh night with very little sleep. He was learning how to summon lightning magic from Linilin Albatross. Curry was as well, though the Winkin thought she was doing it in secret. Jenny Bell was keeping tabs on both the Moon's Professor and the Jataksha Warrior. Ymir could guess why Curry was so intent on finally unlocking her magic. Her fate was only two weeks away. It was a testament to her intelligence and willpower that she'd come as far as she had, and in such a short time. Ymir, Tori, and Della were all focused on potions as well, potions of all kinds. It was the evening of the summit meeting with the dignitaries who'd been at Old Ironbound for weeks now. According to Tori, Francie Ballsford complained about their grocery bill. The feasting hall was working overtime to keep all the royalty fed. Ymir was back in the scrollery, going through the final few books from Edrin Hyendel's library. There had been Akiric rings before. The root word Akir was actually an ancient word that meant kingly. So the Akiric rings could be seen as kingly rings. Ymir had seen them described before like that. Egil claimed he wore the jewelry because he was kingly, and that they weren't magical at all. That had been one more lie to add to the shroud of mysteries and half-truths that Egil cultivated. He wanted his name on everyone's lips. He wanted people to see him as a god. It had worked. Ymir knew a little about the power of fame. Everyone had heard of the barbarian with Aduja, and already people were talking about his war with the merfolk, saving the blood steps from Golnash the Betrayer, and even slaying a dragon. Ymir was reading when Serena Sia whispered into his ear, You should change before the summit meeting. It's being held in the throne auditorium. Your wives are at the zoo, all showering and primping. You'd think they were preparing for another winter solstice party, and not a war that might bring forth any number of demon lords. Ymir inhaled her perfume. You smell good, Princept. Too bad you are far too cold for me to ever kiss. But that could change. I know you want to resurrect me. I know you will try. Perhaps I don't want to come back. Have you ever thought of that? Ymir laughed. No, you want life again. 
You want kisses and caresses. I remember your words when you first spoke to me. You want to witness the wheel of history turning. And you want answers to your questions, especially about Eagle Aquador. I was new to my undeath back then. Perhaps now the thought of life again, to feel life again, is too sweet to bear. For I know I will lose it. Not necessarily, Ymir said. If we craft the ring, I might be able to add length to your life. It won't work like that. It can't. Egil didn't go around doling out eternity to people. It was only for himself. It was only for his wives. And even that didn't work out like he thought. Ymir thought about going over his plans with the spirit. But no, he wanted to keep his schemes hidden. He was going to be playing a most dangerous game, as dangerous as he'd ever played before. He rose. I'm dressed fine. I have my scholar's robes, and I have my leathers. It's what they expect from a barbarous ruffian from the north. Serena chuckled. Why don't you try resurrecting Sativ Kins, or Helicia Heen, or any of the other spirits in this troubled place? We have your bones, Princept. According to Della, that will make it all easier. I don't know why you wouldn't want to live again. Because you are young. Because you haven't died. You don't understand that fires fade, and sometimes the cold can be comforting. If you refuse, I'm not refusing, but I am frightened. However, if being dead has done anything... It has helped me not to take fear too seriously. And you were right about one thing. I do miss kisses and caresses. Farewell. Wouldn't that be two things, Princept? He asked the empty room. Kisses and caresses? Serena didn't answer, so Ymir left the scrollery and locked the gate behind him. His wives were all there, standing on the school's seal in the librarium citadel, all in their best dresses. They looked as elegant as they were beautiful. Even Gatha had decided to braid her hair. She wore white. Lily drifted over in a flowing blue gown. She gripped his hand and looked into his eyes. My mother will be in there. I've refused to see her. Have I done the right thing? Ymir searched his mind for some wisdom from his grandparents. Queen Elinvelia was Lily's mother. There were rules. There was duty. Family had to be everything on the tundra, and it was your mother that kept you alive. And yet... Ymir kissed Lily's cheek. He whispered into her ear, If my father wanted to see me, I would refuse. He exiled me. He is a part of a world that is nothing but shadows to me now. It was the truth. It might not be the right path, but Ymir knew he was being honest. Jenny Bell hooked her arms into his and Lily's. Come on, this is a meeting about war, not about our families. Though in our case, it's just about the same fucking thing. We should just be glad the Midnight Guild is fucking gone. That was the truth. At the highest levels of the Midnight Guild had been the parents of his wives, Lily's father, Jenny Bell's auntie, and Gatha's mother. And with Unger dead, it truly was no more. The White Rose Society, however, was another story. But no one believed that existed either. Professor Linny Lynn Albatross would be at the meeting. Ymir wanted to keep her close. She would be involved intimately with the crafting of the Eighth Ring. He had a special job for her. He'd read about some especially dark magic, and she was going to help him with a certain problem that had been an issue for a long, long time. Ribby sighed. You fuckers don't have to represent your entire species. Not even Professor Amalbia was invited. Nope, here I am, the fish princess. Smell my tuna. Tori let out a shocked yelp. Come on, Rib Rib, don't be crude. At least your family isn't completely against helping Thera. Do you think the Morbascore will do a thing against this demon army? No, the answer is no. Though I've sent sand letters to my parents, my brother, and my sister. 
I've even tried to squeeze in a profit motive. A tiny Zizava flew around them with an even tinier Gertie following her mother through the air. Profits? Now you're talking like a faint e, pretty Tori. Profits, profits, profits. And if your father isn't a rockhead, he'll know that war means profits for the clever and not necessarily the brave. His harem continued to chatter, but Ymir gave Curry an encouraging look. She had polished her armor, she had washed and fixed her hair, and she looked stunning. She was just an orphan Jataksha, yet she looked right at home with the other elegant princesses. Her smile wasn't shy. She seemed different, confident, at peace. Ymir didn't know if that was good or not. They walked into the throne auditorium, which had been cleared of chairs. There were long tables where the different groups sat. At the head was the princept, Della Pinez, and her studier duxes. Garum for sunfire, Linny Lin for moons, Brodor for form, and Issa Leal for flow. At the next table was the Swamp Coast Queendom, which included Aribel, Darisbo, and Lieutenant Zussi. The other Winkin warriors stood behind them. Ymir thought Nellybel hadn't been invited, but she was there, sitting with King Velis on his right. On his left was the mustached king's other wife, Sweet Polly. It looked like the three hadn't slept since the winter solstice festival. The king had dark circles around his eyes. His wife looked wan. Out of all of them, Nellie Bell appeared to be the healthiest and the happiest. She had a new wedding band on her finger. She was now part of the Sorrow Coast Kingdom. Jenny had heard rumors about a secret winter solstice wedding, but she hadn't believed them. It seemed those rumors were true. The next table had a few people from the Farmington Collective, a half dozen big women from different families, Duke Odd Corey and the Viscount Roger Nelnap. And then there were the elves, Queen Ellen Velia and her retinue of warriors and attendants. All wore the cuffs on their left arms to quell their more prurient desires. Queen Ellen Velia immediately focused on Lily, who shrank into Ymir, her hand tightened in his. Ari Bell stared daggers at Jenny Bell, and Jenny threw back swords. Gatha noticed the anger and snapped out her tusks. The she-orc kept them out. Ymir and the rest of his princesses sat at their own table. Of course. Each of his wives represented their people, from the merfolk to the dwarves to the orcs. All were royalty in their own way. Especially Ziziva, who was secret princess of the very complex society of fairies, as well as the daughter of the mistress of the Undergem Guild. Few knew the extent of the Fae's power. They had spies in every waterway on the continent, and they controlled all aspects of commerce. Ziziva, however, looked rather matronly, as she caught Gertie and quieted the child. Gertie was good. She immediately sat on her mother's lap and didn't make a peep. Her eyes sparkled green, bright with childish excitement. King Velis started off the conversation. He looked like he might drop at any moment. He'd been pale. Now he looked gray. As many of you know, a week ago, on the winter solstice, I married Nellie Bell Tucker. I have hopes that this might improve relations between my kingdom and Queen Aribel's queendom, when she is finally restored as monarch in Josen Town. However, I also have dreadful news for you all. Crean has fallen. Just a few hours ago, portals opened in the palace, and my, my wives were murdered. The royal guard were taken, not killed, taken, for this demon conqueror does things to people. He has machines that twist them. The room exploded with chatter, shouts, and weeping from King Velis' wife. Polly, not Nellie Bell. Nellie stood there trying to hide the little smile on her face. She did a fair job, but Ymir saw it. He knew, without putting on the veiled tear ring, that at least Nellie was working with Herencia and her evil army of creatures and altered folk. Ari and Darius were shaking their heads, Lieutenant Zussi sat stoically with her soldiers standing behind her. Ymir then thought of the Vemper Irwin's desire to change the line of succession for the Holy Theranus Empire. 
Could it be that Irwin didn't trust his own family? That very well might be the case. His mother, Arlinda Appleford, hungered for power. He glanced up at the princept. She would make a fine vampress. She got control of the room quickly. Darispo was the first to speak. You know, Princept, you might want to start passing out those artifacts from the Illuminate Spire. You know Shopda is coming here. If nothing else, he'll want a piece of that barbarian over there. It's a she, Ymir muttered. Della spoke over him. That will not happen. It is forbidden for us to use any of the spells or artifacts in the Illuminate Spire. If they were to fall into the wrong hands, it could mean the end of Raxid. So, no, and we will not be discussing the issue more. Ymir had wondered about this before. If they had weapons they could use against the Dark Forces, he thought they should use them. However, Della was bound by the Alumni Consortium and ancient traditions. Yet, she had broken that very rule by providing them with the potion to resurrect Serena. At the same time, her vow not to use the weapons in the Illuminate Spire was why Della had wanted him to finish crafting the Akiric Rings. Lastly, Ymir understood Della's mind. If things were dire, she would empty the Illuminate Spire and damn the consequences. She was ruthless when she had no other alternative. Garum slurped off his tusks. Mr. Kujan, or is it Mr. Josen? Hell, it might be your fucking highness for all I know. Doesn't matter. Jella is right. We'll handle what's coming. Crean has fallen. Most of the royal family is dead. But most people have escaped to Serenity Bay. It's the damn portals. The princept spoke. We have made some progress on portal magic at this school. I won't go into the particulars, and I am keeping the participants anonymous. But I believe we'll have warding magic in place by the end of the month. If we can wait that long, Odd Cory sneered. Kingwater is just up Saunus River from Serenity Bay. If the last of the Sorrow Coast falls, it won't be long until the Farmington Collective falls with it. Charybda strode out into the middle of the tables. I've sent a sand letter to my mother, and yes, we have that knowing lore down in the blue dark. We are rallying the families in the Weeping Sea to help with refugees. There are islands where they can find shelter for now. Also, I have dark news from Ethra. The mermaid turned her eyes to Ymir. There have been rumors of the Pentacor's return, firebloods on the various islands of the Prachi Archipelago, a machine smoking up the air in the city of Sweetleaf. The monkey demons in the forests have sacked several dwarven tree palaces, to say nothing of the Snow Nagas or the Sucra Jen. The oceans are close to boiling. However, my cousin in the Bubano family says there is a powerful sorcerer in Foulwater who is said to be able to turn into a dragon. I'm not sure I believe her, but she says this dragon wizard and his Sharab are looking to collect ancient magic themselves to put an end to the Pentacore. Again, it might just be gossip. And for this discussion, we don't need to talk about Ethra. I just wanted to pass that along. Tori stood up, realized no one could see her, and then walked out into the middle. And I've sent sand letters to my father in the Sunset Mountains. We have our warriors in the Ruby Stonehold, and I'm going to ask him to send some to Serenity Bay. If this region falls to a demon, and if there are demons in Ethra, we might be in a mess. Ori rolled her eyes. I don't see the dwarves helping anyone. Tori put her hand on her hip. I know we've been reclusive. Fine. But my father likes Zocalotti and he doesn't want to get it from demons. I'm not saying he'll send troops, but he might. Gatha stood. If it was anyone else, I wouldn't have sent them a word. But Glaga the Blade and her orcs are on their way here. Since our enemy has portal magic, protecting a border seems silly. We need the wards, and we need them now. Della agreed. We are close to unlocking the magic. 
Every university on Thera is studying the problem. Ymir knew that was true. Della had sent them Jenny Bell's notes on how to create the portals, and he was confident that his wife would figure it out first. Then, Old Ironbound would become a sanctuary. It would buy them precious time before Horencia hit them. He was about to say something when Queen Ellen Velia stood. Tori and Ribby returned to their seats. Lily tensed. Ellen Velia spoke in a loud, clear voice. The Olira have embraced our age, the age of isolation. We have not ventured far from our borders. We have not offered help of any kind. Part of that is our nature. We are interested in our art, in perfecting our souls, in transcending the world. However, there is also a cowardice on our part that I would like to address. It is why I have come here in the first place. We are worried for our people and who would rule if the worst happened. Queen Emily of Greenholm has ruled since my husband died. But Emily is ill. I will take over ruling when she passes, which should be any day now. Sickness is rare among the elves, but we live in rare times. The age is passing, and it is my wish that we embrace a new age of union. Aribel scowled. What's the point of you saying all this? Ellen Velia gave Lily a long look. I should live for several more centuries. However, if I should die, I am going to request that my daughter, Lily Nehenna of Greenholm, be the next O'Liran queen. Issa Leal sucked in a breath. Even after all these years, she still could not accept the sullied princess. Lily shook her head. You can't mean it, mother. I am sullied. She raised her left arm. I am cuffless. Tears trickled down Ellen Velia's cheeks. And I have been a hypocrite. I have kept my desires hidden. When I heard of Edrin Hyendel's passing, I knew that I couldn't go to my grave without making amends to you. And you have no idea how many O'Lira saw you as my husband's greatest mistake. Ymir knew this was all inappropriate. It was a summit meeting about a possible existential threat. But at the same time, he knew this was the only way Ellen Velia had of speaking to her daughter. He took Lily's hand and held it. The elf girl was stunned beyond belief. This is kind of wasting our time, Darispo said, seemingly under his breath, but the entire room heard it. Odd Corey laughed loudly. If the bitch sends troops, I don't care about some elf girl being a pervert. The room erupted into chatter again. Polly had stopped weeping about her dead sister wives, but now she was coughing. Like her husband, she was gray. Both might have been ill before, but now they bore the weight of their grief. Curry sat behind Ymir. She whispered in his ear, All of this talk means little. The demon will come here with her armies. There won't just be the one demon, Ymir said. There's going to be three, and I'm going to open the door for two of them. He saw Lenny Lynn Albatross smiling at the chaos. She was a voyeur in all sorts of ways. He was going to give her a lot to look at in the coming days. She wanted to use him. He was going to use her first. Chapter 37 It was the heart of winter, twelve days later. Ymir stood in his room at the zoo. His desk by the window and his bed on the side had been restored. Through the window, the wolf moon burned. It was the new year, six thousand years since the old kingdoms came together and wrote the Theranuvial Agreement, which founded the Theranus Publicus. Ymir felt that history. He was going to try his portal magic again. This time, however, Della and Jenny Bell were on the sixth floor of the Librarium Citadel. Jenny Bell had Tori there to cast the warding magic. Ymir wore six of the rings. The Veltair ring was in his pocket. 
Della had demanded that they first master the warding magic before they started brewing the resurrection potion. Given the threat, Ymir knew that was the right decision. He also knew that forging the last of the Akiric rings was dangerous beyond reason. He had his plans, though, and he had the benefit of history on his side. He knew what had defeated Egil Aquador before, and so Ymir could do it again. Actually, it should be easier for Ymir since Egil wasn't at the height of his power. Fionn Yamaul had kept Egil from using the rings by continually attacking him. The ancient clansmen hadn't relented, not even for a second, and so Egil hadn't been able to concentrate. And he couldn't do anything to Fionn Yamaul's duja because he didn't have one. Ironically, it was Professor Albatross's class that was giving Ymir ideas on how to improve his plan. There were demon traps, all theoretical, that he planned on taking advantage of. And there was the way demonic dujas worked, very specific rules that Ymir could manipulate using potions he'd found in Fifan Rendlam's book, The Form Within the Flow. It truly was a dangerous piece of literature. It belonged in the Illuminate Spire without a doubt. That night, the wolf moon was a full red eye in the sky. The shield maiden moon would be full as well, but it hadn't risen yet. It was the axeman that needed two more nights. Just two more nights, and then they could finish what they would start that evening. But first, they needed protection from Horencia. She was waiting. She was watching. Ymir could almost feel her eyes on him. Ymir used the winter flame to help him create the ring of ice suspended in the air. He then triggered the flow magic, which opened his eyes to the flow of space and time around him. He heard a woman's laughter. He saw a figure in his mind's eye, in the throne room of Crean. Ymir had never been there, but he'd seen pictures. The figure was in black armor, and it was a woman, which he could tell because of the laughter and her voice. Her black helmet was shaped like a raven. Islets in the visors showed a flickering green flame. Ymir caught the scent of roses in the air. Ymir knew he had to finish the portal spell, but he had to take a moment. King Shapta. No, that's just a stupid name you stole from the Jataksha. No, you are the forger, are you not? For you considered yourself a god. Or would that be governor? Perhaps I should call you Horan Soror II. Wait, your helmet is in the shape of a crow. Raven, the voice called out. Yes, you are a smart one, barbarian. You are too clever by half, and you are doing my work. How stupid you are to be doing my work. No, Ymir said simply. I am doing my own work, but let's not quibble. We are coming for you, Horencia spat. We are coming for the barbarian with Adusha. We will be there soon. We? Ymir laughed. Are you bringing Shyamalia, or are you bringing Lucy the last? She was the prettiest, without a doubt. Horencia laughed raucously. You are doing a poor job of angering me. I left my vanity behind when I lost my flesh. You think you are so smart. We are counting on your arrogance. It's why brave Curla chose you. Ymir watched as Herencia paced in the Korean throne room. Yes, I understand things more. Horencia the raven in the south. Brave Curla in the north. You two were Egil's favorite wives. He would bring those he trusted the most to attend to him. Ymir was given a vision of a shadowy orgy. There was a single man, awash in seven women, of various hair color, skin color, and body shape. Ymir recognized the women. They were Egil's wives. Shyamalia didn't have any tits at all. Bly and Kyla were both chesty, with huge breasts and big fat asses. Horencia looked better fucking than she did in her armor. Brave Curla had black magic and gleaming pale pink eyes. Brave Curla would become the lonely demon, with her spear covered in runes. 
she too looked better naked than when Ymir had last seen her. The vision of those seven beautiful women got him hard, but he far preferred his own harem. Ymir wasn't going to risk prolonging their connection. He cast the sunfire magic. Ignis ignorum. His vision was gone. Though it wasn't a vision. It was something else. The ice was gone, the fire spun, and Ymir cast the last bit of the spell. The powerful magic would have shattered his duja if he'd tried to cast it during his first year. Jelu Devocho. The other end of his portal tried to open on the sixth floor of the librarium. There was a flicker, and he heard Tori complaining, I sure hope this works, Jenny. I've got to get working on my shampoo for Fluffy. If I can tame the hellhound, I won't want her so smelly. His portal failed to reach the sixth floor. That was a success, but Ymir had enough duja to try again. This time, he opened it in the scrollery. Gatha was there, reading and sorting, and preparing books she'd shipped back to Ojan Tej at the Kifu Yunliram University in Four Roads. Ymir closed the portal. He could have walked into the scrollery, but it was underground. He wanted to see if he could open a portal to his table on the second floor. There it was. Ymir walked through the portal and into the librarium. He wiped sweat off his forehead. It had been work, certainly. He then cast Moon's magic to float up to the sixth floor of the citadel. He floated over the railing and landed on the floor. We are close. I couldn't access the sixth floor, but I could create portals to the scrollery and the second floor. Della, Jenny Bell, and Tori were surprised to see him. The smell of sulfur hung in the air. Several strange candles burned there. They were alchemical in nature. The warding magic was a mixture of flow and form. Tori rolled her eyes. Well, darn, our warding didn't work. But can we do potions now? Ymir grinned. I thought you were working on shampoo. The dwab's mouth fell open. How did you know that? I heard you. I couldn't make the portal, but I could hear you. Della pointed at his fingers. Careful where you wear those, Ymir. We do not want an alumni consortium inquiry on possible forbidden artifacts. He waved his fingers, showing off the various rings. Don't worry. If I'm caught, I'll tell them you knew nothing about such dark magic. No, I would come forward. We are in this dark magic together. Her storm gray eyes gazed into his, and there was heat there, and doubt, and a bit of fear. Ymir found that moving, that this woman, 250 years old, an assassin, a powerful woman, an impure woman, would feel doubt or fear. And yet her sin was part of the spell. It gave him doubts of his own. Jenny Bell frowned. I could feel you try to break through. However, I think the candles helped power the wards. If we use the alchemical candles as sunfire torches on the walls, I think I can perfect the warding magic. The shantytown won't be protected, and we'd have to put up a wall that surrounds us completely, and not just the red wall. Della nodded. I will have Brodor and the form scholars get started. We'll need a gate to the sea stair market, the chapel of the tree, and the flow field. Jenny nodded. Let's do the wall. But let's just swap out the sunfire torches in the sea stair market and the lanterns on the streets. All of them will burn the alchemical candles. We'll have to replace them pretty often, but that should work. We'll have our warding magic. Della smiled at Jenny. There was love there and admiration. Your youthful optimism gives me some hope. We'll run more tests. But for now, let's have Ymir and Tori work on the potions. Della sighed. We are cutting this all so close. No, this is all happening right on schedule. My schedule. Ymir spun up another circle of ice. None of you have commented on my ability to cast the portal magic. I am rather impressed with myself. We'll be more impressed when you finish the resurrection potion. Della's cheeks colored. 
I've been looking forward to it. More dreams, he asked. More dreams, she affirmed. Everyone on campus, I think even Issa Leal. After what Queen Ellen Velia said, I think her entire view of life might be shifting. Ymir had talked with Lily for hours about that meeting. The elf girl had agreed to talk with her mother. The pair had been having tea every afternoon. Lily quickly learned that her mother was in the minority when it came to someone sullied becoming the next queen. Most wanted to cling to their outdated views on chastity. However, the fact that Lily was with so many powerful princesses at Old Ironbound did give people pause. Lily Nehenna had grown in fame and popularity. It was daring for one of the sullied to go cuffless. It was a modern idea. Lily said that her mother talked about her affair with Edrin Hyendel. It seemed that the pair had kept their passionate love a secret from everyone, which wasn't easy. And it seemed that Ellen Velia hadn't been alone when she and Edrin made love. There had been other women there. Probably most shocking of all was that the elven queen admitted to her hypocrisy. Ellen Velia had stayed silent when her daughter had been marked. It just made Ymir shake his head. Ymir kissed Jenny Bell goodbye and longed to do the same to Della, but it wasn't time yet. Then he opened another portal, this time into his potions classroom in the flow tower. It was easy to do. He and Tori simply walked through the spinning doorway of fire, and they were standing at their potioneer's table. Around them were all the supplies they needed. Tori gripped a scroll. She tossed it to Ymir. This is for your dumb black magic booze. I'm going to do something important. Hellhound shampoo, he asked. She nodded. Yeah, hellhound shampoo. Shouldn't you figure out if your potion to control Fluffy works first? You have your process, Mr. Man, and I have mine. Ymir got to work. He unrolled the scroll. The minute the sunfire lantern struck the parchment, an ink skull appeared at the top. The illustration changed to include muscle and then skin. As the face came into view, so did the ingredients. Graveyard dirt, church dust, coela magwadroxide, eternal ice, liquid fire, blood from the potioneers, ocean water from the nearest sea, urine from someone the same sex as the dead. There were some very specific temperatures the ingredients needed, and there was a process near the end that would be tricky. Trickiest of all was getting Tori to pee in a bowl for him. However, when he asked, she simply grabbed the bowl. I figured one of us would need to do it. I've read the more advanced potions, and it's all about blood and you know what. Let's just not talk about it. She left the room to do it for him. Ymir smelled Serena's perfume. And so here we are. I was foolish to think you might stop. Being alive hurts, Ymir. Surely you felt the sorrow of simply breathing. You have, haven't you? Breath is a gift, he growled. You should be happy to regain it. To be born is to be dying every second of every day. To lose those you love, to suffer disappointments, to know sorrow, loss, disease. Most die only once, but I will have a second death. Serena laughed. But then, I have had a second strange life. Only it wasn't life. It was a strange undeath. If your potion succeeds... I'll have a true second life and a true second death. Perhaps it will be bloody, painful, awful. However, being dead means I am safe. Dead, I can float through the halls and watch and listen and celebrate the lives of those who have never died and don't understand what they should love and what they should fear. He caught sight of Serena in the shadows. One word from you, Serena, and I'll stop. I'll find someone else to resurrect. You weren't wrong before when you pointed out that we have any number of the dead I could bring back. A ghostly white smile appeared in the darkness. 
but they might not be as adept as I will be during the three blessings. No, I will come back to help you. Just know that what you give me is as much a curse as it is a gift. The ghost paused. Will Della give us the blessing of her sin? She will, Ymir said. Tori came back in with the bowl. She set it on his table, then went to her own table and started on the soap for her hellhound. She sniffed the air. Oh, gosh. So Serena is back. Hi, Serena. Hello, you precious little dwarb. You know, when I come back, I am hoping to help you with your inconvenience. Tori had a sigh, but she also had a smile. You wouldn't believe how many times I've heard that. Not all of us are as, uh, spirited as you, if I can make that joke. Serena chuckled. Tori laughed a little herself. It's been nice getting a break from my inconvenience. I think so much clearer. But I guess I miss it a little. Not sure I, uh, well, that you and me would do much. I think we'll do everything. You will definitely be one of the best parts of my second life. Oh, to be kissed and caressed again. Serena's form vanished, as did her perfume. Ymir was deep in thought when he turned to see Tori staring at him. Do you find all of this strange? she asked. You're the one making special soap for a hellhound. That made the dwab laugh. They got back to work, and it was another sleepless night. However, in the end, Ymir had a potion that should bring back the dead. He wouldn't have to drink it. He would pour it on Serena's Sia's bones. But then he remembered they would have to do the ritual at the crossroads of the world, in the stink of the universe. Where was that? Della said she knew. When Ymir finally mixed the final ingredients together, he felt something in his douche, a stirring. The potion required him to pour a great deal of his own life energy into it. Wearing six of the Akiric rings, he was even more sensitive. He felt his douche, and he saw how in many ways it was an alien thing inside him. Everyone around him had grown up with that magical energy. Ymir hadn't. He could feel the shape of it. He could sense the power. And he could sense something else, something more demonic. The curse. Brave Curla had cursed him. That darkness had driven him, had made him reckless, and it had made him powerful. He remembered Unger's spinning animus core. The dragon had worked on different energies than the scholars, wizards, and hedge mages across the world, even the people of Ethra were similar to Ymir. They called their magical cores Atmas. They used concentration ink rather than focus rings. Ymir opened another portal back to his room. He wished he'd known portal magic before, during his many adventures at Old Ironbound. It would have saved him a lot of steps and sneaking. Tori hugged Ymir, kissed his arm, and then went up to her room. Ymir stood in front of his bed, where Jenny Bell and Lily slept. He stripped and crawled between the two. He planned on skipping class and sleeping until noon. But Jenny Bell woke up a little after the sunrise. She pulled him close and kissed him. He felt tears on her face. He wiped them away. They stared into one another's eyes. What's wrong, Jenny Bell Josen? Ymir asked. King Velus and his wife, Queen Polly, both died last night. You saw how sickly they were at the summit meeting. They only got sicker. It was kept quiet, but yeah, there was nothing anyone could do. And now, the Sorrow Coast Kingdom has a new bitch in charge. Queen Nellie Bell I. Poison, Ymir whispered. Nellie poisoned them both. That's what I think as well. Jenny said. Let's not fuck around, Ymir. Let's get this last ring made. Whatever is gonna happen, I want it to happen soon. Seeing my fucking sister and Nellie so smug when my hometown is burning is gonna drive me insane. The minute we start forging the ring, Horencia will attack. 
but you're right. We need to have everything ready. But I'm not sure where the crossroads of the world is. The stink of the universe? Della knows, Jenny said quietly. She's been having dreams. She can take us there. And we'll want Linny Lynn to join us, Ymir said. She'll want to watch. Jenny Bell raised an eyebrow. Are you sure that's a good idea? We are luring her in, Ymir said. We are giving her exactly what she wants. And that, my sweetness, is more dangerous than anything. Mid-January, the weather would be bad, but there were two parts to the forging of the Eighth Ring. The first required life. The second required death. It would be better to strike quickly, while Queen Nellie was drunk with her victory. Ymir knew the little sleep he'd gotten would have to do, so he showered and left the zoo. He went to Della's mezzanine office. When she saw him climb the steps, she blushed. Shouldn't you be in class? My classes hardly matter at this point. We have to do it tonight, Della. We have to do it. But the moons won't be full until tomorrow night. We can't. There are three parts to forging the Ring of the Awakened. The resurrection, the ritual sex, and the sacrifice. We can do the first two tonight. Tomorrow night, we'll do the third. The sacrifice won't be Curry. It will be someone else. Someone we won't mourn much. Ymir sat down and sipped from Della's cave. Help yourself. Thank you, Princept. Did you hear about King Velas and Queen Polly? She asked. I did. It was poison. The Princept sighed. It was, but we couldn't save them. Days and nights of work, of healing spells. We tried everything. We even got Jenny involved. And you know me. I know poisons. There was nothing we could do. Then don't blame yourself. They were casualties of war. We will get our revenge. Della was wistful for a moment, and then she lifted her face in a glorious smile. Red bloomed on her cheeks. Tonight, then. I know the place. Tori has what we need. And you have what I need. What I've wanted. All these many, many months. Ymir returned the smile. He, too, was looking forward to bringing this long dance with Della to an end, and hopefully to a new beginning as well. Chapter 38 The Curry Cochichamba walked down through what Gatha called the scrollery. Curry felt like she might explode. She was so nervous. She was dying inside. It was only because of the brave women around her that Curry had the courage to keep going. Old Paya had always said that sometimes the gardener grows strange fruit. Old Paya said that everyone was a bit strange, a bit perverted, and if they said they weren't, they were lying. Curry knew her life was strange. She also knew that for the first time in her life, she was going to indulge in her perversion. She was the innocent soul destined to sin. It was going to be one of the three blessings that would craft this very important ring. They had to forge the artifact. Curry's vision of her sacrifice had come into complete focus. Under the three full moons, she'd call down the lightning that would kill her and craft the ring. Curry had worked so hard on learning that bit of magic. Surprisingly, it had also unlocked powers she'd always wanted. The spear speech, the chukirime, and the iron skin, or the shuke quara. Curry listened to Della and Jenny as they talked about the alchemical torches and lanterns around the campus. The dwarven professor was working on finishing the wall. The school would be protected, both from an army on the ground and from an army in the skies. No one should be able to teleport in. That made Curry feel much better until she heard Jenny say she wasn't quite sure if it would work or not. Della did say, whether it was perfected or not, that she'd sent instructions on how to create the warding torches to other universities. It would take some time, however, for that information to reach the palaces. 
They were all hoping that the demon conqueror wouldn't care about other places, that her focus would be on Old Ironbound. No one was sure that would be the case. The Winkin walked behind Tori. The Dwab carried a big backpack with all of their supplies. Jenny also had a basket that didn't seem to be a part of the ritual, but the Swamp Woman wouldn't tell anyone what was in it. They took another stone staircase down deeper into the ground. Being so far away from the sky made Curry want to scream. It wasn't natural. Nothing they were doing was natural. It got worse when Della took the funeral shroud of bones out of one of the crypts. It was the body of Serena Sia. The living princept carried the dead one even deeper into the catacombs. It started to get warm. Curry didn't know if that was normal or not. It shouldn't be. They were so far from the sun. Curry knew about funeral shrouds, sure, but the Jataksha burned their dead so their ashes could reach the sky beyond the sky. At least Curry's people did. Other cities had other customs. In the sweltering heat of the tunnels of rock, Della led them with magical lights flickering around them. It was Moon's magic, thanks to Ziziva. She had joined them, and the fairy girl seemed as solemn as Curry felt. Little Gertie was being watched by a strange collection of professors, the orc sunfire professor who slurped all the time, an O'Learan professor, and the mermaid teacher, Professor Amalbiab. Curry felt a bit relieved because they were such a big group, ten in all. There was Ymir, his seven wives, which included Curry, the princept, and Linny Lynn Albatross, who smiled more than anyone. She seemed unperturbed by the strangeness of the catacombs. Those tunnels, filled with the dead, gave way to a cavern, and the cavern led to wooden steps that brought them to deeper caves. It was even warmer. Water dripped everywhere. It was like descending into hell itself, the place that the gardener cursed where fruit would not grow. There were remnants of a carpet, however, and there were torches on the wall. Della lit them with her magic. Ignis ignorum! The sound of a river rushing filled the caves, and they crossed a wooden bridge. However, that wood was old, so old that it felt like polished rock. The bridge led them to a gorgeous room, carved into the rock. Across the way was a golden archway. It seemed there should be a passage beyond, but there wasn't. There was just black stone there, shining in an unbroken surface. Ymir, ever brave, went over and touched the archway. It was only stone. The room was beautiful but strange. There were couches, sofas, and a bed over in the corner. Tables and divans surrounded a central stone pedestal. Everything should have been dusty and old, but it wasn't. The floor was polished wood. The walls were smooth, polished stone. Everything was clean and smelled fresh. Above them, minerals in the rock glittered like the night sky. For a second, Curry felt the breeze blow through. It helped with the heat. But then Curry smelled the ghost's perfume. Of course, Serena Sia would be with them. Linny Lin retrieved a table and brought it close to the archway. Ymir cast the flow magic so Curry could understand them perfectly. This is the entrance to the stair. It's closed for now, but if it were to open, it would lead to everywhere. All possible worlds. How did you fucking know about this place? Jenny Bell asked. He didn't. I did. Because of a dream. Della settled the funeral shroud holding the bones on the table. Finally, the dreams gave me something useful. But I've always wondered about this place. Part of me hoped the rumors were true. At other times, I just wanted my school to be safe. Ymir laughed. I've been here for three and a half years. Your school is not safe, Princept. His laughter seemed to break the spell of the place. He had his rings on. From a pouch, he withdrew a vial of glowing liquid. It was the resurrection potion. He'd shown it to Curry and asked her if she was sure she wanted to help him. Of course, she had to help her Kopak. Her fate had always been strange. She'd been destined to eat the strangest of the gardener's fruit. 
Tori got out the mold she'd made for the Ring of the Awakened. It was about the size of Curry's hands placed together. Okay, I managed to get the Morthor clay, even with the war going on. We took it to the four college towers, heated it, cooled it in ice, struck it with lightning, and buried it in special sand at the top of the form tower. Blessed by the sky and damned by the earth and all that stuff. All pretty straightforward. I have to say, though, this next part is weird. But then, all of this is weird. You wouldn't believe what I had to do for Ymir and the potion. Anyway, so we all have to spit in the mold. Seven races, the kisses of the world. Jenny Bell had brought a basket, and she set it down on an end table. For that, we need some drinks. I brought wine and some of the harvest beer that Ymir likes. And glasses. We might be raising the dead, but I'll be damned if I don't make it a party. She poured everyone drinks. Tori set the mold for the ring on the same table as the bones. She was the first to spit in it. Gatha went next. I have been looking forward to this. Much of my erotica has scenes of orgiastic pleasure as part of a dark magic ritual. She spit in the mold. This isn't dark magic, Lily protested. We're bringing someone we know back to life. At least, I feel like I know her. She let her saliva drop into the mold. Spectral chuckles drifted from out of the shadows. Della frowned. It's the darkest of magic. We are breaking fundamental rules set down by the alumni consortiums of all the universities on Thera. If we are caught, we will be killed. But we've come this far. When crossing a river of blood, it's best not to turn around. Get across as fast as you can. With wine glass in hand, Jenny Bell walked up and spit in the mold. Quoting Wilmer's sword ride is not going to make this any less weird. So weirdy, weird, weird, Ziziva giggled. Spitty, spitty, spit, spit. I've done spit play before, and maybe we'll do it tonight. I'm baby free, and it's so lovely, and I'm going to get so nasty. It's been so long. She fluttered over as a tiny fairy and then turned into her virum self. She let her clothes drop, even as she spat into the mold. Ribby also dropped her gown. And we're so fucking glad to have you back, Ziziva. You're happy to get a break from Gertie. I'm happy to get a break from the fucking store. Serving customers sucks my ass. She added her saliva to the mix. I'll suck your ass, you naughty slut. Ziziva giggled some more. I shouldn't be this excited, but it's been so long since I've had such nasty fun. She got wine and drank it too fast. Wine dripped down between her firm little titties. Two naked women, without wings, stood there. Curry shouldn't want to look at them, but she couldn't help it. Her eyes drank in their smooth backs and their round asses. Curry felt the tingles start. The room was strangely beautiful, and she could pretend she really was in an open room under the stars at the height of summer. It was so warm. They were going to get so sweaty. Tori counted it up. We have six. Curry, uh, you're next. The seven races. Curry went forward and spat. She stepped back. Della and Ymir prepared Serena Sia's bones. It was a perfect skeleton, except the neck had been damaged. Serena whispered to them, I must say I've looked better. I don't suppose I can get my hyoid bone back. Ymir lifted his hand. I'm currently using it, but I think you'll get a new one in a moment. He uncapped the potions and then poured a portion into the skull's eyes. He tipped more into the ribcage. He emptied the vial into the base of the pelvic bone. The liquid didn't pool on the table. Instead, it floated inside the skeleton. The potion glowed and made the bones glow. Curry watched in fascination. This didn't feel wrong. In fact, the radiant bones looked beautiful to her. There was a shine there, the shine of life. This didn't feel like necromancy. It felt like a true celebration of the light. Fuck me, 
Ribby cursed. Didn't you have a verbal component? Or did you just have to dump that shit right on her? Dump the shit right on her. Well, fuck. You better get a good grade in your potions class. I'll make sure of it, Della whispered, if this works. Curry sniffed at the air. She smelled the living women around her, but Serena's musk was gone. The skeleton became too bright to look at. That radiance was matched by the gold archway to the stair. The black rock cracked and light poured out. The stair really must have led to everywhere, even to the afterlife. Above, the sparkles caught every bit of light. It looked even more like the night sky. A cool breeze blew through, and Curry thought she smelled summer blossoms and fruit trees. That fragrance mixed with the familiar musk of the former princept. The light faded, and there lay one of the most beautiful women Curry had ever seen. She was a pointier, yes, and she had the slender frame of an O'Learan. Her hair was midnight black, and when her eyes fluttered open, they were a subtle shade of blue, almost purple. She was naked, and her tits were so big, they had to sag some. Tori was chesty, as was Jenny Bell, but both were thicker. Serena, though, was slim, and she had the cutest tapered waist and a muscled belly. Between her legs was a tangle of black hair. Her thighs were muscular and strong. Serena sat up and turned to the side. No one spoke a single word. Serena slipped off the table and stood on her legs. The joy of flesh. And I was given the body I had when I was 200 years old. My favorite. She then flung out her hands. Well, how do I look? Della Pinez went over and embraced the woman. Thank you. The two princeps hugged for a long time. Ymir watched the pair. He had a look of love on his face. Lily then hugged them. Like the princept, Lily whispered, thank you. Curry remembered the elf girl saying she found inspiration in the wild, free spirit of Serena Sia. Curry didn't understand all the specifics, but Serena was strange for an elf. Like Lily, Serena had enjoyed a freedom other elves didn't have. Jenny Bell offered Serena a coat, but the elven princept only smiled. I'll be naked soon enough. There is sinning to be done, and I am the perfect person to help with such things. The swamp woman reached out and gripped Serena's arm. She's warm. She's real. Serena touched her throat. And I have my hyoid bone back, thank you very much. Tori still held the mold. Serena went over and exhaled across the surface. There was a crack of thunder, and then a flash, as if a storm had gone from the glittering ceiling. The mold glowed. Tori put the mold on the central pedestal in the middle of the room. Gosh, but my ears are ringing. The first blessing is done, and my part is over. Ymir is the ringmaker here. What's next, Mr. Man? The blessing of an innocent soul sinning. Curry? The winged warrior gulped. She was turned on, scared, and the little wine she sipped seemed to have gone straight to her head. She went to Ribby, the tall woman, so slender, so different from her. She turned the mermaid around, noting the scales that sparkled up and down her skin, only to disappear. Bone spurs jutted out from the back of her ankles. She was completely alien. Could Curry do this? Could she tell them of her perversion? She had to. This was her pleasure. This was her fate. Chapter 39 Curry felt hands unlatch a strap on her armor. The beautiful elven woman expertly took off Curry's pauldron. There was plenty of light from the soft glow of lanterns around the beautiful room. Minerals sparkled in the ceiling like stars. Serena whispered, Tell us about your sin. Ziziva's wings disappeared from her back as she approached Ribby, who stood in front of Curry. The short fairy woman was at breast level of the mermaid. 
Ziziva started kissing Ribby's body, giggling a little as she licked one of Ribby's little nipples. Curry had seen Ziziva change before. It was a secret she would never tell anyone. Curry watched, entranced. Tell us about your sin, Serena repeated. The winged woman's mouth was suddenly so dry. She forced herself to speak. The Jataksha are only attracted to other Jataksha because of the wings. We don't have sex with other races. Only, I've always been fascinated by others. I spent time on the harbor, and I would watch the different peoples come in their ships. Their lack of wings was so strange and so exciting. Curry traced a finger up and down Ribby's wingless back. The muscles there were so different. Talking about her perversion felt so nasty, and yet so freeing. She was telling this large group of people her greatest shame. Curry could feel how wet her sex was. Her nipples were so hard and sensitive. She wanted someone to suck on her, on all parts of her. Ymir stood back with Jenny Bell and Lily, watching. Ymir had a bulge in his pants. Lily's nipples were hard. Jenny had pulled her dress up. Her hand was between her legs. Just as Linny Lynn Albatross was watching. The voyeur had stripped. She was near the back of the room, sitting on a chair, with a dizzy smile on her face. She had such firm breasts, puffy nipples on long cones. Her legs were spread to show off the pink of her pussy against her black pubic hair. Linny Lynn was teasing herself, only touching her clit a little. Tell us more, Serena purred. The elven woman had her enormous tits pressed up against Curry's wings. Curry bent and licked Ribby's back. She tasted salty. Her perfume was sweet. Sometimes, when I can't come, I think about a group of wingless women taking me, using me, sitting on my face and eating my ruru. I am on my back, on my wings, and it hurts a little. But I like it. I like it so much. Della and Gatha joined Serena to help take off Curry's armor and underclothes. The winged woman was soon naked. Hands were touching her, all over, her legs, her butt, her back, her wings, even her neck and face. The heat made her sweaty. Much more embarrassing was the shine on her inner thighs. Her pussy had dripped down her legs. The little woman, Tori, looked uncomfortable. Uh, Ribby, I need some help. It's taking too long for the Amorazoka to kick in. The mermaid smiled. It's my pleasure, little Tori. Tori blinked. Oh, it's happening. I can feel it happen all at once. Her hands went to the buttons on her little vest, which covered her dress. Sweat beaded on her forehead. Oh, gosh, Curry is so pretty. You're all so pretty. Lily and Jenny went to help Tori. Her hands were shaking too much for her to undress herself. Ymir was there as well, bending to kiss the dwab. Then Curry found herself kissing Gatha. They'd trained so much together. They'd bonded over battle. Kissing the she-orc felt so natural. Their kiss was rough and wet, and Curry liked it. She liked it even more when she reached around to feel Gatha's wings, and she couldn't. Gatha broke the kiss, stepped back, drew her tunic over her muscled body, and tossed it aside. She growled, We all have our perversions, Curry. We all have our sins. Then Gatha kissed Serena Sia, roughly, far rougher than how she handled Curry. The she-orc shoved Serena to the ground, where the elven woman spread her legs and started playing with her tits. Gatha guided Curry down onto the beautiful elf's face. Don't worry, Curry, Gatha growled. We're going to use your pretty mouth. But first, 
You need to come. Curry felt Serena's tongue up in her sex, and then the elf was licking her clit expertly. How many times had Serena made love to a woman? Countless. She was ancient. She was horny. Curry felt Serena's tongue teasing every part of her. By that time, Tori was naked. She raced over, a look of intensity on her face. Us redheads have to stick together. I've always thought you were so pretty, Curry. So sexy. Oh, I have to kiss you. I have to suck on your titties. On her knees and riding Serena's face, Curry and Tori were about the same size. Tori kissed Curry urgently while grabbing the tops of Curry's wings. Curry's face was already wet from Gatha's kiss, and Tori only added her own taste to Curry's mouth. A second later, Tori and Gatha were both sucking on Curry's nipples. Even as Serena sucked hard on her clit, Curry almost came. She was glad she didn't. Ymir came forward. His huge cock was hard and dripping. He'd never looked more delicious. In all their time together, when he'd helped her with her hookay, she'd always wanted him to use his magic ring to give himself wings. Now he was naked, wingless, and hard as a rock. Curry grabbed his shaft and gripped it before feeding it into her mouth. She sucked on the head. All of her senses were so alive. She tasted every bit of him. She smelled his musk. She wanted that thick ulu in the back of her throat, in her ruru, everywhere inside of her, even her ass. Was it Ziziva's talk of her butterhole? Maybe. Or maybe it was Serena's finger pressing against her anal ring until the finger was inside Curry's back hole. With Ymir's cock in her mouth, with Gatha, Tori, and Serena pleasuring her, it was impossible for Curry not to orgasm. She rode the winds of her ecstasy as all these wingless people ravished her. She felt her core fill with power. There was another crack of thunder that boomed in the room, and the mold flashed. She'd given them the second blessing with her orgasm. Her work was done, but Curry wasn't about to stop. She glanced over at Della. The honored princept wasn't looking so honorable. She was naked in front of Linny Lynn, bent over. Della's tits hung from her chest while she reached back to spread her ash cheeks, giving Linny a view of her holes. Linny Lynn was rubbing herself harder and harder. She was going to come looking at her princept's pussy and ass. Ymir stepped back and then Curry was given a view of Gatha in the same position as Della. The she-orc had spread herself for Curry, and Curry didn't pause. She buried her face in Gatha's backside. Again, Curry couldn't believe all the things she was tasting, smelling, experiencing. She licked Gatha from her clit to her pucker and back down, sucking on those green lips before sucking on Gatha's clit. Lily had gone around to get between Serena's legs, and the younger elf was licking the older one. Serena was clearly loving it. The ancient elf was too distracted to keep licking Curry. Gatha didn't come. It took a lot for the she-orc to come, or so she'd said. But the she-orc had such a dirty mind, and she had listened to Curry closely. She grabbed the Jataksha woman and laid her on her back on the floor. It hurt her wings for a second, but then Gatha solved that. She shifted around so Curry could suck on Gatha's clit while the she-orc sucked on hers. They were in the Congress of the Crow, faces to sexes, enjoying one another completely. That lasted only a little while, until Ribby insisted on having a turn. Then Jenny Bell straddled Curry's face. Jenny had such a big ass compared to the she-orc and mermaid, they were all going to take turns on Curry. All those beautiful wingless women were going to give Curry their pussies to lick, 
and she would be licked by them in return. Curry lost track of Ymir then, but Ymir had his own work to do. There was a woman there with an impure soul, and he was going to help her sin. Chapter 40 Della felt the lust hit her, but she'd fought against her own natural inclinations for so long, she was having a hard time facing Ymir. There were plenty of playmates in the beautiful room under the glittering rock of the ceiling above. She'd given Lenny Lynn a show and made the horny demonology professor come. Della got some satisfaction from that as she watched the winged woman getting off on her strange obsession with the wingless. The second blessing of the ring had been accomplished. The black rock under the golden archway had cracked more, and there had been another crack of thunder. The mold, sitting on the central pedestal, was glowing. They had one more blessing to give it before this part of the process was complete. Della knew it was up to her to help. She wasn't just going to show off her body, nor was she just going to masturbate. This was her chance to experience one of the grand orgies that Serena Sia had organized when she'd been princept. Della even had her chance to be with the raven-haired beauty herself. Around her were the squeals of women coming. The scent of their horny bodies hung in the hot air like a mist. Everyone was covered in sweat. Ziziva crouched over Curry's face. The two weren't in the Congress of the Crow, not yet. The fairy girl used her leg muscles to bounce on Curry's tongue. And like the good fae she was, Ziziva gave the winged woman her butter hole to tongue fuck. Ziziva pulled on Curry's nipples all the while. Tori had her ass in the air while she licked Curry enthusiastically. Gatha knelt behind Tori, licking the little dwab, while Ribby sucked on Ymir. Any normal man would have come already, but Ymir wasn't any normal man. Della should have jumped in with a passion, but she felt unsure of herself. It was Serena who approached Della. The former princept kissed her. That kiss tasted like Curry's Oheezy. Serena whispered into her ear, it's time. You fought the desire bravely, but now it's time to surrender to your every desire. Serena took Della over to a chair near Ymir. Della sat. Lily and Jenny Bell were suddenly there. Lily kissed the princept's neck, while Jenny Bell offered one of her big tits for the princept to suck. Della sighed and gave herself over to the pleasure. Feather-light touches tickled her thighs. She looked down to see Tori there. She'd moved from Curry to her princept. The dwab smiled. Her face was so cute with her freckles, and so slutty, drenched in the juices of the other women. Ziziva came over and scooted under the dwab. Before she knew it, Della was halfway off the chair. Ziziva was under her, licking her ass, Tori sucked on her clit. Lily played with Della's titties, while Della sucked on Jenny's nipples. She was surrounded by her scholars, and they were playing and touching every part of her. Della realized again that she was having sex with the daughter of one of her former lovers. Queen Dilly Day Everjewel had tasted her, and now little Ziziva was doing the same. The princept dimly heard Ribby squeak as she orgasmed. Curry gasped. The two were in the Congress of the Crow. So far, Ribby hadn't unleashed her tentacles on them. It was all so hot. It was all so perfect. And Della felt like she might come at any moment. Or she might not come at all. It would still feel wonderful. This was her sin. But no, the women were just warming her up. They soon parted, and Ymir was there. Della scooted back so she was fully on the chair again. She spread her legs to show the barbarian how wet her holes were. 
from her girl come and from the mouths of two scholars. Ymir's cock looked huge, too big for her, yet she wanted to try to stuff his girth into her. Can you answer the three questions? The clansman asked, looking into her eyes. She shook her head, too horny to talk. Tell me what you want. Ymir rubbed his cock against her thigh. Tell me how you want to disrespect yourself. The barbarian and eight naked women waited for her answer. Time felt broken. Everything was moving too fast or too slow, like how Ymir was rubbing the head of his cock up and down the opening of her yearning sex. I want you to fuck me, Della whispered. But you might ruin yourself. You swore you would make us both wait until I graduated. Are you going to break your promise to yourself? Ymir had a half smile on his face. Della should have been angry, but her desire was too great. I don't care. I want you to fuck me. Should I fuck your ass? Ymir asked. Since you're debasing yourself, maybe I should take your ass. At that point, Della didn't care. She was no stranger to anal sex, not after her orgies with the fairy queen and her slutty subjects. Della would be able to take Ymir, however big. No, Della said. Fuck my pussy, Ymir. I want to feel it. When did you first want my cock? He asked. Right away, Della wept. Right when I first saw you, I wanted you to fuck me. Please, don't make me beg. Ribby laughed and sprouted her tentacles. She wrapped them around Della's arms and around her throat. But we want you to beg, you naughty princept. Fucking my mother and then fucking me. Kissing your scholars, watching them, fantasizing about them. We want you to beg. Gatha grabbed Della's tits. Yes, beg, slut. Lily painted Della's lips with fingers that smelled like fucking. That's right, princept. Beg for cock. The princept's head was swimming. It was hard to think. She felt like she'd been reduced to the wet slit between her legs. It was throbbing and dripping and driving her insane. Please, Ymir, please. I'm begging you for your hard cock. I don't care about anything else. I want to be a slut for you. I want to be a slut for you all. But me first, Ymir growled. And then he shoved his huge, swollen ut into Della's quivering ohisi. The head felt so big. He was stretching her. Even after all the cocks she'd had, all the toys, all the fingers and fists, Ymir was making her feel like she was using her pussy for the first time. Della realized she was going to come. The minute his belly touched her clit, she was going to come on this remarkable man's cock. This scholar, one of her students. She was letting one of her students fuck her. Ymir shoved his shaft all the way up inside her. It was as if she could feel it in every part of her. She gasped, then shrieked, I'm coming, Ymir, I'm coming on your cock. The spasms took her breath away. The tightening tentacles around her throat were nothing compared to the blissful convulsions of her own overheated body. There was a crack of thunder. Another crack appeared in the black rock under the golden arch, the entrance to the stair. This time, however, lightning arced down from the glittering ceiling to strike the mold on the central pedestal. It was the last blessing. The initial crafting of the eighth ring was complete. Della didn't much care at that point. Now that she was in the middle of sex, she wanted Ymir's cum in every part of her. The cask of lust had been uncorked, and now pure sex would come pouring forth. Chapter 41 
Ymir couldn't believe how tight Della was. Was it her half-elven blood? Was it her skills at sex? He didn't know, but when she came, she clamped down around him, and he nearly came as well. For now, his wives withdrew, except for Ribby, who was holding the princep down with her tentacles. Ribby was also fingering her pussy, and then forcing Della to lick her fingers clean. Such a horny princept, Ribby purred. Such a horny girl. Once the feeling receded, he pounded the princept as hard as he could. His sweat dripped onto her face. Della opened her mouth, wanting more fingers, but also catching Ymir's sweat in her mouth. This woman was unbelievable. Serena grabbed Ymir's ass, helping him fuck Della harder. Della let out a howl as she came again. Serena slammed her fingers into her own pussy, matching Ymir's thrusts. Ymir kissed Della, even as she orgasmed. She sucked on his tongue while her pussy sucked on his cock. He rammed her harder, harder, harder. Then he felt Ribby reaching into his douja and into Della's. He felt both women. They were joined for an instant, and not just them, but Serena, Jenny, Lily, all of the women in the room who had fallen into more piles around them. Linny Lynn wasn't with them. She was the distant voyeur, watching and masturbating. Then Ribby made them all come right at the same time. Ymir was as far as he could go in Della Panez. The contractions of her ohisi matched the jets of sperm soaking her womb. She gasped into his mouth. He growled into hers. They were connected in body, mind, and soul. Over and over, he felt the orgasm exploding, filling her with his cum. But then he felt Ziziva, Tori, and Gatha. All of them were orgasming. It was an explosion of energy. The cracks in the entrance to the stair glowed. The golden archway gleamed until it was white hot. They'd pulled energy from that portal to resurrect Serena, and she was connected to it. Ymir could feel that. He could also feel their orgasms reverberating into the universe, across space and time. This was where all the erotic dreams had come from. This orgy, where they were crafting an artifact that would give them eternal life. Poor old Edrin Hyendel was with them in some strange way as was Egil Acridor. Ymir had another vision of the Vemper and his seven wives, having sex in that same room. Egil had used the entrance to the stair to craft his own version of the Eighth Ring. Herencia the Raven, a dark-haired woman, rose from the sweat-slathered bodies. She looked at Ymir. It wasn't just a vision. The real Horencia, in her armor, knew they were almost done with the ring. When the three moons were in the sky, they'd finish it. And she would be there to either steal it or to finish the ritual herself. Ymir slipped out of Della's sex. He wasn't going to get soft anytime soon. Part of that was the intensity of his orgasm, but it was also Ribby, keeping his douja quivering. The mermaid knew that Ymir had too many ohesies to take care of to lose his erection. But who was next? For a second, he didn't know, until Serena grabbed him with surprising strength. It was augmented with magic. He was sure of it. She set him down on a couch and climbed up onto him. Then she slammed her furry pussy onto his sex. Her tits were in his face. She was sweaty and musky and so horny. She was grinding her clit onto his pelvic bone, while at the same time, working her slick slit up and down on his dick. He'd never experienced that. It was almost like a fist around him. He grabbed her firm ass. It was small compared to those delicious titties. She was mostly tit. He sucked on her nipples hard while he gripped her. Then he held her down while he thrust up into her. It wasn't enough. He wanted to be in control. He wanted to watch her giant tits bounce while he fucked her. He lifted her, spun her around, 
and put her on the couch. The raven-haired elf kept her legs spread. Her ohisi was leaking cream. That froth helped him slide back into her. Fucking her hard, he watched her tits rippling up and down on her chest. Della sat at the end of the couch, facing them. Della's legs were spread. Her used pussy was leaking his cum. Gatha, dirty Gatha, went over and licked up Ymir's seed, and then kissed Serena. Back and forth Gatha went, feeding the elf the princeps fuck. Ymir couldn't hold back seeing that. But once again, Ribby reached into his douche. The mermaid laughed. Oh no, Ymir, you can't come yet. Not yet. You have so many other pussies waiting for you. Ribby held him back, which was lovely. He could slam into Serena, riding that edge, without the fear of tumbling into an orgasm. Tori scrambled on top of the elf. I have my inconvenience really bad, Ymir. I ate some of the Amora, and then Ribby turned me on. And now I need your help. Bad. Ymir pulled out of Serena, grabbed the little woman's ass cheeks, and was given a view of a strawberry-lined hole, wet from any number of orgasms and nastiness. Ymir knew Tori needed it hard, so he drove his cock into her. In my quim, Ymir, the dwab whined. Put your dick in my quim and fuck me good. Ymir did, pulling on Tori's hair, which wrenched her head back. Serena sucked on Tori's big, stiff nipples, both of those women had such big tits. Gatha wanted a turn, and she pushed her head under Tori so she could suck a tit. The princept had moved off the couch, and she had her pussy on lilies. The girls were scissoring each other, until Jenny wanted a turn. Then Curry, then Ziziva, all took a turn tribbing on the princept's pussy. Gatha couldn't wait. She pulled Ymir out of Tori before getting down on her hands and knees. My turn, Ymir. It's my cunt's turn. Ymir grabbed Gatha's hips and pierced her green pussy with his prick. He licked his thumb and stuck it in the she-orc's asshole. Gatha fucked back into him. She grunted every time her ass smacked his body. Linny Lynn had moved her chair closer. She was rubbing herself watching them. You all look so good and beautiful. I love you all. I have to love you all. Linny rubbed herself hard. For one mad moment, Ymir thought about fucking her. But no, he was letting her watch, keeping her close, because in the end, he was going to betray her. And there was no way he could answer his people's three questions with someone he was going to betray. Della climbed away from the horny women and went over to where Ymir was fucking Gatha. The princept was covered in sweat and pussy juice. Della put her face on Gatha's green ass and opened her mouth. Ymir slipped out of Gatha's pussy and into the princept's mouth. Ymir knew what she wanted, but he had to slam Gatha more. He jammed his gleaming oot back into Gatha's juicy tunnel, he gave her three strokes, pulled out, and then gave Della his cock to suck. At the same time, he took back control of his douja and let himself come in his princeps mouth. This second orgasm was even better than the first. It lasted so long. His slutty princept drank down every drop, moaning and groaning, as if she were coming and not him. Ziziva rushed over and pulled Ymir away. His last ropes of cum hit Della's chin. Seeing her with his sperm on her face ensured Ymir wasn't going to lose his erection. He felt a perfect union between his soul and his body. Both wanted to keep fucking. By this time, Gatha was on her back, and Ziziva was straddling her. Don't fuck my honeypot, Ymiri. Fuck my butterhole. It's been so long. I'm not a mommy tonight. I'm a slut. And sluts like it in the ass. Ymir drove two fingers into her twat, 
got them all gooey, and then painted her butterhole until it was greasy and ready for his pole. He pushed himself all the way into the fairy girl's backside. That tight ring of muscle was heaven on him as he stretched her out. She wiggled her ass at him. Deep, deeper, deepest. Oh, yes, I love it in the ass. Lick my clitty, Gathy Wathy. Lick my little clitty good. Ymir gritted his teeth. Ziziva's butterhole was so tight. He grabbed one of the fairy girl's slim shoulders and gripped her short hair. He was careful not to fuck her too hard at first, until she was eagerly wanting him rough. Della was back with them, watching him fuck Ziziva's ass, her eyes gleaming. You're going to do that to me, Ymir, and then you're going to come in my ass. Ymir's eyes traveled over all of his many women, who were in any number of combinations around them. There were too many combinations to consider, and if Serena joined them, she would add a whole dimension of sex. She was currently being fucked by three of Ribby's tentacles, her squeals of ecstasy muffled by the coil in her mouth. Curry was with Lily and Tori, all of them in a tangle. Jenny was behind Della, fingering herself while she fingered the princept. Della threw a look over her shoulder. Get my asshole, juicy Jenny, because Ymir is going to fuck me there. Cum dripped off the princept's face. Ziziva let out a scream. Her tight sphincter spasmed around him. Ymir pulled out of the fairy girl just before he came. By that time, Della had her chest to the floor. Her shapely ass was in the air. Ymir was already so slick from Ziziva's copious girl cream that it would be easy to slide into Della's rear hole. Jenny gave him a mischievous grin. When you first came here with that dumb deer over your shoulder, did you ever think you'd be fucking our princeps ass? Ymir laughed. There was only one answer. Yes, yes, I did. Then he pushed his cock into the princeps tight pucker. Ymir would never get tired of these women. Gatha went around and got down on her hands and knees. Della dove in, licking the she-orc from behind. The horny princep took her ass-fucking well, as good as Ziziva or better. She urged him to come. Do it, Ymir. Use my ass to come. I'm going to want your cum every day, barbarian. Every fucking day. There was no stopping him. He roared and unleashed his final orgasm into the nasty woman's butterhole. He'd done it. He'd filled every part of the princept with his seed. He found a chair and sat down, surrounded by horny women who were still fucking. He and Linny looked into each other's eyes. She had come multiple times, and now was just toying with her pubic hair. Her look said any number of things. There was genuine love there. There was excitement. But most of all, there was an odd kind of hope. Watching scholars fuck was fine, but what she really wanted was her demon who smelled of white roses. Horencia the raven would be coming. In just a few hours, the demon conqueror would be showing up at their door, and Ymir would welcome her and two other demons to the party. He was ready. Chapter 42 Hours later, in the zoo, another rainy day was dawning. For most of Old Ironbound, the scholars would be returning to class. However, everyone was on high alert, waiting for the attack. That night, all three moons would be full. Horencia would come. She knew they were almost done with her lord's ring. Ymir and his harem weren't even going to try to act as if things were normal. Ymir went over the plan, the trap, with his harem. They stood in the kitchen, including Della and Serena Sia. Linny Lin, exhausted, had returned to her apartment, but not before squeezing Ymir's hand and thanking him for one of the best nights of her life. 
And then Lenny said something crucial. She told Ymir she loved him and his wives. It had been music to Ymir's ears. Now Ymir stood at the head of the kitchen table. The mold holding the ring of the awakened lay in front of him. The nascent ring was a strange blue and silver that changed colors. At times it seemed liquid, at other times a brilliant metal. Sometimes it sparked. Tori took off the veiled tear ring and frowned. Fluffy ain't getting any friendlier. But yeah, Horencia is gonna open portals tonight at dusk. From what I saw, our wards will hold. But we need to evacuate the shanty town. Dang, I still have so much to do. We need to finish our potions, Ymir agreed. We need to gather supplies, and we need a place where we won't be interrupted. My apartment, the princept smiled impishly. But not for what you're thinking. You can use portal magic. Hopefully he can't, Jenny Bell said. Those warding torches should be up all around the red wall and the new wall on the sea stair market. We should be safe. Della nodded. I have to check the sand chamber. Ojan Tedge reported that her flow scholars were able to recreate the portal magic, but not the warding magic. It seems it takes some special talent for that brand of devocho sorcery. Which means I'm going to be graduating with fucking honors. Jenny laughed. She looked tired and a little sex drunk. Serena chuckled. I am thinking you all will, if you survive the coming battle. She was eating a rich zoccolati cake Tori had baked a few days earlier. She chased that with red wine. A lot of red wine. Serena was thrilled to be able to eat and drink again. And the former princept loved kissing Zizava. The fairy girl had picked up Gertie, and both were in their room at the bottom of the zoo. It was too crowded for Ymir to try the portal magic, so he went outside. Standing in the rain, he tried to open a portal to the potions classroom in the flow tower. Like before, he could get a flickering doorway there, but he couldn't open it completely. Their wards were working. He opened the door. Tori, we'll have to break into the flow tower. Then we can go to Della's apartment. We'll need a potioneer's table there. The dwab held up two fingers. Let's have one each. The princept sighed. You are no longer imprudent students playing pranks. We're on the same side. She reached into her pocket and took out a ring of keys. That will get you into the flow tower. If asked, you are working on a special project for me. I'll have Brodor work and Phoebe send over the two potioneers' tables. Della took Ymir's hand. If the battle turns against us, I won't hesitate to use the artifacts in the Illuminate Spire. You know that, right? He kissed her cheek. Of course, Princept. You aren't fucking stupid. Tori gave Ymir a list of what she needed for her fluffy potion. Tori would help Della get her apartment ready. Ymir left with his battle axe, two throwing axes at his side, and his satchel, which contained the mold. He pulled the hood of his robes over his head. It was waterproof, but the rain was unceasing. Strangely enough, Serena wanted to come with him. They hurried through the rain, but took a break under the eaves of the chapel of the tree. Water splashed down around them. Why come with me, Princept? Ymir asked. You will call me Serena, clansman. Her cheeks were rosy. Her purple-blue eyes were sparkling. Now that I have flesh again, I want to be out in the world. I want to feel it all. To be alive is a magic all its own. But you had your doubts before. The beautiful elven woman pushed him playfully. Never point out a woman's inconsistencies. It won't go well. But you are right. That is the secret to life, Ymir. Live where you are. Not in the past, and not in the future. If anything, that was one of the benefits of being dead. It's all right now. I've watched you and your women, and Della, through many of your adventures since you first awakened my spirit. I've seen your loves, your losses, your grief, and your happiness. And the sex, I'm assuming. 
Ymir chided her. Like Professor Albatross, I enjoyed my voyeurism. Being dead, I watched any number of people masturbating. I watched lovers, and I watched people have sex with people they hated. For example, Nellie Bell hates your Jenny, certainly, like she hates Ari Bell and Derisbo. But Nellie fucked them all. It was her path to power. Serena stopped and smiled. The hate in their sex was delicious in its own way. She then settled against Ymir. But I'm no longer a ghost. I'm with you, and we are facing war. This is all very exciting, and yet sad, for the war will bring death. All of this is temporary. It might not be, Ymir said. Eagle Aquador found immortality for himself and his wives. They've been gone from the world, but they aren't dead. But I'm thinking I can kill them. And how do you propose to do that? Serena asked. If an untethered soul is bound to a host, and if that host is destroyed, what happens to the spirit? If that soul is strong enough, it will find another host. Serena thought for a minute. But if the binding magic is powerful, the demon would be pulled into death, along with the host's soul. In theory, it will work. Too bad we don't have time to test that theory. Ymir pulled her back into the rain. Serena pushed him away. But wait, what if the demon doesn't have a host you could bind them to? What if it somehow created a physical body, like the lonely man did? But we don't call her that. It was Brave Curla up in the north, pretending to be just another tundra ghoul. Ymir stood in the rain, considering the scenario. According to Linny Lin, demonic energy exists on the other side of the veil. To break through to this realm requires magic. An Inanis spell might dispel that magic. They might still have an energy core, but it would be brittle. If we smashed the core, it might kill the demon. More theories, Ymir. It's all we have, Princept. Serena threw off her hood to feel the rain on her face and hair. She looked even more beautiful, wet and bedraggled, smiling and laughing. I'm no longer the Princept. I have no real responsibility in this. I have done my part. I can just enjoy this. Never fear, however, Ymir. When it comes to fighting, I will fight very well. I trained for centuries, and while I've never known war firsthand, I expect I'll be very good at it. Grandfather Bear used to say that the best warriors in the history of the world were those that never fought a single battle for they would always be the best in their own minds. Ymir wasn't going to tease Serena for her enthusiasm. Ideally, this war would be over quickly. He didn't need Serena to fight. He had Della, Gatha, Ribby, and Curry. They were all fearsome in their own right. Jenny, Lily, Tori, and Ziziva would never be able to match them in combat, but those four had their own strengths. Ymir walked past the new walls on the west end of the flow courtyard. The fortifications were rough rock drawn up from the bones of Vimper's cape. The special warding torches flickered with an orange light, their magic too powerful to be extinguished by the rain. Garam Sornap had sent his best Sunfire scholars to keep watch on the new walls. The university was trying to keep classes running, despite the trouble. Ymir saw that with the scholars were a couple of Garam's wives, Gurla, the Janistra Dukes of the entire university, who had enslaved Ymir during the first part of his first year, and Korga, Ymir's first-year sunfire teacher. Korga must have had her huge breasts strapped down to allow for her breastplate. Both saw Ymir and raised a hand. He waved back. In the flow tower itself, he and Serena passed Professor Issa Leal. The teacher gave Serena a long look, but didn't say a word. She was hurrying off somewhere. Serena laughed. I think she recognized me. I wouldn't imagine she would want to talk with me. We are very different people. 
Isa loves her cuff, may the old gods bless her, but not the reveler. He won't. Inside the potions room, Ymir gathered up the supplies. Having Serena was helpful. She could carry things. He needed Vumor powder, dihoxide, aged sanctum vinegar, and Siskeo wine. Della said she would have the infinity ice and the infinity fire, but he needed herbs as well. Thyme, plainsbush, bread spear, and the anathem graviolens, otherwise known as the pickling herb. He would need some of his own blood, but no urine this time. While he worked to gather the items, Serena frowned at him. I've heard you refer to the women in your harem as your wives, but you never had a wedding ceremony, did you? Or did I miss it? You didn't miss it. There was no ceremony. We just decided to be together forever. They are my wives. I am their husband. We've eaten enough meals together to make it so. Serena nodded and started shaking containers. Right. Eating together is so very important for the clans. Those who eat alone too much go insane, correct? Ymir frowned over some bottles. Correct. I love my wives. You should have a ceremony. At the end of the year, when you graduate, you should do an old Theranus ritual. You know, the Holy Theranus Empire does have some very moving wedding ceremonies. Erwin isn't getting married, though. He knows he is going to die, and he knows that his worthless empire was mostly laughed at. He has a play, you know, a secret treaty. I heard about that, Ymir mumbled. But how do you know? Serena exhaled, and her eyes turned sad. I would go traveling sometimes. I would go to places I'd never been before. I had to be careful, because a ghost on the wind is a target. But I went to Four Roads. I went to Greenholm. I saw what was to come. And all the while, the Akir Akor wanted to destroy me. They wanted me gone. What are the Akir Akor? Ymir asked. Demons. Serena smiled wistfully. Silly little demons. You'll know in the end. Then she laughed and widened her eyes. I won't say more. I don't want to spoil the surprise. Ymir laughed at her. Serena still liked keeping secrets from them, after all this time. However, other than providing conversation, Serena wasn't much help. She slowly went through the room, telling him any number of stories about the various herbs, about the various teachers about her time being the princept. Then she chuckled. I had this one potions teacher who insisted that he could open the stair door with an elixir. He couldn't find it himself. He wanted me to help him. It was impossible. She paused. Did you feel the stair during our orgy? Did you feel the power of it? Such power. It would need to be guarded. Once you open a door, anything can come through. We might have cracked the entrance, but the stair can't truly be opened, not until the Seedmaster dies. He created this world to be separate from the rest of the cosmos. When he dies, the door will open, and we will once again be connected. Is it the Seedmaster or the Game Master? Ymir asked, recalling his religion class from the year before. Serena shrugged. Either, both. All the stories are so different. The Seed Master will die, as all gardeners must. No offense to Curry or the Jatoksha, but the Game Master would play his games forever. Or it's all just a story, and the door to the stair will remain sealed until the end of time. It doesn't matter. It might. Ymir spooned for more powder into an envelope. Eagle Aquador knew of the stair. He crafted his own eighth ring there. Serena, you never translated that last section of the Accor Oriot. I think you read it at some point, right? Serena gave him a big smile and didn't say a single word. Ymir had to laugh. You know, 
as the specter that floated through our lives for so many years, we don't really have a reason to trust you. But you do, she said seriously. Because I've fallen in love with you and your family, Ymir. And while I lived my time centuries ago, I was given a second life, even when I didn't have a body, because I could see the beauty of your love. Ymir was strangely moved. Thank you. And I was wrong. I do have a reason to trust you. I read about you, Serena. You were a good woman in life, strong, selfless, and loving. I don't think death or a second life would change that. Serena's eyes filled with tears, and she blinked them away. Come now, Ymir, don't make an old woman cry. War could start at any minute. We have our defenses. She shook a bottle of Siskeia wine at him. Let us go craft our weapons. With the supplies in his satchel, he locked the door behind him. They crossed the campus and walked under the dragon arch and into the library. Serena surprised him by grabbing his arm and casting moon's magic. She flew both herself and Ymir up to the sixth floor. They soon were up in Della's apartment, where there were two potioneers tables. Tori was already brewing. Della wasn't there, but she would return to check on them and retrieve her keys from Ymir. Tori held a vial over a sunfire candle. Took you long enough, Mr. Man. You two didn't do anything inconvenient, did you? Serena sighed like her heart was broken. No, unfortunately. Maybe later, Ymir can do to me what he did to the fairy girl and Della. Tori blushed. Ah, uh, I know what that means. Let's just, uh, get to work. Ymir set his satchel down. He checked to make sure the mold for the Ring of the Awakened was still there. The nascent ring sparked. It wasn't ready yet. It needed the kiss of lightning and the death of love, forged in lightning and slaughter. Horencia could do it. She could summon lightning and kill one of Ymir's loves. She could finish the eighth ring. The fighting could start at any time. Perhaps Curie's and Tori's visions were wrong. But Ymir didn't think so. In preparation, all of the shanty towns had been emptied and the campus was crowded with refugees. If the campus grounds were invaded, some would fight. Most would die. Ymir couldn't think about that. He settled in to the brewing. At least I'll pass my potions class, he growled. The day passed quickly, with Ymir and Tori working. Della checked on them every once in a while. When she wasn't managing a school full of frightened scholars, war-weary refugees, and more dignitaries from the Sorrow Coast Kingdom, those people were the most terrified of all. Their trusted king and his loyal queens were dead. Few had faith in that new bitch, Queen Nelly. Serena had found caro sticks somewhere, and she smoked watching them, trying to help, but mostly being a distraction. At one point, she pointed her caro stick at Tori. The Morbuscor have a beautiful wedding ritual. You know, you say you're one of Ymir's wives, but you aren't actually married. The Dwab laughed. We are, though. I can't imagine my life without him and the girls. And it's not like there's a dwarven wedding ritual that covers multiple wives. We stayed with monogamy. Serena got a pained look on her face. I am sorry. Monogamy sounds truly awful. Tori just rolled her eyes and kept on cooking. She did give Ymir a side eye. You know, though, if we don't get married, you can't really call us your wives. Ymir knew this wouldn't be the last he'd hear about a wedding. The light was fading when Ymir heard the first explosion outside. All three of them rushed to one of the long windows. In the shanty town on the other side of the red wall, the fire of magical portals burned in the stormy twilight. The siege of old Ironbound had begun. Della burst through the door. You are needed at the sun gate. I'll be down presently. There are some things I have to gather. The princept stormed past them and disappeared up the staircase and into the illuminate spire. 
Ymir couldn't help but be amused. Remember your swords, Della. I will, she called down. Ymir stared out the window at the fire and battle. The stones around us haven't been a fortress for a long time. I hope this citadel remembers something of war. He tossed Tori the veiled tear ring. Are you ready? The dwab was nervous, clearly, but she raised her chin and gave him a brave smile. I work in the kitchens. I'm always ready. This is just one more meal, right? Let's eat of the carnage. He grabbed her hand, and with Serena chasing after them, they ran from Della's apartment with their very important potions and with the mold of the eighth ring in his satchel. Horencia's initial attack was happening right on schedule. Chapter 43 Ymir, Tori, and Serena reached the sun gate, which was still sealed, though something heavy was bashing into it. The wood splintered. The chains shook. There were guards there, shoving their shoulders against the wooden gate. Anyeshka was one of them. The she-orc had already been wounded. Blood dripped off her chin. The rest of the defenders were on the walls, fighting rat wings and shadowy winged soldiers, with the rain and carnage, Ymir couldn't get a good look at them. He did see some of the shadowy flyers slide off a protective magic in the sky. That was a little bit of protection that Jenny Bell and Brodor Bootblack had added to the warding torches. The dwarf, when not complaining about his divorce, had spoken with Jenny and Issa Leal about a combination of form and flow magic that would create a protective dome over the school. It had been largely theoretical, but it was theory no more. However, it wasn't perfect. The flying demons could still flit up to the wall and sneak under it. The scholars, though, and Sorrow Coast soldiers, were defending the ramparts well enough. There were also elven warriors, the personal guard of Queen Ellen Velia. That meant Lily's mother wouldn't have their protection. Ymir didn't like the idea of that. However, he couldn't get too involved in the fight. The key to winning the confrontation wasn't in slaughtering the ground troops. It was waiting for the sun to set and for all three moons to fill the sky. Then it would be time to finish the last Akiric ring at the top of the moon's tower. And if Ymir was right, to win the war. Ymir thought they might check in with Garam to make sure the school's defenders were doing well against the demon army. Otherwise, they might have to retreat back into the Librarium Citadel. Ymir never had the chance. The sun gate exploded. Wood and metal went flying. Standing there was something that might have been human once, but now it was mostly rock. There was still armor there, but it was now mixed with stone. From the insignia on the breastplate, these were the altered Sorrow Coast Knights that had been captured when Crean fell. The rock monster didn't have a mouth anymore, just pale orbs where its eyes had once been. The thing came forward with a spear covered in stone. It was more club than spike. Other stone soldiers shambled after their leader. Hooray, Serena shouted. The fighting has begun. Let's get this over with so I can have more wine and a smoke. Jelu, Calum, Lutum, Ignis, Devocho. The former princeps' black dress iced over, and two long swords made of flames extended from her hands. Crackling lightning wreathed her head. Rocks lifted from the ground around her to go tumbling in a protective circle. Tori was pale. She wasn't afraid of the fight. She'd been in battles before. But she was afraid of her new weapon. Ymir didn't blame her. What she was planning was dangerous. Okay, I'm gonna try my thing. Ymir was wearing six of the Akiric rings. Tori drained a potion vial and put on the seventh. He couldn't see the results. He'd just have to trust in Tori's magic, just as he trusted his own. He used the winter flame ring to ice the stone soldier in front of him. He froze the amwabs around the stone soldier's feet, its ankles, and its knees. Ymir let Serena engage the other knights as they came. Most were slammed into rubble by her whirling stones, 
Others found their end impaled on Serena's sunfire swords. Their rocky hearts turned to lava. Others went down when lightning danced from one to the next to the next. Serena giggled the entire time. Oh, to have come back from the dead for this war business. I never would have thought I'd be so fortunate. Ymir couldn't help but be impressed. He raised a wall of fire that blocked the entrance of the sun gate. Rat wings burst through, impervious to the flames. Ymir reached for their dujas and killed three right away. He simply snuffed out their life force. These things were far weaker than the sorcerers he was used to dealing with. Another of the bat creatures went to rake Ymir with its claws. The clansmen thought about summoning an ice axe, but he didn't need to. He'd brought his old battle axe, freshly sharpened and blessed with a little form magic from Tori. It had never been sharper. He hacked the rat wing from its shoulder to its sternum. Hot blood sprinkled Ymir's face. That felt good. Another rat wing breathed fire down on him, but he extinguished it with a sweep of the winter flame ring. He wasn't the only one putting out fires. His wall of flames was extinguished by magic from the other side. A dozen flying warriors soared in. Just as the Saro Coast soldiers had been fused with rock, these Jataksha had been enchanted with lightning. Their wings were black and burning. Their eyes crackled with energy, and electricity wreathed their weapons. The rest of their faces had been burned off, and every inch of their skin looked like it had been cooked, even as their armor was scorched. These must have been the Apotexa, and yes, they were certainly awful. If the stone soldiers had been fashioned from form magic, the Apotexa were created using moons. One threw lightning at Ymir, but he disrupted the magic. Jalu Anonis. Then it was his turn, or so he thought. A stink hit his nostrils. A huge dog thing, the size of a horse, launched itself off the ground. The dog thing grabbed the Apotexa out of the air with a mouth one of several. Most of the maws weren't attached to anything that was like a head. It had any number of eyes as well, and tentacles of varying lengths. The hellhound had some fur, but mostly the demon dog was stinking pink flesh. Ymir was impressed that Tori's potion of demon control was able to handle a creature like that beast. He was still skeptical about the shampoo. Tori strode forward, covered in her stone armor, with her stone hammer, which she threw into a creature before it could get to the dwab. Tori laughed. I can see you coming, and so can Fluffy. She's such a good girl. Girl? Ymir wondered aloud. Girl, Tori affirmed. The hellhound grabbed two other Apotexa out of the air and crushed them. Lightning crackled across Fluffy's misshapen body, but the attack did her no harm. The sun gate was still down. Hell knights, metal armor, helmets, red eyes, marched forward with demon spiders on their backs. When they were under the gate, Ymir again used the winter flame ring to stop them. This time, he iced them up, their spiders, the entire company, until the very rock itself frosted over. They were trapped there in ice, their red eyes glowing. They could summon weapons of flame, but the Hell Knights could also hurt Dujas. Trapped in ice, however, they couldn't use that power. Fluffy limped up on legs of different sizes and sniffed the ice. She let out a whimper. Aw, Fluffy wants to keep fighting, Tori said with a grin. Her eyes were still glowing. She was seeing beyond the torn veil. She'll get her chance. They're going to be breaking through any time now. And Herencia the Raven will be here, but the fight's not here, Ymir. Your fight is going to be when the Illuminate Spire explodes and Herencia opens the portals. That's what she's doing now, all over Thera. Every palace, killing every royal family. We can't stop that. It was gonna happen. But we can forge this eighth damn ring. Fuck me, Rocky, but it's the only way to win. Curry came soaring overhead, holding Gatha in her arms. The pair floated down to the ground. 
The winged woman's face was streaked with tears. Of course, she thought this was the final battle of her life. Oh, how very wrong she was. Gatha snapped out her tusks, then summoned her sunfire sword and flaming shield. The she-orc covered herself in armor that burned like hell's own inferno. Don't tell me the fighting is over. Don't you tell me I missed the war. Serena wrinkled her nose. You didn't. But I never imagined war would be so smelly. Though I would suspect the stink is mostly the hellhound. I have shampoo for that, Tori protested loudly. Ribby floated down with all of her tentacles wriggling. She had her trident and her magic. She rolled over to Ymir and kissed his cheek. Sorry I'm late, Ymir. Ziziva had us get all the inventory out of the store. She and Gertie are in the Imperial Palace, a special place that Della promised would be safe. I told that Ziziva if she even thought about showing up to fight, I'd kick 110% of her fucking ass. You should go work on that dumb ring. We can handle things down here. These fuckers don't look so tough. Then Ribby saw the hellhound. Fuck me. Did Tori's potion work? Seems so. Ymir called to Tori. How long do you have until the magic runs out? Tori looked annoyed. Ah, it's permanent. But if I take off the ring, Fluffy goes back to the abyss. Ymir, Garum thundered from the top of the wall. It fills my heart to see you with your axe again. But why not use prolium magic? Ymir had his reasons. It was all part of the trap. Standing in freezing rain had me missing the tundra. How goes the battle? Garum raised his bloody sword in his right hand. His arm ended in a spiked buckler. He had form magic that could transform his missing arm into any number of things. Whatever you've done, Ymir, it seems to have worked. All these bastards are falling back for now. And you held the gate, I see. Ymir knew the fight had just begun. In the cloudy twilight, with rain pouring down, they saw lights flash on the other side of campus. Garum laughed from the wall. Looks like Brodor will be earning his keep. He's on the other side. You might want to go and help him. The orc professor was drawn back into battle. It all seemed so easy until the windows of the librarium citadel lit up. It was the unmistakable flicker of portal magic. Glass shattered as both Ratwings and Apotexa broke out of the library. They immediately descended on the defenders. Gatha leapt up and severed the wings of a Ratwing. She threw her fire sword into the chest of one of the altered winged warriors. Curry slammed her swords through other mutated Jataksha, flying like a killing wind into the incoming enemies. Ymir swept a wave of fire to burn the wings off other flying foe. He froze several rat wings, and they hit the wall and cracked apart. Their blood turned to ice. The real problem was the portal inside the citadel. They had to close it. Jenny Bell's magic seemed to have failed, but Ymir thought there was more to it than that. Then, from above the entire top of the library erupted in flames, in lightning, in thunder. Smoke choked the entire sky from the maelstrom of destruction. The illuminate spire was no more. And Della might have been up there. Getha let out a shriek of disbelief, horror, heartbreak. How many books had been destroyed in the explosion? How many more were burning? Gatha sped into the throne auditorium. Her speed was enhanced with Moon's magic. At the same time, a blast of hellish heat hit the wall, the sun gate, and Ymir's ice filling the passage. The blockage melted in seconds, but that blast also turned the Hell Knights into slag. The giant spiders on their backs were either turned to ash, or they rolled up into tight balls of sizzling flesh. In the mess of the sun gate stood the leader of that army, Horencia the Raven, in her archaic plate metal armor. Her raven-shaped helmet was open, and a green fire burned where her face should have been. It seemed Horencia had been adept at sunfire sorcery. 
she had a flail with a rusted chain. The striking stone also burned with green magic. Her fiendish voice filled the courtyard. I hope I'm not too late to teach a few lessons. I have a great deal of wisdom to impart. She raised the rod of her flail. Hello, Ymir. Brave Curla said you were handsome. Too bad I will have to ruin that pretty face of yours. Perhaps a kiss first. Ymir laughed at her. Here you are, the demon conqueror herself. Too bad I don't have a single second to give you. Tori, if you please. Tori pointed her rock mallet. Sicker, Fluffy. The hellhound bowled into the demon and threw her across the ground. Fluffy then retreated to the safety of the courtyard as Tori shouted, Lutum Fashionara! The dwab filled the sun gate with stone. It would be harder to melt than ice. But already, the rock was glowing. Curry flew down next to him. Not the moon's tower, Kopak, but there. She pointed at the top of the destroyed library. There is where we'll have the kiss of lightning and the death of love. My death. No, Ymir thundered. You stay away. Fight down here. I don't need your sacrifice. You know the plan. Curry might have tears on her face, but her eyes were clear. I know my fate. She flung herself away. Ymir tried to grab a hold of her duja, but he couldn't. She had the iron mind, the shukayuya. Ymir cursed the night and Curry's stubbornness. For a second, he debated on what he should do. His satchel hung from his shoulder, and inside were his very important potions and the mold for the Ring of the Awakened. He had his throwing axes at his side and his battle axe. The steel reminded him of the plan. He had to stick with the plan. He thought to use the top of the moon's tower for his trap, but the ruins of the illuminate spire might work just as well. He ran after Gatha. In her present mind, she would make mistakes, and their situation had become too precarious for any kind of mistake. And just like that, all of Ymir's plans threatened to come undone. Racing into the center of the librarium, he saw Aribel, Derespo, and Nelly, all standing near the open portal. Duke Odd Corey and the Viscount Roger Nelnap were close by. Roger looked shocked, while Odd Corey merely laughed. On the floor were markings, runes, and black candles. Lily and Jenny Bell stood in the archway that led to the feasting hall. The yellow flames painted their shocked faces in a terrible light. Gatha stood there, not moving a muscle as she held her sunfire sword. Ymir wasn't sure why his wives weren't attacking. Then he saw that Derisbo had a knife to the throat of Lily's mother, Queen Ellen Velia. Chapter 44 Ratwings and Apotexa continued to fly out until the portal fizzled to a close. The monsters didn't attack anyone in the room. They flew toward the exit to plague the defenders on the gates and to break their ranks so the entire campus would be flooded. Derispo was the first one to talk. Well, now, we were just gonna open a little portal and be gone. But then the queen came in here, and one thing led to another. Ymir didn't need to talk to these betraying fuckers. He had the Akiric rings. He could have frozen their entrails into ice cubes. But he wanted to play the game for a moment, to get information from Darius before Ymir butchered all of these assholes. He opened his mouth, as if he was going to cast a spell. Darius dug the blade into the throat of the queen. Oh, no, Ymir. One syllable, and I cut the queen's throat. Who knows? That might help us. I mean, we got the Sorrow Coast Kingdom thanks to Nelly here. And after Queen Shapta kills most of the ruling council of the Farmington Collective, Odd and Roger will be in charge of that. So that gives us how many kingdoms, darling? Five, Aribel grinned. 
It would be three, you stupid cunt, Jenny Bell called from the other side. If you got the elven kingdom, it would be four. Please, Queen Ellenvelia begged. Don't kill me in front of my daughter. Lily was the color of snow. She was clearly terrified. Ymir felt bad for the elf girl. He would have to make this interrogation quick. So, Darius, when Shopta failed to take Josentown the first time, that was just a ruse, wasn't it? Darius's smile was wolfish. Couldn't make it too easy. Just like it was no accident that Edwin Hyendel had a copy of Lucia Belcoujan's book. We wanted you all to feel safe and sound when Shopta attacked. She's not Shopta, Ymir said. She's someone else. But that doesn't matter much. Don't matter at all. Nellie Bell's laughter was shrill. Played you all like I played King Velus. I hated fucking him and his whore wife, but it was worth it in the end. Got myself a little queendom of my own. And tell Della it was me. I didn't want our princep to turn slutty on us. I figured with how tight you and her is, I could mess that up for you. Sent her a single little sand letter after I saw her go into the zoo when Ribby was there alone. Pretty fucking clear what happened that night. Nothing much happened after that, I bet. Ymir chuckled. She'll be grateful to know that was you. I think I have everything for now. Except one more thing. Why blow up the Illuminate Spire? Two reasons, Odd Corey said. For one, we wanted to fucking kill Della. For two, Shapta didn't want you using those artifacts against her. Fucking Della said she wouldn't never, but we didn't believe that bitch for a second. Ymir went to freeze Darius, but Katha had something to say. Jenny Bell, you don't fucking touch your sister. She is mine. I will kill your kin. You don't want the weight of that on your- Fuck this. J. Luproleum. Roger Nelnap yanked Odd Corey's head back and cut his throat with a dagger of ice. Blood poured down the boy's robes. Ymir found the amwabs in Darisbo's arm and froze it solid, from his shoulder to the tips of his fingers curled around the knife. Then Ymir did freeze his entrails solid. The fucker let out a shriek of pain. Calum Kalarum! Gatha blurred from the moon's magic. Her sword was through Ari Bell's chest in seconds. She turned and removed Nellie Bell's head in the same motion. Both Swamp Coast women were dead in a flash. The she-orc then dropped her elbow down into Darius's arm. It snapped off and hit the floor, shattering. Fresh blood mixed with the frozen blood in Darius's stump. Lily was there with her ice spear. She drove it through the Cujan boy's chest, right through his heart. Lily hadn't needed to do that. Darisbo wouldn't have been able to do much since his insides were frozen. However, it was a nice gesture. Lily had saved her mother. Queen Ellenvelia nearly collapsed, but Lily caught her. I have you, mother. I will not let you fall. The queen wept softly into her daughter's shoulder. Jenny Bell appeared behind Roger, walking out of a portal. The swamp woman had the sapphire fang ready to impale the Viscount. Roger held up his hands. I didn't know the extent of their plans. I mean, I knew enough to be standing in this room, but I couldn't. I didn't. His voice failed. I was stupid to choose such friends. And the Farmington Collective is important to me and to my family. We believe in it. Ymir nodded at the boy. He'd made the right decision. Let's see if we all live to see midnight. For now, you helped breach our defenses. The least you can do is go and fight. Jenny Bell shoved Roger away from her and walked over to the corpse of her sister. The swamp woman burst into tears. Gatha hugged her quickly. Then the she-orc went soaring up to the smoking bookshelves on the sixth floor. Books were in flames, and that fire would spread if it wasn't taken care of. But rain was spitting down on them. That water would damage books. 
and if it hit the lightning tracing the other shelves, it might ignite and start another fire farther down. Ymir, a voice called down to him. It was Linny Lynn Albatross at the very top of the citadel, standing in the smoke and flames. It's time! The moons are aligning! Queen Ellen Velia clung to her daughter. Lily called to her friend, Jenny Bell, go and help Ymir and Gatha. Jenny Bell, tears on her face, grabbed Ymir's hand. You all are the only family I have now. You're all I got. Ymir shushed her. Nothing that happened in the last five minutes changed that. We are as we have always been. The air popped and sizzled as another portal opened and Hell Knights shuffled out. Spiders leapt from their backs, but Lily froze them in the air. They crashed down onto the ground and splintered. A second later, Lily was firing ice arrows from her water bow. However, that bow soon splashed to the floor. Lily staggered back, clutching her heart. Ymir knew why. The Hell Knights were reaching into her duja. Lily screamed out a spell. Jalo and Anis! She'd dispelled the Hell Knight's magic. The puddle under her feet rose into the air and formed her weapon again. She fired more ice arrows. Jalu Anonis, Roger echoed the spell, protecting himself. He put an ice wall around the portal, but the magical flames were eating away at the cold. A hell knight came toward him, and Roger drove an ice spear through the armored thing's chest. Jenny Bell reached out her palms. Blood cross mist boiled out of her hands and into the ice wall surrounding the portal. The first few rat wings through the portal inhaled that poison, coughed, and began hacking up bloody lungs on the floor. The portal was packed with dying monsters and the murderous mist. But other hell knights and spiders had already broken through. Can we close the portal? Ymir shouted. No, Jenny Bell answered. Erasing those runes on the floor won't do much. Darius broke at least some of our warding. But we can keep the portal sealed in other ways. Lily stood over her mother, who wasn't going to be able to help in the fight. The elf girl gave Ymir a smile. Go, finish this, so we can be done with these fucking demons forever. Then she changed her bow into a spear and floated into the air, her dress becoming ice armor around her. She drove the spear tip into the throat of another knight, spun the weapon, and then killed a spider. Ymir strode forward with his trusty double-bladed battle axe and beheaded another knight. When the spider tried to jump on him, the clansmen used the yellow scorch ring to incinerate the giant arachnid. Nothing was left of the creature but a scorch mark on the tiles. Go, Lily shouted. Jenny Bell laughed. Well now, our Lily has become one tough bitch. Jalu Jalarum, Ignis Ignorum, Jalu Devocho. She started and finished the portal magic. She dashed through and disappeared, taken immediately to the ruins of the princeps apartment above. Ymir followed her and found himself back in the rain. As for Della's room, half the floor was gone. They could see down to the citadel's floor, where Lily and Roger continued to fight the Hell Knights. For now, the portal was still sealed by the ice and poisonous mist. Gatha, below them on the sixth floor, was fighting a battle to save her books. She was putting out the flames, not using water, but her magic. She looked up to see Ymir looking down. Tears tracked down her face. In her eyes was fury. She was going to kill whoever had hurt her library. Ymir glanced around. Most of the walls of Della's apartment were gone, just as the illuminate spire was gone. The books, the scrolls, the weapons destroyed. The rain was coming down in sheets, yet there was a perfectly round circle in the clouds above them. Overhead were the three full moons. Each was a different color. The axeman was white, the shield maiden was blue, and the wolf moon was blood red. It was a night of blood, all right. Green fire burned on torches set in stone pedestals, put there by Linny Lynn Albatross. Linny threw off her robes. 
She was wearing hardly anything underneath, a torn camisole and panty that barely covered her. She was barefoot and drenched in the freezing air. A maniacal gleam lit her eyes. Lutum fashionara, Linny called out. White roses grew out of the scorched wood around the stone pedestals, and a sickly sweet smell filled the air. It was the perfume of her demon lover. It was the same scent that Curry had smelled the night her family was killed. Jenny Bell was bent over Della. The princept's face was covered in ash and blood. The princept was unconscious. It was a miracle she'd survived the explosion at all. Below them, the red wall was going to fall. Everyone would have to retreat back into the citadel. Ratwings and Apotexa filled the air. Scholars adept at moon's magic flew about, fighting them. Curry was among them. The Winkin didn't just have her two short swords. She cast lightning bolts from her hand. New magic she'd picked up during her time at Old Ironbound. Ratwings clawed at her, but her iron skin didn't let their claws leave a single scratch. And then she let out a scream, a blast of pure magical energy that tore the wings of an apotexa. The wounded monster fell to splatter on the cobblestones below. Curry had used the Chuki Rime, the spear speech, and it was a powerful weapon indeed. Curry wasn't the only Jataksha warrior fighting in the air. Lieutenant Zusimire Ora Pasola had joined her, as had Lieutenant Zusi's soldiers. Perhaps Zusi hadn't known about Ari and Darius's deceptions and betrayals. Maybe she did. Either way, she and her soldiers were fighting on Old Ironbound's side. Screams filled the night. Bloodshed. Death. But Ymir wasn't going to be rushed. This was the final act in a drama he'd been living since he'd first heard about the lonely man in the crack. Why did Horencia the Raven kill Curry's family? Ymir shouted the question at the Moon Studio Dukes. Linny Lin's eyes were wild. Her laughter sounded like a disease. Le Curico to Chamba is the sacrifice you will use to forge the Eighth Ring. She knows that, but she doesn't know that she is the descendant of Kursak Karuth. Horencia wanted revenge, and she got it. Revenge on the family who defeated her a thousand years ago. Horencia and the Corvidae, Egil's beloved, will rule us with such love and devotion. All have served the Vemper and will serve the Vemper. Like you will, tonight, forging the eighth and last ring. He will rise, and you will get to see living history, Ymir. All of your questions will be answered. Ymir reached into his satchel and pulled out the wine bottle. Then you and I shall drink to answers, and to the return of the Vemper and his Corvidae. I've already talked to Herencia tonight, and we shall soon see brave Curla, and then the Vemper himself. Ymir tossed the cork and downed half the bottle, it hit his douja like a well-aimed axe blade. It didn't crack it, but it did wound the thing inside of him. He handed the bottle to Linny, who giggled and finished it. She then let out a scream. Oh, I feel it in my soul. I feel his coming, the coming of those who were lost. I can feel the Akira Kor, who will soon be freed from the veil. I can smell them. All Ymir smelled were those fucking roses. Linny was too full of the night's excitement to know what she'd drunk. And it was like she didn't care. Of course not. She trusted Ymir. He'd invited her into forging his ring. He'd let her watch them while they gave the ring of the awakened the blessings of their sin. Linny couldn't know what Ymir had planned for her. Ymir set the mold on the central pedestal, and he took off five of the Akiric rings, setting them down in front of the mold. The green fire snapped in the rain, but no amount of rain would be able to put out that diabolical flame. Linny watched, but she wasn't counting the rings. Ymir was able to easily palm the one ring he had to keep for his plan to work. Linny smiled. 
You really do want to forge this last ring. This isn't a trick. It's not. The lie came easily. Gatha floated up through the damaged floor to stand on the wood. She extinguished her sword and shield. Lily came next, a wound on her shoulder that had painted her gown in crimson gore. Others had come to help Roger fight the enemy soldiers inside the citadel. Jenny Bell spun open another portal. The swamp witch had managed to heal Della, and the princess stood, though her face was pale, and her storm gray eyes were lost in bruises. Blood trickled down from a crack in her lip. Tori, Ribby, and Serena walked through the fiery portal. Both Tori and Ribby were wounded, but not badly. For now, Fluffy was back home in her abyss. Tori put the ring on the pedestal. I think this goes here. Curry was flying above, dancing among the thunder and lightning. Her wings were beautiful in the light from the three moons. If Curry was really a descendant of Kursok Karuth, she would have the wings of the rainbow. She would be royalty among her people. Another princess for Ymir. Ziziva flew up in a shower of golden sparks before landing near Ribby. The fairy girl grew into her verum self. Sparkles erupted from her wings. Her wet gown hugged her curves. Ziziva, Ribby shouted. I told you to stay with Gertie. The fairy girl wore a brave face. She smiled. My sisters needed me. My Ymir did too. I couldn't stay away, even though I should. Linny didn't even notice Ziziva's change. No, she was too close to bringing back her demon lord, Egil Acridor. Horencia had been the white rose demon in that midnight garden in Wilhelminaville. That's who Linny had seen. But Horencia served Egil, and so did Linny. Ymir prayed that Ziziva had found a safe place for Gertie. Knowing his fairy girl, Gertie would be fine. All are here, Linny cackled. All are ready. Not just yet, Serena Sia whispered. Another portal opened, and Horencia the raven stepped through, standing impossibly tall. The green torches matched the green fire of her face and her flail. She gazed at the mold and the akiric rings laying on the pedestal. She didn't count them either. And so, here I am for the lesson. But I think it will be you who gives me the lesson, Ymir. Have you come to your senses? We need the kiss of lightning. We need the death of love. Thunder boomed, lightning cracked, and the wolf moon turned even more scarlet against the blue and white of the other two moons. The sleeper must wake from the dream, Ymir said, and we must kill what we love. He put on the black ice ring. It was time for lightning, murder, and the forging of the last Akiric ring. Chapter 45 The sky poured rain all around them, but not at the top of the ruins of the Librarium Citadel, not under the hole in the sky where the three full moons shone down. Horencia's soldiers were fighting the old ironbound defenders, but the demon conqueror herself stood back to watch the forging. Ymir's wives also looked on. They knew what was going to happen. Curry, though, Curry flew above them, watching and waiting. She thought she knew what had to happen. She was wrong. Ymir couldn't use the black ice ring to slow time. He wasn't wearing the gathered breath, and he didn't have the power. However, his douja was full of that potion he'd drunk, a potent mixture of substances to both fill his soul with magic and to crack his core. And Linny Lin's core would be cracked as well, for a very specific reason. When Ymir had first crafted the black ice ring, an odd Akiric ring to start with, He'd had the choice to shatter his douja, which would have freed him from the magic. He thought that once he was free of magic, he'd be able to go home again. But no, his time on the X-Tundra was over. 
Ymir had embraced both his magic and his life at Old Ironbound. He'd done well. He'd found friends, lovers, wives, and a love of learning. But now, it was time to shatter his core. Because he didn't have a douche. He had a demon inside of him. The death of love, Ymir raised his fist. Kalum Kalarum. Using Moon's magic, he called down the lightning. It struck the mold, and it struck him. He channeled that energy into his douja. He felt it crack and shatter, but not completely. It wasn't a douja anymore. Like cracking open a nut, the outer shell was gone. He could cast one more spell. After that, he would be like any barbarian of the tundra, a man without magic. That was why he'd brought his two throwing axes and his battle axe, and it was why he'd taken off the rings. Without a douja, he couldn't use them. Both he and the ring mold were wreathed in snapping arcs of electricity. He thought that his sacrifice might be enough to finish the forging. He loved his douja and spellcasting now, but that wasn't the case. The ring of the awakened sizzled and glowed silver, but it wasn't enough to get that ring forged. No, Ymir knew what would happen once the ring of the awakened was forged. He was rather surprised that his love for his magic hadn't been enough. He loved magic. Fool barbarian, Herencia screamed. One of your wives, kill one of your wives. Well, that wouldn't be happening. I have a better idea. He reached out a hand toward Linny. Jelu Devocho. Ymir felt the power in him leave. He sent the demon core, brave Curla, into the cracks his potion had made in Linny Lin's douja. The dwarven alchemist, Fifan Rendlam, had been dead for centuries. However, Ymir hoped that Rendlam somehow knew how good his theories had been. Linny got a look of horror on her face. What have you done? You loved your demons, Ymir spat. Now you have one inside of you. But we're here for the death of love, are we not? Calum Kalarum. Lightning gathered around the edges of the perfect circle above them. He drew that power down and sent it again into the ring mold and into a perplexed Linny Lin albatross. What are you doing? Ymir, I love you and you're... Then she couldn't talk as her teeth jammed shut. Her hair went up in a torch of yellow flame. Her skin crackled and shrank around her bones. The little clothing she was wearing burst into flames. It wasn't the death of someone that Ymir loved. It was simply the death of love. It had to be powerful, and it had to be true. That was one of the reasons why Egil Acrador chose to murder his beloved sister. He knew that it would work. Ymir didn't love his douja as much as he thought. Nor did Linny love him, his harem, or her demons. But while Linny was no more, the nearly incinerated leftovers of her body smiled. Green fire burned in her eye sockets. She smiled with black teeth. Hello, clansman. It was the voice of the lonely demon from the crack. Brave Curla, kept alive by the power of the Ring of the Awakened, had put her own douja into Ymir. She had been hiding all this time, right in his own core. Ymir thought that the death of Linilin would kill brave Curla as well. That hadn't been the case. But he had another gambit, another tool in the trap. Horencia let out a shriek. Enough trickery and nonsense. I'll kill one of your wives and forge the ring myself. Let's murder your baby's mother. I like killing fairy bitches. Horencia went to grab Ziziva, but the Fei had been trained by Gatha herself. In a flash of golden light, Ziziva cut off Horencia's hand with a sword made from the light itself. She then shifted into her winkle self and went spinning away, showering the ruins in golden sparkles. Ziziva giggled. Don't 
Some old demon is such a waste of semen. The rest of Ymir's wives attacked Terencia, but the demon exploded in a blast of green flames. She backed away, floating off the ruins and whirling her hellfire flail around over her head. Jelu Armatas, brave Curla, the soul inside Linny, created ice armor for herself. She shouted, Jelu Prolium, and armed herself with an ice spear. She went to drive it into Lily, but the elf girl had a spear of her own. She wasn't going to be able to stand long against Curla. Brave Curla, also known as the demon Shot. The Corvidae demon had fought and lived for centuries, and though her magic had been weak, it was strong now. Fighting the two demons would be hard enough, but Ymir had planned to summon a third, the Vemper Egil Aquidor himself. But now? His plan had come undone unless they found a suitable sacrifice. But Ymir wouldn't give up one of his wives. The mere thought threatened to break his mind. No, they needed another plan. Just then, he saw Curry above. His heart fell. No, he whispered, but it was too late. Chapter 46 Lakuri Kochachamba knew that Ymir wouldn't be able to sacrifice himself or the strange Wilhelminaville woman to forge this last ring. Their love wouldn't be strong enough, but Curry knew her love was. She didn't understand all that was going on down in the ruins of the princeps apartment, but she was surprised to see Linny Lynn still standing, and she seemed to still have life. Her charred corpse was covered in ice armor, and she was armed with a long spear of ice, she was fighting Lily in a blast of cold spells and spear thrusts. Ymir came forward with his own axe raised, but then the corpse threw chunks of ice into the kopak, dropping him to the ruined floor. She swept wind into him, nearly pushing him off the platform. Then there was Horencia, her bird helmet back, showing a face of flickering green flame. She battled Ymir's wives, using her spell fire and her flail, which also burned with verdant fire. Curry recognized the flames. She could smell the white roses below. Horencia had killed her family, had wanted to kill her, but Curry had survived to eat the fruit of her fate. Curry had been studying Moon's magic, just enough for her to use lightning in battle and to call that crackling power down from the sky. Curry slew another bat monster and wheeled in the sky. The rat wings and the apotexa converged on the top of the citadel. The red wall was shattered, and the protective magic covering the campus was gone. Lieutenant Zussi was being helped by old ironbound scholars and other soldiers who could fly. But it was clear the creatures wanted to help their mistress murder Ymir and his Elu. With fire leaking from their mouths, the rat wings soared upward. Lightning crackled around the apotexa. Herencia howled above the din of the rain and battle. You can't finish the ring, but I can. I can summon my beloved. She smashed her flail against Gatha's fire armor. The she-orc was knocked off the apartment, but Ribby caught her in a tentacle and flung her back to the safety of the platform. Curry sheathed her swords and let herself fall with her back to the world. Her arms were across her chest, her wings on either side of her. She looked up at the moons there, so full, so lovely, in the impossible hole in the clouds. Time seemed to slow. The rain was merely frozen droplets in the sky. As she fell, she relived the happiest months of her life. Going through the portal had been frightening, and she knew she would be an outcast for abandoning her unit. But the minute she'd smelled the kopeck, when she'd felt Ymir in her arms, she knew she had found her everything. What was her life compared to his? She was an orphan girl. She was strange. She was worth nothing. Still, Serena Sia had come to her when Curry lived alone in her wasi in the sea stair market. 
Curry remembered how good the candy factory smelled and how good it was to have found a friend in the ghost woman. It was Serena that had encouraged her to reach out to Ymir and the Princept, to ask them to help her with her hookay. And the sex with Ymir had been sublime, and she thought she could never be happier. Then she and Gatha had sparred in the skies, and Lily showed Curry her book, The Crippled Cicada, Tori's cookies and kindness, Jenny Bell's eye rolls and laughter, Ribby always complaining about working at the paradise tree, Ziziva giggling at little Gertie's smiles, Ymir smiling at her, learning pigeon, learning to read, learning the lightning magic. It was all wonderful, beyond description. And then that night when she had revealed her darkest secrets to not only her Kopak, but to all the women in his Elu, which was Curry's Elu as well. They had accepted her and loved her. Now she was sacrificing herself for the Ring of the Awakened. She was sacrificing her future happiness of love, of children, of family. Curry turned and saw all the rat wings and winged horrors awash in lightning come at her. Curry drew up the power inside her and let out a piercing scream. Her spear scream cleared the air of her winged enemy. Bat creatures were flung away. One of the Apotexa had her head crushed. Herencia stumbled back, as did Linny Lin's ice armored corpse. Even Ymir and Gatha were knocked down. The scream took most of the energy out of Curry. She was dizzy with the power of it. She didn't need to hold back. She was about to die. She landed on top of the pedestal. Magical rings went clattering onto the roof, but not the mold, not that yet unfinished ring. Curry raised her right fist. Kill em, kill em. Lightning from the hole in the sky curled down like the fingers of the gardener himself. Calum Inanis, Serena Sia screamed. That dark-haired woman had been wearing ice armor. She'd been armed with ice and lightning. Floating boulders had protected her. But now, all of her armor and weapons were gone. Serena stood in a rain-soaked black dress, her beautiful midnight hair blown back from the winds wrecking the top of the tower. Orencia threw a dagger made of green flame. The blade went end over end toward Curry. It would be enough. It would be her death. Serena leapt in front of the throne blade. It sank into her chest just as she screamed, Calum Calarum! Lightning struck her, struck the mold, struck the pedestal. Curry was thrown back by the magic. She went rolling across the floor, but she hardly felt a thing, even as she rolled over her sensitive wings. Serena slumped down onto the floor, leaning up against the stone. Blood poured down her chest to drip on the ground. There was a flash of light, then a dark laughter. The two demon women screamed with joy. The Apotexa all let out cries of triumph. The rat wings howled, spouting fire that mixed with the rain and lightning of the winged horrors. Curry sat up and watched numbly as a shadowy hand rose from the mold, the ring a bright circle of electricity on a long, hooked finger. The hand was coming from the stone, but it was clear something was going to crawl out of that mold. Ymir dragged Serena away. He and Della knelt there with the dying elf. Every one of Ymir's wives sped forward, each scooping up one of the rings that had fallen and putting it on their fingers. They would need those artifacts to fight the incoming rat wings, the Apotexa, the two demon women standing on that blasted rooftop, and whatever shadowy thing was crawling into the world. Curry couldn't believe she was alive. She looked, and her normally white wings were now red, the color of the demon moon above the color of her hair. Could it be? Could she have the wings of the rainbow? It seemed so. Still, Serena would die. 
It hurt Curry. It hurt her very soul. She was so weak now from her scream, from the moon's magic. But now that her fate had been stolen from her, she wouldn't refuse the strange new fruit the gardener had grown for her in the minutes of that night. If she survived, that fruit would be good, too good for her to let slip through her fingers. It was time to fight to live, because she'd failed to die. Chapter 47 Serena clutched the collar of Ymir's shirt. She coughed. Blood speckled her chin. Fucking barbarian couldn't get it right the first two times. Leave it to a woman to finish what a man started. Ymir glanced up. His wives were using the rings well, but those rings wouldn't be able to stand up to Aegil Acridor. His arm was exposed, and his other hand was visible, reaching around the edges of the pedestal, trying to find purchase so he could pull himself from beyond the veil and into the world. Ymir thought he could take care of that fucker, just as Fionnya Maul had done a thousand years before. Della touched the wound. Ignis Cura, she whispered, using her own special brand of healing magic. But it wasn't going to be enough. Ymir thought about the magic he'd used to save Ziziva, but then he'd had the power of a dragon. He was just a man again, a man without a douche, a simple barbarian once more. Serena's smile was wistful. You gave me hours of life I shouldn't have had, and I'm grateful, so very grateful for that short time. The sex, the food... The love I felt, it felt more precious than you can imagine. I couldn't rob your Chetaksha warrior of her immortality. You'll win the ring. You'll give this world and your wives a peace and happiness that will live through the ages. Enjoy it, barbarian. Enjoy every second of it. For in the grand ages of the universe, even forever is a very short time. Tears trickled down Della's face. The death of love? Serena touched Della's face. The death of my love for life itself, perhaps. But no, I know the truth. Watching you all from the shadows, your laughter was my music. Your tears were my own heartbreak. I grew to love you. It was my love, true and tender, that will change the world. Serena closed her eyes and breathed her last. Della grabbed Ymir's hand, let out a single choked sob, and pulled the black ice ring off his finger. She was smart. He couldn't use it. The princeps' tears were gone in an instant when she exploded into flames, swords and armor, an entire inferno of armor and weapons. For a second, Ymir wondered why she wasn't using her gruel blades, a set of swords that could cut through anything. They were there, half covered in ash and burned wood. Ymir realized that they were for him. He'd planned to use his old battle axe, but no, a gruel sword was a faster weapon, and it would be Ymir's speed that would save him from an early grave. He grabbed one of the swords. He smelled fluffy before he saw her. The hellhound was on the far end of the floor. The demon dog grabbed rat wings with her tentacles, ripping off their heads with her fangs. Other mouths worked and chewed. The hellhound murdered while she ate. The stink, though, was truly terrible. Tori was too busy to use her shampoo on the monster. She was in her rock armor, pulled from the wall under them. She had her hammer, as well as a stone shield. Curla, inside Linny's burned corpse, was hammering Tori's stone shield with her ice sword. Fractal fragments went flying, but the demon remade her sword and kept up the assault. One of Lily's feet was trapped in ice, 
and she was struggling to get free. Tori had saved Lily by both summoning Fluffy and stepping into the fight. Despite their courage, both women were in trouble. Until Ziziva came around in her verum self, wearing the yellow scorch ring. Fire took off the rest of Curla's flesh until only bone was left, bone encased in ice. She still had a heart, though. The black thing was beating in some charred flesh on the left side of her chest. Brave Curla hurled icicles at the fairy girl, but Ziziva easily dodged them or turned them into steam with a thought. It was an odd choice that the fairy girl would get that particular ring, and she hadn't practiced much with it, but she was at least distracting Curla enough for Tori to give the demon one good smack with her stone hammer. Ice and bone crunched. Curla raised a fist, and the rain around her turned into ice daggers that slammed into Tori. Ziziva was able to dodge most of the missiles, but then one cut into her wings, and she fell to the top of the roof. When Curla tried to hack her in two, Ziziva turned the demon's ice sword into water. Lily shouted, Jelu Jalaram, and froze that water on Curla's face. The demon couldn't see. The green flames in its eyes had turned to ice. Lily then slipped on the winter flame ring. She went skating through the air, frost on her bare feet. She was using the water in the air to let her run. She created her water bow as she ran through the air, releasing ice arrows into the flying demons around them. She spun and sent a fractal shaft into brave Curla's heart. But the demon was powerful, supremely so. The green flames in her eyes burned through the mask of cold. The ice arrow in her exposed heart turned to vapor as green fire burst forth, cauterizing the wound. The black heart continued to beat. Across the platform, Jenny Bell was using her portal magic to engage Horencia the raven. Jenny would strike with her sapphire fang and then disappear into another spinning ring of fire. Where was she getting the doja? Jenny was wearing the gather breath ring so she could pull magical energy from around them, and that was enough to fuel her portals. Gatha wore the flesh steel. She had a Jataksha's wings and her own fury. Her swords cut down up a Texa and rat wings in a rain of blood and fire. She glanced down at her winged sister wife. Curry, to me! We can keep the platform free of enemies! Curry was trying to work her wings, but she was spent. Her scream and that moon's magic had exhausted her. One lightning warrior went to spear Curry through her back, but Ribby was there to block the attack with her trident. The crystal null ring on Ribby's finger flashed, and the Apotex's lightning flickered as the creature went falling to the hard ground below. Ribby shot Ymir a smile. I can't get the doujas of the demons, but I can help our princept with my own magic. Her core needed some mermaid love. Watch now. Della appeared by Curla. The princept's flame sword cut through the demon's leg. It nearly toppled, but brave Curla was too powerful to let a missing limb stop her. She grew a new leg made of ice. She went to strike at Della, but once again the princept seemed to disappear. But no, she was able to pause time in short increments, thanks to Ribby giving her added douja. The princept reappeared by Horencia. The demon had grown a new hand, one made of green fire. Della hit the demon with her sunfire magic, and part of her armor glowed red hot before melting down her chest. Like brave Curla, Horencia didn't have flesh. Her body was made up of green flame and bone. Della drove her blade through the hole in the armor and into Horencia's black heart. But like Curla, Horencia could heal that with a thought. The two truly were immortal. Della turned and hurled sunfire missiles into Apotexa, killing three, one after another, before vanishing again. Lily skated near Horencia, firing ice arrows as she went. Ymir blinked sweat and rain out of his eyes. His wives were dealing with the demons and their armor, but it was going to be up to Ymir to take care of their lord. 
and to find a way to end this. But first he needed to get the last of the rings he'd worked so hard to create. The Vimper Eagle Aquador emerged from the stone pedestal, a man with long black hair and a black beard. The Ring of the Awakened crackled around his finger. A crimson cloak fluttered from his back. He wore king's finery, but no armor. He did have a sword. He drew the weapon, a long, straight sword, an elven blade, with silver runes running its length. Ymir knew the sword had a name, but he'd forgotten it. Good thing he wouldn't be graded on this fight. He might not have passed. Ymir approached the Vemper, one of the most fearsome men to ever walk Raxid. He was a monster, all right. Egil inhaled loudly, his nostrils flaring. And so you've brought me back from the grave. But from the look in your eye, clansman, you want to send me right back to it. Around them was chaos, Yet the two were talking like it was a Sunday afternoon. Ymir grinned. A good woman died tonight to forge that ring on your finger, and I'm pretty sure she'd want me to have it. She wasn't my sister, though, so you might not be able to understand. Egil laughed. In life, I threw off such quaint ideas of morality. In death... I've seen that there is nothing but power. Power is the only thing that matters. Ymir remembered what Grandfather Bear had said. The truth is buried in the heart of a good story. But Egil didn't have a good story. He'd lived centuries, and he'd gone on living after death. Yet all he wanted was power for power's own sake. That was the truth of the demon Vemper, and it was a sad one. Ymir couldn't help but laugh. And I thought you might be interesting. But here you are, talking about power. You're a sad little boy who has learned nothing. It should be easy enough to take that ring from such a child. Egil pointed his beautiful sword at Ymir. I didn't kill the last barbarian quickly enough. I learn from my mistakes. It is why I'm so powerful. Weak is the man who has to insist he's strong. Ignis, Egil started the spell, but he couldn't finish it. Ymir struck like a viper, again, again, again. Each time Egil tried to speak a spell, Ymir was there, striking, disrupting the magic, just as Fionn Yamal had done on the Night of Fire. The Vemper blocked every attack, but he couldn't use his magic. In the end, it would come down to swordsmanship. The better warrior would win. The pair danced around the pedestal, their swords clashing in sparks, and Ymir knew that any other weapon in his hand would have been broken by the Vemper. But Della's blade was perfect, and Ymir had been training with Garum for years now. Ymir parried a blow. No, Duja, you can't strike at me. But why aren't you using your spells? You knew magic when you were alive, didn't you? Egil was too out of breath to respond. At one point, he tried to punch Ymir, but the clansman easily ducked out of the way. And he slashed Egil's leg near his ass. Blood covered Ymir's blade, Fucking barbarian, Egil roared. Ymir laughed. I've heard those words a lot at this school. Fucking barbarian, Egil screamed again. Ymir felt fingers reach into his heart. Icy fingers from the Ring of the Awakened. But while Ymir had a heart pumping blood, he didn't have a douche. The Vemper couldn't touch him. Egil finally shouted in frustration, Curla, Herencia, to me. And where are your other wives? Shia Malia, Haley Gold, Bly, Kyla, Lucy the Last. Ymir spoke the names of the Pentacor as he parried attacks and struck at the demon Vemper. Egil tried to answer, but if he couldn't cast spells, he certainly couldn't answer questions. 
spiders rushed up onto the platform. The demon arachnids had climbed the outside and were coming over the edge. That pulled Ymir's wives from fighting the things in the air to fighting the spiders. There were cries of terror, of pain, and Ymir knew if they didn't win the battle in the next few minutes, they'd lose it forever. From inside the Librarium Citadel came the clang of battle, the shouting of spells, ice and fire and destruction. Horencia the Raven and Brave Curla had been cut and slashed and battered, but they were still standing, and they had spells. Their hands glowed. Curry sped across the ruined floor of Della's apartment and cut into Horencia, also known as Shapta, the bit of bad darkness that had murdered Curry's family. The Jataksha warrior removed Horencia's leg, arm, and head, and green fire fountained out of Horencia's armor. It was the distraction that Ymir needed. He stormed forward and cut Egil's hand off, the same hand that wore the eight the Kyrick ring. No! Egil went to cast a spell, but Lily filled his mouth with ice. Ymir bent and plucked the ring off the cooling hand. He now held the circle of lightning. Some called it the sleeper's ring, but no. To Ymir, it was the ring of the awakened as in, the sleeper had awakened. There were many sleepers. The immortal Vemper, whose very soul was tied to the eighth the Kyrick ring. Brave Curla, who had been sleeping inside Ymir's Duja. And lastly, Ymir himself. He had awakened to magic once, and he would do it again. Della fell against him, kissed him, and put the black ice ring on Ymir's finger. At the same time, Jenny Bell was on the other side, giving him the gather breath. Egil's eyes widened. He sped forward, but Curry was there, and she grabbed a hold of the Vemper and pulled him back, even as the skeletal Curla froze Curry's wings. Gatha flew in and gave Ymir the flesh steel ring. The she-orc's white wings disappeared, and she ran off the extra speed. Lily skated by and tossed him the winter flame, and then deftly dropped to the scorched wood. Ziziva appeared in her verum self and gave him the yellow scorch. Tori flung him the veiled tear ring. He caught it. Fluffy let out a yelp and vanished. Horencia slammed her flail against Curry, breaking an already frozen wing. It seemed Curry might meet her fate after all. But then Ribby gave Ymir the crystal knoll ring. All eight of his fingers were covered by the eight Akiric rings. The collection was complete. His eight wives surrounded him. Lily Nehenna, Jenny Beljosen, Tariah Welldeep, Gatha the Dragon Slayer, Caribda Delfino, Ziziva Honeygood, Lukuri Kocha Chamba, and a woman who had been destined to join them from the very beginning. The honored princept, Della Panez. Ymir wore the rings, and he wouldn't have been able to use any of them except for the power of the Ring of the Awakened. He felt the cores of his wives around him, just as he felt their heartbeats. The first person to forge the rings didn't use them to conquer. He'd used them to unite the known world. The truth of that story filled Ymir as did unimaginable power. Time slowed, then stopped. Chapter 48 Most of the time when Ymir put on the veil tear ring, the world around him was a mixture of the past, present, and future. This time, however, something completely different happened. Ymir stood expecting to hear the voices of the Akira Corps. But instead, there was silence. Of course, the Akira Corps had been Egil's Corvidae all along. It was why those demon women had hated Serena Sia. Since they lived outside of time, they knew of her sacrifice. And yet, they were powerless to stop it. Ymir stood in the ruins of Della's apartment, with spiders blackening the citadel with rat wings in mid-dive, with three demons standing across from him on the platform. His wives were in various combat poses, ready to kill anything around them. 
all were bathed in the light of the three moons above. Ymir felt the power throbbing in the ring of the awakened, the eighth ring. He felt it reaching into him, feeling for his duja. It wasn't there, but he could create it simply enough. It would just take a bit of a spin. He remembered how he'd helped Gertie with her magical core. Using the gathered breath, he took a bit of the duja from each of his wives, and he shaped all that energy into a ball. Before, his duja had been blue, but now it was a shadowy ball, swirling raggedly inside of him. Yes, he had his magical core again. He started shaping it more, smoothing it out so it wasn't so ragged. He glanced up. Agel was moving toward him, mouth forming a word, and Ymir knew that the Vemper hadn't come back from the dead merely to die again. He was a powerful man, perhaps the mightiest sorcerer ever to walk on Raxid. Ymir didn't have forever, despite what he could do with the black ice ring. Ymir suddenly had an idea, something that put a smile on his face. Before, when he fought Unger, He'd gotten a taste of Animus. That was what dragon souls used to give them their powers. Gertie had combined Ymir's Duja with Ziziva's. Both parents had been supremely powerful. What if Ymir could combine his Duja with a dragon's Animus core? He saw how he could do it. Using the gathered breath to pull in the needed power, the veiled tear to recall the qualities, and the flesh steel to mimic a soul based on Animus. But the real source of power would be the Ring of the Awakened itself. He saw how he could use the Eighth Ring to augment the powers of the other rings. The Crystal Null wouldn't just drain power from others, but he could leech that power into himself. With the Gather Breath, he could channel power back into the Dujas of his harem. As for the Veiled Tear, he didn't need to fear the demons or the Hellhound. Fluffy, it seemed didn't necessarily need to be tamed, though she was now. And then there was the black ice ring. He could both slow time and stop it, because he didn't need the gather breath ring as a power source. He had the ring of the awakened now. His duja was a spinning orb of darkness. Ymir triggered the veiled tear, and he saw his fight with Unger, and he ignored all else except for that moment when Ymir had become a dragon. At that moment, he triggered the flesh steel. Then it was a matter of adding the gold of the Animus to his duja. At first, the energies didn't want to mix, the duja and the Animus. But he reached out and found brave Kurla's soul. It was easy to find, since it had been inside Ymir for so long. Using the crystal null, he drained it dry. Yellow mixed with black in long rivers of color. When it started to sputter, Ymir found Horencia the Raven's soul, drained it, and that was what did it. His core was complete. He had his duja again, and he had an animus core. He had a vague idea of his possible powers, but the names of the spells eluded him. Something did try to flash in his vision. The image looked like the outline of a two-headed dragon but then it faded. He couldn't use all those abilities, not like he had before, but four powers came to mind. Animus absorption, partial transformation, homo draconis, true form. He never had a chance to use them. Jelu Inanis! Egil suddenly screamed in a cracked voice. Ymir's magic was gone. Time started again. The speed of Ymir's sword had kept Egil from using his spells. Now that there was a good ten feet between them, the sorcerer had access to his full arsenal. The Vemper screamed the same spell combination that Serena had used. Jalu, Ignis, Calum, Lotum Fashionara. Flames burst from Egil's severed hand. It was a roaring inferno, a weapon of spitting fire. Egil drew the rocks from Tori's armor and locked himself into an impenetrable suit of stone that doubled his size. Rainwater whirlpooled around the Vemper in a cyclone. Lightning crackled up and down Egil's sword. The runes glowed like the noonday sun. 
Eagle Aquador must have torn something in his throat. He spat blood. Now, you fucker, I'm taking those rings back. I'm taking this fucking world back. But first, I'm going to rip your soul apart. You can try, Ymir grinned, because I have one now. Ymir then plucked the two hand axes from his belt and hurled them both at the Vemper. Egil flicked them away using his protective cyclone. It gave Ymir the split second he needed. He grabbed a pouch full of powder, Lutus coelduox, and threw it into the cyclone of water protecting Egil. Thanks to his alchemy class, the substance exploded, spewing fog. In seconds, the top of the citadel was covered in mist. What you learned at this school can't save you, boy, Egil thundered. And your rings can't help you either. Ymir reached out with both the winter flame and yellow scorch rings, but he couldn't find the amwabs of the Vemper's body. Egil had some kind of protective magic. Lutum Lutarum. Ymir used form magic to shed all of his clothes, thinking he might be able to take the form of a dragon. But while he had Animus, this wasn't the time to try anything new. Jelu Armatus. Naked, he used flow magic to cover himself in ice armor with flow magic. Jelu Prolium. More flow magic gave him a double-bladed battle axe made of ice. Egil moved forward, and his cyclone moved with him, threatening to catch Ymir up in the whirlpool. The clansmen couldn't freeze the man, but he could freeze all that water. He turned it into snow, and fat snowflakes whirled around them, adding to the mist he'd created with Lutus Coelduox. Ymir then cast Moon's magic to speed forward, gripping his cold axe in both hands. He had a skull to cleave. Egil let out a scream and hurled Prolium missiles at Ymir. But Ymir was moving too fast. He dodged most of the magic, or he blocked it with his axe. Egil's bearded face glowed in the sizzling spout of flame gushing from his severed hand. There was anger there, but there was also fear. There should be. Ymir used the flesh steel ring to give himself the wings of a Jataksha warrior. His golden feathers burst out of the ice on his back. He leapt from the ground and brought his axe down on the Vemper's skull. Ymir's ice axe exploded into shards, which carved up Egil's face. It also cracked the Vemper's stone helmet. Egil slashed at Ymir, but he flew over the blade, dodging every one of the Vemper's attacks. Egil brought up his arm of shooting flames and caught Ymir in the chest, but Ymir's armor held. Ymir landed and used the winter flame ring to give himself a gruel sword made of ice. He parried Egil's next attack, and then fell right into a wizarding riposte, a move he'd learned from Della Panez herself. Again, it was something he'd learned during his time at the school. Magically, he sped up the strike and cracked the blade into Egil's leg. Though that piece of rock armor held, and Ymir's new sword shattered, it was enough to catch the Vemper off guard. Ymir flung ice magic into Egil's face, which was already bleeding. The Vemper stumbled backwards and fell onto one knee, trying to wipe the ice from his face. Before he charged Egil again, Ymir stopped to sense things happening around him. The veiled tear ring gave him supernatural awareness. Their enemies were legion. Neither Horencia nor Curla were dead, but they had little magical energy left only a bit to keep Horencia's green fire burning and Curla's ice armor on her bones. Spiders scrambled onto the platform. Rat wings came screaming down toward them, the fire of their breath making them visible in the snowy mist. So, too, the Apotexa were visible, given how they were clothed in lightning. In a flash, Ymir saw everything, thanks to the veiled tear and that same ring gave him the ability to attack multiple targets at the same time. The amount of power in Ymir's new core was staggering. He easily torched all the spiders blackening the top of the Librarium Citadel. Every single arachnid went up in a torrent of flames. 
The stink of their hairy bodies burning actually smelled good. The smoke mixed with the mist and snow, but Ymir could see the creatures in the sky just fine. Ymir felt each spider die. How could that be? And with every death, he grew stronger. Ymir wasn't sure what was going on, but a cloud of creatures threatened to drop down onto them. He coated the wings of both the bat monsters and the apotexa in ice. With their wings covered, they couldn't stay in the air. The rat wings and the lightning horrors fell from the sky like a grisly rain. Again, every single death made Ymir's duja swell. A summoned wind swept down, clearing the platform for a second. Ymir watched as his wives hit Horencia and Kurla like a killing wind. Gatha had two sunfire swords, and she chopped into Kurla through the ice armor, through the bones, through her icy limbs, until the skeleton lay in a pile. But still, that black heart was beating in her ribcage. Gatha extinguished one sword and made a fist. Ignis in on us! That black heart fluttered. With her magic dispelled, Curla's heart was vulnerable. Serena and Ymir had talked about such a possibility. Gatha drove her remaining Sunfire sword into that inky piece of meat. Iker burst out, and Curla let out a final shriek. Her heart would beat no more. Her duja was gone. Brave Curla was dead. The she-orc screamed her victory across the rooftops. Call me Gatha Dragon Slayer. Call me Gatha Demon Slayer, for I have killed both. Ignis Inanus. Della aimed her own spell at Herencia. The demon's green fire flickered for a moment. Her own black heart was exposed in the slag of her armor. Ribby went to drive her trident into the demon's chest, but Horencia batted away the spear with her flail. Horencia then rained green fire missiles onto them all. She turned to flee because she knew she'd be killed if she stayed. Ymir found Curry's duja and channeled energy into it. The Winkin warrior, beaten, bloody, nearly broken, opened her mouth and used her voice as her weapon. Vengeance! The scream threw Horencia onto her face. The demon conqueror turned, holding up an arm, trembling. Curry wasn't done. Vengeance for my blood mother, for my father, for my sisters, for my love mothers. Her wings went from red to white to gold. Every word crunched more of Horencia's armor, until she was flat on the platform. The green fire of her face was only a flicker. Her black heart was barely beating. Vengeance for me, Curry whispered, and drove her sword into Herencia's heart. All of her green flames were gone, and gone was the stench of the white roses. That left only a single demon lord Alive. Chapter 49 Ymir stood on the ruins of the apartment with fog, spider smoke, and snow swirling around him. He kept breaking his ice weapons, and so he reached out and summoned his old battle axe to him using Moon's magic. It took a moment, but then the weapon was in his hand again. How fine the smooth leather grips felt. Egil climbed to his feet, encumbered by his stone armor, and pointed his sword at Ymir. Calum Prolium! Lightning crackled from the blade, but Ymir summoned an ice wall, which caught the attack for a moment before all that ice exploded, throwing fractal fragments. Ymir used the veiled tear ring to summon Fluffy. The hellhound bounded across the platform and latched on to Egil, but the Vemper drove his inferno arm into her side, and she shrank back, yelping. Ymir sent her back to the abyss. They were definitely going to need Tori's shampoo. Speaking of the brave little dwab, she let out an enraged shriek, 
Hey, that's my dog, asshole. Lotum Lotarum. Tori grabbed rock from Egil's body, exposing his chest. At the same moment, she hurled a vial, which sizzled into his skin. It was Caldric's acid, another thing they'd learned in their alchemy class. They'd revisited the formula in their potions class that year. Ymir raced forward and again used his wings to lift himself off the ground. He swung his axe into Egil's already wounded chest. The blade severed muscles and shattered ribs, even as the Caldric's acid ate into the metal of the blade. Ymir wrenched the weapon free and then caught Egil's lightning sword with the shaft. Egil thrust his face into Ymir's. The Vemper was bleeding, ice burned, infuriated. You can't kill me, you fucking barbarian. I'm immortal. Thanks to your magic, Ymir laughed. And since you no longer have the Ring of the Awakened, it's magic I can take from you. Jailuinanus. It was a very focused spell, completely focused on Egil's black heart, which Ymir had exposed thanks to his own hammered steel. Egil's eyes widened. What have you done? A portal opened next to them, teetering on the edge of the tower. I've killed you. Ymir broke his ruined battle axe to wrench Egil's sword from his hand. Both weapons fell to the floor. What was the name of that sword? Ymir didn't know, and in his fury, he'd bent the blade. Wasn't much of a sword, and Egil Acridor hadn't been that much of a threat. A second later, Ymir felt Jenny slip the sapphire fang into his hand. He slammed it into the ancient Vimper's black heart. The minute the Vemper's heart died, his duja flashed, and the entire world was lit with light. It was noontime again in that rainy night. It was so bright that even the light of the moons was lost. It was a blinding wave of energy. Ymir used the veiled tear ring to see what had happened. Had Egil escaped again? No. Ymir was given a view of that light traveling across the world, across the surface of the entire world. Egil had once somehow used the Akiric rings to reduce the number of boys being born, which caused some women to have trouble getting pregnant. Without Dujas, the clans weren't affected. And somehow, the magic couldn't reach the stoneholds, though the Morbiscor might have had sorcery to keep them safe. Either way, with Egil dead, nature would take its course. It was the end of the Age of Withering. Ymir then lost both his wings and his ice armor. Naked, he fell to the ground. All the lesser demons he'd killed didn't hold a candle to the firebrand of Egil's soul. Ymir felt his anima swell. Those words describing at least four of his dragon skills again filled his mind. Anima absorption, partial transformation, homo draconis, true form. For dragon souls, their true form was their dragon form. For Ymir, thanks to the flesh steel ring, he could steal his own true form. He felt his skin stretch and his bones lengthen, and the animus changed his skin to scales. His fingers became claws. He grew a long tail and leathery wings, and instead of a human face, he had the snout of a beast. And he had his own beard now, a shadow against his black scales, shot with gold. He let out a thunderous roar. He had such fire in him. Yes, because in him was the fire of a dragon. He knew that he'd never lose the ability again. It wasn't just the veiled tear and flesh steel working together. It was also the amount of energy he got from killing the Vemper. He'd undone a great evil, and he would carry that trophy inside him for all the long days of his life, which would be long indeed. With the ancient Vemper dead, Ymir could have some fun. He flung himself off the top of the tower, more rat wings and apotexa went for him, but he pulled out their dujas, wave after wave, adding that energy to his own. And then he stopped time again. Then it was easy to fly through them, ripping them apart, eating them, slashing them to bits with his tail. 
Thankfully, Ymir had been practicing flying for a while. He'd loved to spar with Curry in the sky. It was more than that, though. The flesh steel ring's power gave Ymir an instinct for his new body that a new dragon would never have. Any new spiders that Ymir saw, he ignited immediately. They fell from the citadel, squealing as they burned. It was rather beautiful. And again, Ymir liked the smell of the hair burning. And again, he felt every death. It was clear that even without leadership, the demon army was going to fight down to the last soldier. That was fine with Ymir. He flew around to the flow courtyard. Garam Sornap and most of the defenders had retreated back into the citadel. Ymir stood for a second under the dragon archway, as a dragon. He took a second to enjoy the irony. Then he shifted into his human form, for now he had multiple forms. He covered himself in ice armor and summoned still another ice battle axe. His old axe was broken. It was a weapon of his old life. His new life had any number of new weapons. He charged the Hell Knights and stone soldiers. The Hell Knights tried to reach into his duja, but were soon confused by the presence of the Animus. Any energy they stole, Ymir used the crystal null ring to steal back. In turn, he either froze them in place or turned them into puddles of melted armor. He flung proleum missiles or stole energy, or even held enemies frozen in time while he hacked them apart with his axe. He killed dozens at a time. Garum, the other professors, the scholars, even the last of the Jataksha mercenaries, all stood back to watch Ymir work. Ymir swung his battle axe until his arm was sore. Using the Veil Tear Ring, he could anticipate where his enemies would be in a few seconds, so he flung proleum missiles to kill them where they stood. When the final stone soldier was killed, Ymir found himself on a pile of bodies. He slid down the corpses, standing in his ice armor and leaning on his gore-spattered ice axe. So this is where you are, Della floated down next to him. With her was the rest of Ymir's harem, from Lily to Curry. His Winkin wife hurried to him, kissing him, before Gatha pulled her back. Then Gatha and Curry kissed and the winged warrior wasn't too ashamed, even when Lieutenant Zussi and the rest of the mercenaries frowned and whispered their disapproval. Lily and Jenny Bell kissed each other, and then him, and then Tori pulled him down to his knees so she could kiss his face. Ribby joined them, laughing, cursing, and even crying a little. She sprouted tentacles to hold Ymir tight, while her tongue found his. They were alive. They'd won, and now they had all eight of the Akiric rings. Even though he normally hated jewelry, he liked the feeling of all those rings on his fingers. Ymir gazed at the faces of his harem and realized his collection of princesses was complete. He had royalty from all the races of Thera and then some. Curry wasn't going to only kiss her kopak once. She drew him away from Ribby and Tori and kissed him tenderly passionately. She hadn't needed to eat that bitter fruit after all, and he swore that for the rest of her life, she'd only have the sweetest of fates. Ziziva giggled in her winkle self, flying all around and leaking gold dust. She carried Gertie, who had been safe and sound with some professors and scholars in the scrollery. Della Panez eased Curry away. I think the most honored princept at Old Ironbound needs a turn. She clucked her tongue at him. Every fucking year, barbarian, you create such a mess. I'll take that as a compliment. Ymir took the princept in his arms. He kept his ice armor on, else he would have been naked. He'd have to figure out how to enchant clothes that might transform with him. Ziziva might know. Gertie let out a happy scream. There were shouts of joy and singing, but Ymir hardly heard them. He was staring into the gray eyes of Della Panez. The princept put her hand behind his head, and then she kissed him, for all the school, for all the world, to see. 
Chapter 50 Lakuri Kochachamba woke to the spring sun. She could feel the change in the weather. It had been weeks upon weeks of rain since that fateful night when Serena Sia had eaten the bitter fruit of death. No one had seen her or smelled her perfume since. She was gone for good. Curry's friends had passed their third exams, though even now such things seemed silly. Ymir and his Elu had used their talents to both summon and kill an ancient evil. And now, after the Night of Blood, events in the world would never be the same again. And yet, Ymir wanted to finish what he'd started. He wanted to play the silly games, finish them, and walk away victorious. He had his books to finish and publish, as did Lily, and Jenny Bell was also working on a spellbook of her own, outlining both portal and warding magic, though the princept wasn't sure she wanted the world to know about that power. It might end up back in the Illuminate Spire if they rebuilt such a thing. For now, there was a temporary roof over Della's restored apartment. And Gatha had a new project. Now that the Hyendel collection was complete, she had to try to undo the damage the explosion had done to several floors of books, Replacing the texts, or repairing the books, from both the fire and water damage wasn't easy. In some cases, they had to be copied over into new books. They were all busy, including Curry, who was mastering Pigeon and improving her writing skills. She had to write any number of sand letters to send back home to Rata. The city-states were rebuilding, However, it wasn't merely a matter of restoring what Horencia the Raven had destroyed. No, change was in the air across the two continents. Speaking of change, Curry had trouble changing the color of her wings. It took a lot of concentration. Still, she loved that she could color her wings to match her outfits. She also wanted to learn form magic so she could put different colors in her hair. Tori said it was possible, and Tori had been studying form magic for four years. Curry sat at the opening of her nest, gazing out across Angel Bay. The easterly winds were warm and sweet from the blossoms of the forests. The shantytown around the Red Wall was gone. The refugees had returned home. Both the campus and the world were so very different now. Curry felt like she was living in a dream, she was living minutes that shouldn't have been hers. It all felt so very strange without a guiding wind. Ever since her mother threw her from their wassy, Curry had followed the winds. She'd done her best to eat the gardener's fateful fruit that he'd grown just for her. She would have willingly sacrificed herself. It wasn't meant to be. She'd survived the night of blood. Some called it the Night of the Dragon because Ymir had been seen shifting from human to dragon, using magic that people hadn't seen for thousands of years. All because of the Akiric rings. Ymir knew their history, and they hadn't always been used for evil. He had stories of the first set of Akiric rings, but he was keeping those stories to himself for now. The Night of Blood was probably a better name, because the demons hadn't just attacked Old Ironbound, Portals had appeared in all the major palaces across Thera. Royal families were slaughtered. In Kingwater, the seat of the Farmington Collective, in Serenity Bay, where the last regal families of the Sorrow Coast Kingdom were, in Four Roads, in the Orc City States, and in Greenholm. The House of Nehenna had only two survivors, Queen Ellen Velia and her daughter Lily. As for the Orcs, Glaga the Blade had been slain inside her tent. She'd been on her way to Old Ironbound, but bad weather had slowed her journey. Losing Glaga had thrown the bloodsteps into chaos. Every orc was shaken so much that not even the fighting pits were open. Different gruel chieftains were already claiming leadership. The bloodsteps was threatening to destabilize the entire region, though the future of the continent seemed to be hanging in the balance. The great houses were no more. The lands were in an uproar, and people had only one place to look for leadership, the Magestrial Universitas Collegium. 
Old Ironbound had captured the imagination of the world, and the stories of Ymir offered people a hope they hadn't felt in a long, long time. The surviving Wasis of Curry's homeland also found hope, not in the story of the dragon to the north, but in the warrior who killed the demon conqueror, the lost Jataksha princess who had the wings of the rainbow. They looked to Curry for hope, and so she had to write sand letters home to give them some. Curry couldn't believe she was a part of this dramatic history. She thought she'd live and die as a lost orphan girl. That wasn't the case. Curry didn't bother with her armor. The war was over and would be for a good long time. Tori, Lily, and Gatha had all worked to give her new clothes, wools and silks that had room for her wings. Curry's curachia hung in their sheaths on a hook in her nest. If she never picked them up again to draw blood, it would be fine with her. Gatha wouldn't let that happen, though. The she-orc loved to spar. Curry would play with Gatha, but the winged woman far preferred the bedroom to the battlefield. Curry had no trouble keeping her wings healthy now. She had eight lovers who were willing to help her with her huke. Curry launched herself out of her nest and found swirls of hot air rising from the ground. They were called a chachox in her language. She enjoyed the heat before gliding into a cold breeze, which she followed over the ocean. She remembered her days on the lighthouse island, training, sparring, preparing for a sacrifice that she hadn't needed to make. Then she turned north and flew to the hidden docks and up the sea stair market. She saw where her nest had been, on the rooftop of the Amora Annex, and she saw the paradise tree, which had several new fairy employees, hired by Ziziva herself. Ironically, Ribby still worked shifts at the chocolate store. It seemed the mermaid enjoyed the work, but she simply liked to complain about it. Curry realized she wasn't alone in the sky. Lieutenant Zusimire Orapasola and a few of her surviving women rode the winds with her. Curry flew to the rough stone at the top of the citadel. It wasn't a dome yet, just a platform of rock. Lieutenant Zusi landed with her. Zusi knelt. Again, Koya, I am sorry for how I treated you. Curry helped the lieutenant stand. No, Zusi, I am not Koya yet. But you are a royal. The woman dropped her eyes. Your wings can change color, and everyone knows that all of Reta is looking upon you as a hero. You slew Shapta. You are kind. You have known such hardship, yet you are still kind. And I treated you with such contempt. Curry didn't know what to say, so she pulled Zussi in close, careful not to touch the other woman's wings. That would be improper. Curry whispered into Zussi's ear, You were cruel, but I forgave you. And now you have the chance to be kind. Let that be the legacy of the Jataksha. We are cruel in war, but kind in peace. Curry wondered where those words had come from. They weren't hers, no. They were from one of the books she'd been reading. Maybe a play by Wilmer Swordwright. They sounded queenly. No, they had come from Lily's book, The Crippled Cicada, which was almost done. Curry drew back. What news have you heard from Almaquataka? Zusi finally found the courage to look into Curry's eyes. Like in most places, the temporary governors are taking care of things. For now, there is peace, but all eyes are waiting for the coronation day. You know, some are saying that Ymir is not from the north at all, but he is a Jataksha Kopak from the south, sent to Chinchal land by the gardener himself. He led King Shapta into a trap so he could slay him. Her, Curry said. Shapta was a Koya from the olden times of Chinchaland. Her real name was Horencia the Raven. It was fun to speak her own language again. Chinchaland was Thera, Orinland was Reta, Quintiland was Ethra, and then there was Entiland, the lost lands to the east. Curry took Zuzi's hand. 
The Kopak has a grand destiny, and you will see that on Coronation Day. We have many weeks yet. Months, really. Zussi's smile was bright. This summer will be joyous, because of you, because of the promise that you bring with you. Yes, Ymir has a grand destiny, but so do you, Lokuri Kochachamba. Will you remember me when you come to power, Koya? Will your forgiveness endure? It was too much to think upon. Curry again embraced the other winged woman. Both my kindness and my forgiveness will endure. And then Curry flew down to the paradise tree. She bought a Zoka cave and took it to Della Pinez in her apartment, which had a ledge now. Both Curry and Ymir used it. Jenny Bell just cast her portal magic when she wanted to see the princept. Returning to the zoo, she found everyone was up and busy, eating breakfast and drinking cave. Ribby was in the kitchen, sprawled out so Tori had to keep hopping over her tentacles. For some reason, Ribby didn't have her normal legs. So why are we in these apartments? The mermaid complained. Why aren't we in a palace? We live with a king, right? Everyone knows that Ymir is going to be king. Tori stood on her stool to reach the counter. She cracked eggs into a bowl. He might not want to be king. You know our Ymir. You can't make him do anything. The dwab frowned. Curry touched her shoulder. Bad news from home again? Not great news, Tori admitted. I'm still disappointed my family didn't send soldiers. I think they would have eventually, if we hadn't killed all the demons so quick. It's ironic that my father is now dealing with demons of his own. Those things from the deep keep coming up to the ruby stonehold. It would seem that maybe when we brought Egil and his dumb wives back, we might have woken some other things. Getha marched up the steps. Good, we have something more to fight. Once I restore our library... I just might get the warrior's boredom so bad I'll try to help your weird, bearded people. Tori sighed. We're not weird just because we have beards, and I would have loved to have a beard. But not anymore, the she-orc growled. Gatha pulled Curry away from Tori. Sit, Curry, and I will get you Kaif. The Jatoksha warrior sat. It felt odd to be served. I can get my own. Lily and Jenny Bell came traipsing up the steps. You're new to being a princess, Jenny said with a smile. You've got to get used to being treated like you're special. But she is special. Lily's voice was soft. She kissed Curry's cheek and then sat next to her. Ain't we all? Jenny laughed and poured a cup of kaif for Ymir, who came up holding Gertie in her verum self, bright-eyed and giggling in her father's arms. Curry felt her heart melt. Seeing Ymir and his baby daughter was so cute. Gertie was growing quickly. She had all of her teeth now, and the minute she saw the eggs in front of Ribby, she reached out. Ribby plucked Gertie away from Ymir with her tentacle and gave her a ride down to her lap. Then she fed Gertie some eggs. Why do we only have one baby? We all should have babies, right away. On coronation day, we should all be pregnant. Wouldn't the world be so happy about that? Ymir sat and sipped his cave. The kitchen was packed with people, food, and happiness. Curry caught Ymir's eye. Is there going to be a coronation day? Ymir shrugged. Today is Monday. My feet are in this day. Ribby cursed. Fuck, you always say that. You know, if you wanted, we could make a play for territory on the Dawn Coast. After all that demon fighting that happened in foul water, there were a fair number of casualties, and the Bubano family has basically lost faith in my cousin Ibby. Ymir laughed. This day feels suspiciously like the days that have proceeded it. I think I heard Tori say there was more trouble in the Ruby Stonehold. Is that right? Tori shook her head. Trouble enough for my father to send Della a sand letter. The dwarves were able to secure several tunnels, and the threat has been dealt with. 
but we all just might be going to my home at some point. Probably before Coronation Day. Because after? Well, some of us are going to be too important for things like that. Never. Ymir smiled. Curry watched him look at all of his women. He had such love in his eyes. The only two that were missing were Ziziva, who was still sleeping, and Della, who was taking care of the business of running the school after a very eventful first half of the year. She realized that he didn't care about what future days might bring. He was in that moment, loving his Elu, who loved him back. Curry understood the wisdom of his grandparents. Be in the day your feet are in. She'd learned that in these precious moments that felt stolen. She was floating on new winds. She was eating the fruit of a new fate. The winds were warm, and the fruit was delicious. Chapter 51 The honored princept, Della Pinez, stood in the throne auditorium, and while it was graduation day, it was so much more. She'd already called the names of the students graduating from all four schools. Some of them were more memorable than others. Kaki and Gluck and their boyfriend, Buck Minefinder, all crossed the stage. Kaki and Gluck didn't make any dirty jokes, but they did have smirks on their faces. Della knew they were thinking about all the fucking she and Ymir did. Buck and the two she-orcs made an odd threesome. The wide-bearded man was so much shorter than the fat khaki and the rake-thin gluck. They were as strange as Eric Bloog and Fryla Walker, the orc and the human girl from the Farmington Collective. However, both were going to be very important soon. It seemed Roger Nelknapp was one of the lone survivors of the families who ran the Collective. He'd already talked to Fryla about helping him govern the region from Kingwater, though it was going to be renamed. It was all changing. Della wondered how many of the scholars would be leaving and how many would stay with her as the wheel of history turned. Della was glad that Stinny Chimervik, otherwise known as Drippy, would remain to help Gatha with the library. Bellasina Bufram, who had lived in the zoo before Ymir took it over, would be ordained soon. She would take over the chapel of the tree. It was good Bellasina was staying, because Ymir would lose profits if she left. That girl drank a ton of Zoka Cave. So, yes, there were many scholars Della had grown to love. Others she didn't miss at all. Daris Bow, Nellie Bell, and Odd Corey, they all deserved their fate for losing the deadly game they'd been playing. Della called out the names of the graduates, and with each name, she struggled to keep her voice from breaking. It wasn't just going to be a change for classes, but a change for her. For the entire school, though it might not be a school for long. It wasn't just the graduation day. It was also a wedding day, as well as the coronation day. And Della had a secret, one she'd not told anyone, not even Ymir. The honored princept stood on the stage in front of the packed auditorium. There were no more chairs. There were 5,000 people standing, more looking in through the windows, and still more overflowing into the sunfire field, just to say they were there at the dawning of a new age. The town of Stormcry was empty. People from all the races were in attendance, including the ocean mother Beryl Delfino and Queen Dilly Day Everjewel, and a retinue of other fairies. Truth be told, it was the Fei that had kept Thera politically stable, putting pressure on families, clans, tribes, and governors to not seize power. In the small hours of that morning, after the night of blood, Queen Didi had sent Della a sand letter, which basically requested a certain plan of action that would lead up to Coronation Day. Della had fought the idea of Coronation Day from the very beginning. It was one of those things that grew from rumor to reality because there was a certain inevitability to the idea. Gossip could harden into history. With each retelling, the mythology of the Night of Blood grew more and more elaborate. People didn't just want Coronation Day, they needed it. From Greenholm to Four Roads to the Sorrow Coast, people needed the stories. For example, 
People in Josentown hadn't just spread rumors about Ymir transforming into a dragon, but it was said that Jenny Bell Josen had been handpicked to rule by Queen Ari Bell herself before Ari died. Nothing could be further from the truth. When it came to history, truth didn't necessarily mean much. It was why the Night of Fire had been shrouded in secrecy. But now, after Ymir's fourth exam and the publication of his book, the truth would be known. Ymir was already outlining his own history and the events that led up to the Night of Blood, leaving out a few incriminating details that would have made Della look bad. And wasn't that history? Even when Ymir and Della agreed they wanted the world to know the truth, they still edited the facts. The alumni consortium had come to the fourth exams, and they walked through the different Dominus Studiae, the fourth-year projects, in examination rooms that the scholars themselves set up. Some were very elaborate, but Ymir's was simple. He had his book there, and he gave each of the alumni copies. In the end, he would pass. All of his harem would, though the alumni were still talking about Lily Nehenna's project, which was an elaborate combination of art, music, and storytelling. The crippled cicada was the unlikely story of an orphan girl who became queen of the world. It was Curry's story as much as it was Lily's. Della didn't call up Ymir's wives first. They, along with Ymir, were the only ones sitting in the room. Each wore a fabulous gown, expensive and delicate. Even Gatha was dressed up. Instead of her usual leather tunic, a flowing white gown drifted back from her shoulders. Though at a glance you couldn't tell, Gatha wasn't wearing underwear. She'd insisted on going bare, even when Lily and Jenny begged her to wear some of the lingerie they'd bought for the special occasion. Ymir sat with his harem at the front. Yes, they were his wives, but he hadn't officially married them yet. That was about to change. The honored princept called the barbarian with Aduja up to the stage. Ymir walked up the steps in his scholar's robes, which he'd insisted on, and they included the leather he'd sewn into the material. Della had forced him into new black boots. The shine made the rest of his outfit dressier. He smiled at her with such love in his eyes. Della had never known such passion and loyalty, not from her family and not even from her school. Della found herself wanting to tell him her secret, but it wasn't time yet, not just yet. Ymir took his diploma from the princept. Then he took her in his arms and kissed her, passionately, for all to see. Yonk Winslow, nor anyone from the alumni consortium, couldn't touch them. Ymir and Della had become the two most powerful people on all of Raxid. They only had one rival, the dragon man of Falwater, the one who'd fought the Pentacore on faraway Ethra, was there, in the audience, along with his own harem of warrior women. They were an odd mix. A frowning human sorceress with her left arm covered in concentration ink and scars from mystical brands. A beautiful Miran pirate with such a mischievous grin sat next to her. With them was a legend from Reta, a white-haired Jataksha warrior every bit as fearsome as Curry in her armor. You could see how deadly the Winkin warrior was. Next to her sat a big, awkward woman with a furry back and a tail. She had a big, goofy grin on the entire time. Then there was a distant cousin of Charybda, a mermaid princess from the Bubano family of the Dawn Coast. Rounding out the menagerie was a human woman who didn't seem human at all, not with those dark, piercing eyes, and a four-armed demon woman from the Ashchima Wastes. Even with all of the different people in the room, the Sukra Jin woman stuck out. All of the names escaped Della, but Axel Drokaris, the man himself, radiated power. He was powerfully built and had midnight black hair and shining blue eyes. Axel Drokaris, a powerful name from a powerful family, and yet Axel was quick to smile and even quicker to joke. He was very different from the barbarian hero. Ymir had talked briefly with Axel 
and they would talk more in the coming days. With a scroll in hand, Ymir faced the audience. A hush fell across the room. He wore all eight of the Akiric rings, even the veil tear ring, which he could control completely. He looked out. You all want a king, or should I say, a vimper, for there has been talk about a new empire now that the age of isolation is over and the withering is no more. A new age has come. I won't be the one to name it. Perhaps Lily can. She is very good at naming things. Age of blossoming, Lily called out. She had a smile on her face. She'd been thinking about it. It was a good name, given the nature of Della's secret. Ymir turned his eyes back to the audience. I am Ymir Virtorg. I slew Golnash the Betrayer. There I can lay my claim to the blood steps. My wife is Lily Nehenna, and Queen Ellen Velia has said she wants Lily to be the next Queen of Greenholm. And there I have claim to the elven forests to the east. My wife, Jenny Bell Josen, is the last of the royal Josens. Through her, I have claimed to Josentown and all of the Swamp Coast. But it doesn't end there, for Queen Nellie Bell Tucker signed secret treaties, giving power to the Josens. In that, I have claimed to the Sorrow Coast Kingdom. And there are other secret treaties. You have the Farmington Collective, Roger Nelnap shouted from the audience. Yes, you fucking do. Frayla Walker echoed the Viscount. Thank you, Roger. Ymir glanced over at Della. He had such a shit-eating grin on his face. The man had both infuriated her and captured her heart with that same smirk. It was going very well so far. Ymir continued. Before his death, the Grand Vimper Irwin of the Appleford family made it known that he wanted the next capital of the lands to be not for Rhodes, but on Vimper's Cape. Before his death and the deaths of the Appleford families, it was Irwin's wish that our honored princept, Delapanez, be the new Vimper of the Holy Theranus Empire. And there I have my claim to Four Rhodes, Castle Skyreach, and the dynasty of Aino Israelis. I won't say his last name. If you don't know it, study your fucking history. There was a buzz, chatter, whispers, and laughter. Those women aren't your wives, someone shouted. Ymir laughed. He turned to Della. I think we got the order wrong. Graduation, wedding, then coronation. If everyone in the room can agree to that. Everyone did. There was applause, shouts of wonder, and a few people wept at the idea of Ymir ruling over all the lands. The Jatakshian wife of Axel Drokaris flew into the air looking resplendent with her white hair and gleaming armor. At her hips were two gorgeous short swords. But what of the continent you call Reita? You have another wife, La Kurikocha Chamba. She has the wings of the rainbow, proof that Lalindra Namenre herself was her ancestor. She is one who could unite the city-states of Urinland. My family, the Pajolan Wasi, is dead but the hopes of my family remain. A continent of peace, hope, and prosperity. All of the Jataksha rose into the air, including the troublesome Lieutenant Zusi, whose attitude had been tamed by fate, war, and Curry's kindness. We agree, Zusi raised her fist and chanted. Koya la Curry, Koya la Curry, Koya la Curry. All the Winkin chanted with her. Curry, in the front row, turned her tear-streaked face to Ymir. My Kopak, my life, tell them, I cannot. Ymir didn't say a word. He gazed into Curry's blue eyes. She knew that she couldn't hide in her grief and sobbing. Curry burst up, covered in her wedding gown, and flew up above Ymir. If I am to be Koya, then Ymir will be my Kopak. We will bring peace, hope, and prosperity to Orinland, either by our words or our Kurachia. Axel Drokaris's wink and wife, hanging suspended in the air, gazed at Curry. 
but then her eyes dropped to Ymir. She nodded. Her name was Lalindrix Nagina Pajolin, and she was a legend of her people. The fact that Curry had her backing meant everything. There was another roar of approval as the Jataksha floated down from above the crowd. Curry caught Ymir's eye. Show them the rings. Tell them the story. Ah, yes, the story, Della murmured. Ymir quieted the room by displaying the eight rings. The artifacts were no longer a secret. All the world would know of Ymir and his rings. Chapter 52 Della knew this was part of the ceremony, but the idea that people would know about the reforged artifacts still made her nervous. Nonetheless, Emir had insisted this was all part of Coronation Day. He looked so handsome, his yellow hair combed, his eyes the color of polished sanctum wood. He wasn't fighting, and he wasn't fucking, and so his eyes were his own. Still, they radiated confidence as he took in the hall. I use the Akiric rings to kill the demon lords and their armies. Many of you know that Egil Acrador forged them, but he wasn't the first. From Egil's own account of the rings, from a book almost lost to time, there was King Thurin, ruler of a little-known northern kingdom called Santoria on the frozen sea. Before the Age of Union, it was good King Thurin that first forged the rings, and it was King Thurin that used them to encourage all of the nations and all of the people to sign the Theranuvial Agreement. As you know, that led to the Theranus Publicus and 3,000 years of peace. After the founding of the Republic, King Thurin vanished from our world, as did the rings. It was how Egil reforged them, but then those rings were destroyed in dragon fire. Axel Dracarys laughed a little. Don't look at me, pal. I'm just here for the pate. He murmured the words so as not to disturb the ceremony, but his wives scowled at him all the same. Ymir smiled. With these rings, I will be as King Thurin before me. But unlike King Thurin, who lived most of his days as a widower, I will have eight wives. I am going to bind myself to them, and they will be bound to me, and we will enjoy our long peace together. Della saw how deftly the barbarian had avoided the word immortality. Ymir paused. I would have had nine wives, but one sacrificed herself so we could defeat the demon lords. I will not say her name. He stopped to get control of his emotions. Losing Serena had been difficult for him. Saying Serena's name would only complicate things. Again, history had to be edited. But they all loved and appreciated the sacrifice of the elven princept. Della herself often missed smelling her perfume or seeing a flash of her spectral body. Ymir cleared his throat. King Thurin's wife also sacrificed herself, and he was never to love again. It's a sad story. Mine will be far happier. And now, according to ancient Theranus tradition, I will say the new names of my eight wives. Ymir smiled at Della. This is the wedding part. Are you ready? The princep nodded and managed to keep her eyes clear of tears for the moment. Ymir had talked to her and the rest of the women in their harem. Did they want immortality? All of them did if only to love each other until the end of time. And what are their new names? Someone shouted. What is your family name? Ymir addressed the audience. I was born Ymir, son of Yamak, of the Black Wolf Clan. But I am no longer of that clan, and Yamak is no longer my father. I am a son of Old Ironbound, I have chosen a name, as Aino Azraelis chose his name. I am Ymir Yamal Yakir of the Yakiric dynasty, the first of that name. You have my word, I will rule over the Age of Blossoming for a hundred years, and then I will step aside and let someone else rule. I would imagine I will be very tired of the work by that time. 
There were a few whispers of confusion. How could he know he'd lived that long? Most people just raised their fists and shouted their approval. Ymir went on. And now, also according to Theranus tradition, I will call up my wives by their new names, and they will be bound to me, just as I am bound to them. For this is my wedding, and we will do this quick. Even quicker will be my coronation. Garam Sornap, in polished dress armor, held a pillow with eight rings on it. Each had been crafted by Morbuscor smiths and blessed by Fei magic. They would act as focus rings, but they would also tap into the power of the Ring of the Awakened. Ymir reckoned they'd add further enchantments in the coming centuries. Della had stepped to the side, but every one of Ymir's words made her heart swell in her chest. It was fear. It was love. It was joy. She didn't hide the tears trailing down her face. Ymir's own eyes sparkled with tears. Lily Nahena Yakir, I am bound to you, just as you are bound to me. We will walk the Axeman's path together. The Theranus ritual required the first sentence to be legally binding. It was Ymir who added the second. Lily walked up to him while the audience applauded. Ymir took a ring off the pillow. Della was close enough to hear the elf girl whisper, even as she smiled, I was so very afraid that I would have to watch you die. But now we have all eternity. All eternity, Ymir agreed, and slipped the ring on her finger. Lily gasped. Her eyes closed, and then she smiled. Her face was red, and she was sweating a little. That felt very lovely. Who knew immortality would feel a little bit like an orgasm? Lily took her place at his side. No one else would know the magnitude of the sorcery happening on the stage. Ymir called to the swamp woman. Jenny Beljosen Yakir, I am bound to you just as you were bound to me. We will walk the Axeman's path together. Jenny was laughing, crying, and when Ymir put the ring on her finger, her eyes widened, and she fell against Ymir. Oh my, ain't this embarrassing? I came a little, she giggled. Well, I wanted an empire. Looks like I got a really big one. Della had known the swamp woman had been ambitious, heartbreakingly so. And here she was, with not just a swampy little territory, but two continents, and possibly more. Tori would have claim to the Ruby Stonehold. Ruby would inherit the Delfino family once her mother either died or stepped aside. Della caught Beryl's eye, and the mermaid queen just smiled. In the end, the Aquaterab had such different ideas on sex and morality. She was fine with Della becoming sister wives with her daughter. Toriah Welldeep Yakir, Ymir called. Tori ran up and was crying and grabbing hold of Ymir and forcing him down to his knees so he could hug her properly. Everyone laughed. Ymir patted the little woman's back. I have to say the words, Tori, to make the marriage legal. Say them while I hug you, Tori sobbed. And I don't want my old last name. I only want yours, forevermore. Toria Yakir, I am bound to you, just as you are bound to me. We will walk the Axeman's path together. When Tori slipped on the ring, her face turned beet red. She had to hide her face in her hands. Then it was Gatha's turn, and Ymir said the words. When Gatha put on the ring, her eyelids fluttered a bit, but she kept her face stone. Despite the little nugget of ecstasy, Gatha stared into his eyes, not looking at the wedding band that would forever change her soul and her life. Gatha didn't say a word. She just stared into Ymir's eyes with a burning intensity, it was the Farg pang, and for the gruel, it meant far more than any words that could ever be said. Della knew that some orcs would fight this new empire to the death, but the fact that Gatha, the princess of the pits, had married Ymir Virtorg would carry great weight, as would Della Virtorg's marriage to the same man. Ribby didn't wait. She rushed up 
sprouted tentacles, and clung to Ymir as he said the words. Her silvery scales rippled across her pale skin. Ribby had come a long way from loathing all dirt worms to marrying someone she loved and respected. She was to be Caribda Delfino Yakir, and she wore her ring proudly. When she put it on, she got a little grin on her face. I like this immortality business. I'm going to want a big love knot after this. That orgasm was only a little tease. Zizaba couldn't come up as her verum self, not yet. But she did fly up in a shower of sparkles. She had Gertie in a sling that matched her dress. And she was so small, very few would see the baby. Fei ways were so different, no one would say much. Della felt a tingle, thinking everyone in the audience was wondering how the fairy girl would be able to fuck that big man. They would have images of Ziziva with her arms around a cock the size of the fairy. But Ymir said the words, and then used form magic to shrink the ring to fit the fei. Ziziva flew over and sat on Ribby's shoulders, giggling and singing and laughing. Gertie squealed with joy. Curry was sobbing in her chair when Ymir motioned to her. You will keep your name, Koya Lakuri, but I would like to add something to it. Lakuri Kocha Chamba Yakir, I am bound to you, just as you are bound to me. We will walk the Axeman's path together. Curry flew onto the stage and slammed into him, and they both nearly fell. Curry put on her ring and went to hug Gatha, who had finally broken down. Gatha was crying hard now. All of Ymir's new wives were crying. Della swore she wouldn't let her emotions run away with her. But when Ymir turned to her, the woman who was already on the stage, his princept, Della felt her heart explode. She didn't run into his arms, but she walked there, stately, regally, even as her knees weakened. Della hardly heard the words. Never in her long life, her 250 years, had she thought she would marry anyone, especially someone who knew every one of her deepest, darkest secrets. It wasn't the words that finally made Della sob, and it wasn't the ring on her hand or the flutter of the little orgasm deep inside her. Ribby was right. It did feel like a tease. And yet... The feeling of it, a warm, wonderful feeling, continued on. Her douche was different now. The colors in the world were brighter, the smells sharper, and she felt stronger. None of that made Della weep. No, it was when she realized that right there, on that stage, she was going to tell Ymir her secret. She couldn't help it. He had to know. Holding him while everyone in the room applauded, Della whispered into Ymir's ear. We failed all three of those questions of yours, Ymir Yakir. I'm pregnant. Then Della couldn't talk. She was too busy kissing the barbarian and feeling his arms around her as he held her close to his heart. She was home. Chapter 53 That fall, four months after his wedding, Ymir Yamal Yakir found a small ridge overlooking the tents and fires of the Black Wolf Clan. He wasn't afraid of being seen. He wore a bearskin cloak over his elk leather pants and shirt. He was bundled up for the snow, an early autumn storm that carried only a few snowflakes on winds that still remembered summer. He smelled the dry autumn mosses burning, and he was taken back to the vision he'd had in Four Roads over a year earlier. He was wearing all eight of the Akiric rings, like in his vision, but he didn't feel that ache of longing. He was rather surprised. Even from a distance, he recognized his friend Yukor and his former lover, Ilhelda. Yukor was butchering an elk from that morning's hunt, Ilhelda was grinding wheat with the other women. It was life as normal for the Black Wolf Clan. Ymir couldn't help but think how small the encampment was, how simple the life was. 
It was mostly hunting, talking, and family. Simple pleasure, certainly. Ymir saw his father swagger over to Yukor, and the pair talked. Then Ymir's father left and went to talk to an older woman that Ymir didn't recognize. She was probably someone from another clan. It seemed Ymir's father had found a new wife to replace Ymir's mother. It had taken him many a winter to get lonely. To think, just one woman to warm his bed. The idea made Ymir smile. He had eight. Ymir's life wasn't simple, not with his new empire, his new palace, and a new school being built on the cliffs south of Stormcry. As Ymir took in the simple life of the Black Wolf clan, the elk skin tents, the elk carcass steaming in the cold, the women grinding tundra wheat into meal, he realized if he hadn't been cursed four years earlier, he'd still be there. Eventually, he'd have become king of his clan, married to Ilhelda, and they would have had children. He would have followed the rhythms and rituals of the Black Wolf clan, and it would have been a life cut short either by a skirmish with another clan or a run-in with a night bear. He would have gotten a handful of decades and then death. Now, it wasn't just time that Ymir had, but every road of the world was open to him. Still, seeing his clan sisters and battle brothers again filled Ymir with an old anger. He could go down there. He could bend the Black Wolf clan to his will. He would have to kill any number of the warriors, and he would never win their love. But he could kill enough of them to force their obedience. He wouldn't have to stop with the Black Wolf clan, either. He could conquer the entire Axe Tundra. He could add lands to his empire, one that stretched from the north to the south, and all would pay allegiance to him. It was a quick fantasy, an idle dream, and one that sickened him. No. He would do the opposite. He wouldn't allow any of his subjects to venture north of Summertown. The Axe Tundra needed to be wild, free of magic, because there might come a time when the South needed a strong barbarian, untouched by sorcery, to set things right. It was what Fionn Yamal had done a thousand years earlier, and it was what Ymir himself had done, by giving up magic and finishing Fionn's work. Egil Acrador and his demon wives were all dead and gone. As for the five demon kings of Ethra, that was more complicated. Ymir remembered his long conversation with Axel Drukaris, a dragon soul from Ethra, who dealt with the Pentacore, and possibly the game master. But Ymir thought that was warrior bravado. Axel didn't say he'd killed the Pentacore, he just said he'd dealt with them and they wouldn't be a problem again, at least on Raxid. The dragon soul enjoyed conversation, had a quick wit, and liked his own jokes. He was strong, that was evident, but Ymir liked the women of his harem more than their man, especially Finniwig Sebring and Reese Helene, the sorceress and the pirate. Ymir had talked about expanding his empire to Ethra, and for once in the history of the world, all of Rexit would be unified under one king. Surprisingly, Axel wasn't against the idea. It seemed Axel's father had unified his home world, at least the dragons on that world. The humans, however, were too troublesome to ever truly be yoked completely. Axel still spent time in foul water, but he also traveled far and wide using the portal magic of dragons. It was safe now. The shadows of teeth and talon were no more. Axel suggested Ymir might want to visit other worlds. Ymir knew he someday would do just that. For now, though, he had the work of making things better for Thera and Reta. He planned on sending emissaries to Ethra to invite the states there into treaties. The fairies in the Undergem Guild, especially Queen Didi, were very excited about the idea. It meant even more profits. Ymir could see a day, especially with his long life, where he would have palaces all over the entire world, filled with wives and children, ringing with songs and happy squeals. He wanted the Axe Tundra to stay as it was, as it had always been. For though the people were plagued by killing winters, they were happy and peaceful. And if his father, or Yukor, ever heard news of King Ymir, 
the new Vimper of the Yakiric Empire, and if they reached out, Ymir might talk with them. But he knew his people well enough to know they wouldn't come seeking him. The minute he'd been cursed, Ymir was dead to them. So be it. And when he perfected his dragon magic, he might put up wards to keep the demons and armies out of the axe tundra forever. It would become a sanctuary. Ymir moved off the ridge and walked down the other side, away from the Black Wolf clan. He'd seen enough. He no longer had a life in the north. His life and all of his loves were in the south. Instead of using a portal, he accessed the anima spinning in his core and shifted into a dragon with black and gold scales. Axel had given him a teardrop-shaped amulet, which helped him transform without tearing up his clothes. Undoubtedly, Axel would continue to tutor Ymir in dragon soul magic. Axel's scales were black with yellowish-orange edges. He smelled of burned sugar and sweet smoke. Ymir had his own smell, a fire roasting nene and sisi berries. It was perfect for him. Ymir battled Axel. The dragon soul knew that Ymir wasn't a dragon skin, a human that went through rituals to become a dragon. But then Ymir wasn't Alfarian. The Akiric rings had allowed him to become something completely different. Ymir never thought he'd spend time talking to a dragon. The day of his wedding had been so special. He still remembered how Lily and Jenny Bell had brought him the Nene during their wedding feast, which was also the feast to celebrate the birth of their empire. When he'd eaten the nuts and berries, so delicious, so special, he knew he'd ventured north to look upon his people again. And now that task was over. He turned his wings south, enjoying the wind, enjoying his view of Summertown, the frozen sea, winter home, and eventually the cliffs and beaches of the Sorrow Coast. He followed roughly the same route he'd taken before to get to Old Ironbound. He'd been a stranger back then. Now he was a king. He couldn't help but be grateful to the Axeman for the path he'd cut for him. He returned to Vemper's Cape at night, and he saw the wolf moon set into the weeping sea. It wouldn't return for many years, but Ymir wasn't about to worry where he would be and what he would be doing. His feet would remain in the day. Chapter 54 it was five years later, and the wolf moon rose that autumn. Ymir stood on the patio of his palace at the top of the Librarium Citadel, though it wasn't called that anymore. It was called the Palace Citadel. Tori had overseen the construction of three new floors to the Citadel, which was rather similar to the zoo in the end. There were still books in the Citadel, certainly, but most of them were from Gatha's own personal library, a fair number from the Hyendel collection were shelved there as well. There were three special tomes in the stacks, The Knights of Fire and Blood by Ymir Yamal Yakir, Eric Sorrow by Ymir, and The Crippled Cicada by Lily Nehenna Yakir. The rest of the books had been moved to the new location of the Magestrial Universitas Collegium, south of Stormcry. And yes, there was a new illuminate spire that contained all of the books that Ymir had used to forge the Eight Rings. That included Egil's work, the Akor Oriot, otherwise known as the Burned Book. Serena hadn't transcribed the final section, but Ymir had pieced together the story of King Thurin from notes he took, and from references that mentioned him in other books on ringology. Perhaps Serena didn't want Ymir to think he could be the next King Thurin, or else he might have rebelled at the idea of an empire for himself. Regardless, Ymir was happy the burnt book wasn't in his palace. It was a foul thing. The new campus was a sight to behold, with a central library, four college towers, and four practice fields. There was a market there, but this one was built in caves honeycombing the cliffs. Stairwells lit with sunfire torches led to shops perched on patios connected to the rock. It was gorgeous. Brodor Bootblack and Phoebe Amalbiab had worked together on the construction. There was a tavern there, the Drunk Mermaid, 
where Brodor liked to drink and brag that marrying Phoebe had been the best decision of his life. They were an unlikely couple, but Phoebe did have the power to trigger Brodor's inconvenience when she got horny. Brodor sometimes found that troubling. His complaints made Garam and Ymir laugh. The three still drank together, sometimes at the drunk mermaid, sometimes at the angel's kiss in Stormcry, and sometimes at the horny unicorn in the sea stair market. The unicorn's ut had changed owners, and so it had a new name. Sometimes when Brodor complained, Ymir thought he might have another ex-wife soon. For the time being, though, the couple were praised for their ingenuity and architectural skill. The cliffside marketplace below the new university was a masterpiece of engineering and magic. The school itself, the student housing, a new chapel of the tree, the whole campus was just as grand. And since Stella Panez had found a new job as one of the vempresses of the Yakiric Empire, Ojan Tej was the honored princept at the new school. Her gambit giving Ymir all of Edrin Hyendel's books had paid off. She'd been awarded the highest position in all of Theron Academia. She ruled the Magistrial Collegium Universitas, though some called it the Vemper's School. Most of the professors who'd worked at Old Ironbound made the transition to the new Magistrial. Phoebe Amalbiab, Issa Leal, Denalia Fisher-King, Niall Preet, Korga, all were back in classrooms at the new school. Garum Sornap and Brodor, though, had gotten tired of the scholars and the grind. They remained with Ymir and stayed in their rooms at the Imperial Palace. Garum was now the Minister of Sunfire Magic, and Brodor was the Minister of Form Magic. They had different sorcerers wanting to become the Ministers of Flow and Moons, but so far, Ymir hadn't found anyone he really liked. That could wait. Now, when people mentioned Old Ironbound, they were talking about Ymir's palace and surrounding buildings. It was a busy place. Diplomats came and went. Officials arrived requesting aid. The families of the slain royals came to see the new leader. Visiting governmental officials gave reports. And a variety of grifters came seeking riches, but they didn't last long. Ymir, with the power of the veil tearing, didn't suffer fools. With the ring, it was easy to track down the rest of the White Rose Society and remove them from the world. Della did most of that bloody work, give a silent scream assassin portal magic, and it was amazing how many problems disappeared overnight. Standing on his patio, Ymir wore the same bear cloak he'd worn when he'd visited the Axe Tundra five years earlier. He turned from the wolf moon setting to take in the palace he and his wives shared. They had four levels. They'd redone the sixth floor, redone the seventh, and constructed a new floor where the illuminate spire had been. Now it was Ymir's private study and his bedroom. Tori had added two attics, one for Ziziva and Gertie, and one for Curry. The Jataksha warrior loved her high little nest on the ninth floor. Curry was still studying magic all these years later, it wouldn't be long before Curry could cast portal magic herself. Curry was often in Almaquataka, working with the Wasis and governors there. At times, she was unsure of herself, but more and more, Curry was as queenly as the rest of Ymir's wives. Ziziva flew down from her ninth floor loft in a shower of golden sparks. She turned from her Winkle self to her Verum self, and then grabbed Ymir to hug him hard. A sand letter, Ymiri, dearie, from my mother. She wants to step aside. I will become the fairy queen, and I will rule the Undergem Guild. Me, me, me. She kissed him over and over, on the cheeks, on the chin, on the nose. Then she gave him a long, sweet kiss that left them both breathless. I like that, I do. I like that too true. The fairy girl grabbed his ass. Maybe when the kids are asleep, you can get my honeypot creamy. Maybe it's time for another glimmer time, and we can have more glow rain madness and more woggle spark wonder. Ymir was surprised. Again? Isn't it customary for fairies to only have one daughter? Ziziva giggled. 
I no longer report to anyone, anyone at all. They report to me. And we'll need more babies if we are going to go to the lakes, rivers, and waterways of Ethra. The Westy West needs the Besty Best, and the Fae are the only way E. Gold, gems, jewels. And Zocalotti, he asked. Ziziva booped him on his nose. A paradise tree number three in Foulwater Fair. We should do it there if we dare. They'd opened another Zocalotti store in the Majestrials Cliff Market, though between the two of them, they provided the Zoka beans for the entire continent. They had a large factory in Josentown, near the palace, where they sometimes stayed when Jenny Bell wanted to go home. Ymir grinned. We won't need to conquer Ethra with swords. We will conquer it with the Amora Zoka. People love sex and chocolate, Ziziva screamed. You can talk to your friend Axel over there. Not exactly my friend, Ymir said. And from what I understand, he and his harem aren't there all that much. They have portal magic that takes them beyond the stars. I don't need the stars. Ziziva laughed and put his hand on her ass. I have you. Ymir heard a ruckus in the main room of his palace, what had been the sixth floor. Suddenly, he found himself under attack by a demon dog straight out of the abyss, by a little blonde-haired girl named Gertie, by a powerful warrior named Cormac, clever and ruthless and brave, by another warrior princess named Gara, as savage and headstrong as her mother, by another strong soul named Tilly, who was too small to go into battle on her own. One of Fluffy's tentacles grabbed Ymir's arm, the hellhound let out an unearthly roar. Then a little fairy girl grabbed his leg. Gertie was dressed in black and had fake horns strapped to her little golden head. A white-haired boy, four years old, launched himself off the demon and landed squarely on Ymir's chest. Cormac, too, had fake horns, which made his white hair look even whiter. A green-skinned little toddler crawled on whirring hands and knees, they couldn't keep Gara in a dress. No, they had to give her pants, if only to save her knees. Then came a very loud squawk from Ymir's newest baby, another girl, with her mother's red hair and freckles. Tori carried Tilly into battle. Ymir was overwhelmed. He found himself on his back, though the little fairy girl had flown off in her winkle self. Cormac put a foot on Ymir's chest. I am mighty Cormac of old Ironbound. I am victorious. I will see my enemies flee before me and will rejoice in the weeping of the women. Tori didn't like that. Cormac, you care. That is no way for a little boy to talk. Cormac wasn't victorious for long. He found himself bowled over by the orc toddler. It took a minute, but Gara finally got her foot on Ymir. Victoribus! She raised a little fist and snapped out her little tusks. By this time, Tilly was kicking her feet and squawking, trying to wrestle herself from her mother's arms. This whole time, Gertie stood back, her eyes narrowed. Then she saw her chance. She came sweeping in, gold sparkles dazzling Gara, until the orc was forced back onto her bottom. Then Gertie transformed into her Verum self, the biggest of Ymir's children, and she sat down on his chest. I'm the real winner, Daddy. I waited for Gara to push Cormac off, and then I struck. Mommy says it's better to win by being sneaky than to win by being strong. Ziziva giggled. And that's my little daughter, dear. It's just better to win than to lose, always. Always, Mommy, Gertie said. Fluffy stood next to them, drooling, smiling, all of its eyes happy. Tori's shampoo had worked perfectly. The hellhound didn't stink. Tori kept her washed, clean, and happy. Oddly enough, Ymir trusted the demon with the most precious treasures in his life, his wives and children. Having a fiend from the abyss on his side did give him a certain peace of mind. 
Tori came over with the baby and set her on the floor. Tilly had just learned to sit up. But she wanted to do so much more. In frustration, she started to cry. Fluffy took care of that. She scooped up the baby, gently removed Gertie from Ymir's chest, and put little Tilly in his arms. Ymir stood up and held his little baby tight. Tilly sighed. It was clear she felt completely safe and happy in Ymir's arms. Tori grinned, tears in her eyes. Aw, she loves her Uber, just like I do. Gara pushed herself onto her legs. She stood there, gripping Ymir's leg, and then reached her hands up to him. She retracted her tusks. Up, up, Gara up too. Ymir held Tilly in his right arm and then plucked Gara off the floor with his left. Gara was one solid little she-orc. He liked how heavy she was. Gatha came out, hands on her hip. There you two are. Gara, Cormac, it's time for your bath. I don't need a bath, woman, the little boy said with his chin upraised. Mighty warriors don't need baths. Gara barked. No baths. Gatha came out onto the patio, moving quickly, snatching up Cormac and throwing him over her shoulder. In seconds, she had her daughter in her arms as well. And who is the mighty warrior? The she-orc asked, her tusks out. Cormac giggled. You are, Mama Gatha. Gara tried to repeat what Cormac had said, but it came out in toddler gibberish. But one word was clear. Kisses. Gatha let Ymir kiss his little green daughter. Good night, Gara. Good night, Obi. His children sometimes called him father, and sometimes they used the Morbiscore words, Uber or Ubi. All of his wives talked to their children in their native language, so all of the children would learn the languages of the various races as they learned pidgin. The withering was gone which was one of the reasons why Della had gotten pregnant with Cormac. Where is Della? Ymir asked. Gatha retracted her tusks. At her desk, working. She asked me to take care of Cormac tonight. He is his father's son. He battles all forms of obedience. It is admirable in a warrior. It is exhausting in a child. Cormac was strong-willed which wasn't a surprise given his parentage. However, he was a good little boy when he needed to be, and he was very protective of his sisters, even Gertie, who liked to trick the little boy. Gertie wasn't just smart, she was brilliant, which again wasn't a surprise. Her mother and father had become rich using their wits. Fluffy gave Ymir one last hug with one of her tentacles, and then trotted back inside with Gatha, Cormac, and Gara. Ziziva took Gertie's hand. Give Daddykins a kiss before sleepy time. A kiss for Ymir? Gertie's laughter sounded so grown up. Yes, mother, I can. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do the winkle tongue. You can, Gertie Gert Gert, Ziziva sang. It will be easy, and it won't hurt. You sing, you rhyme, you laugh and giggle. You give your tongue just a little bit of wiggle. Gertie smiled and couldn't help but laugh. You're so silly, Mommy. Then Gertie yanked on Ymir's shirt to get him to kneel down. She kissed his cheek. Love, love, love you, Uber Daddy, Oob Oob. Ymir gave his oldest daughter a hug, and she went with Ziziva back inside. Tori took Tilly, and while Ymir was still kneeling, both the Dwab and her little Dwabi gave Ymir a hug and a kiss. Gosh, me underground, Tori said. But I love you, Ymir, and I love our family. I never thought I'd be so important and so loved and so accepted. Ymir nodded and looked into her twinkling green eyes, swimming with tears. Tilly looked at her mother in wonder, then at Ymir. A thousand memories filled Ymir of the first time he'd met Tori and how happy and good-natured she was, her passion for cooking and helping others, her faith in her potions and her desire to tame Fluffy. 
In all their time together, she had been so full of life and happiness. And now that life and happiness had been passed on to a darling little baby girl. Ymir bent and kissed Tori's cheek. He whispered into her ear, I love you. I love our daughter. I am so very glad that you love yourself enough that you can love me. Oh, gosh, Tori said. She wheeled with Tilly. There you go, Mr. Man, saying such nice things. I'm going to go before I embarrass myself by blubbering. Ymir watched them leave, Tilly squeaking with joy as Tori held her close. Seeing Tori and their daughter, Ymir thought of the trouble still affecting the stoneholds in both the Sunrise and the Sunset Mountains. Five years later, and the dwarven underground cities were still being attacked by demons from the deep. Yes, there were still troubles here and there, but for the most part, the people of Raxid enjoyed peace and prosperity. Ymir was glad for that. The first five years of the Age of Blossoming seemed to justify the name. But Ymir knew that the peace wouldn't hold forever, so he'd enjoy it while he could. And he would help Della where he could. She was working constantly, tirelessly, to keep their empire organized and running well. Walking back through his palace room, Ymir heard the sounds of his wives preparing his children for bedtime. He'd make it back in time to give them their final goodnight kisses. First, though, he brought Kaif down to Della. Walking the familiar steps of the Librarium Citadel, watching the moon's magic crackling across the stacks, he had so many memories of this place, both as a scholar and as a king. He walked by his second-floor table and touched the wood. Sometimes he worked there, but more and more he was in his study at the very top of the Citadel, surrounded by books he was either reading or writing. He thought of all the late nights and early mornings at that desk, puzzling out spell books on the Akuric Rings, reading histories, or enjoying the plays of Wilmer Swordwright. So many books, so many memories. He went to the railing and watched Della working. The sunfire lanterns painted her very serious face in a soft light. She seemed as beautiful and as timeless as the first time he'd met her. He leapt over the railing and whispered, Calum Calarum. He floated down to her office and sat on the familiar chair. Della frowned while she wrote something on sand parchment. Then she laughed. The more things change, the more they stay the same. You there in your chair, looking guilty. And me trying to hold the chaos at bay through paperwork. There was another attack at the Ruby Stonehold, but the dwarves managed to repulse them. This is the second raid this month. Are you going to tell me all the bad news on such a pretty night? Ymir asked. It's the rise of the wolf moon. The last time that happened, you still didn't want to join my harem. Della sighed. Oh, how very wrong you are. I wanted to share your bed with your horny princesses for years, but I couldn't. You know that story. But as we've seen, the reveler's moon brings chaos. There is more bad news. Has Curry told you about the eagle screams attacking the floating cities of Reta? Or what about the Miran raids on the shores of the elven forests? It seems there is a pirate king who wants revenge on the Olira for crimes 500 years old. And on Reta, your friend the dragon has been gone from Falwater for over a year. There is a snake king in the mountains who seems to have taken up the experiments of the Pentacore and merged the demon monkeys with the strange forest dwarves there. Sweetleaf has been attacked, and there is a real chance this snake king will conquer the Morbu forests and the Nectar grasslands. And while our Ribrib -rib has gathered up far more Aquaterib families than I thought possible, war between the Merfolk families is always a possibility. We will have to get involved. Good thing you and most of your wives are adept at flow magic. I never liked breathing water. Ymir held up the hand wearing the flesh steel. I enjoy the blue dark. He wiggled the veiled tear. I have an idea of the adventures ahead of us. We still have some time. 
And Ojan Tej says that the new scholars at the Magestrial are very promising. We will have new sorcerers, new warriors, to deal with these threats. I am surprised that Gatha hasn't opened portals to take care of these issues herself. She is handling her warrior's boredom very well. As you seem to be, Della said quietly. For Gatha, she has Gara. Raising gruel babies is war enough for most. You say that as if raising Cormac is easy. Ymir felt such love for the former princept, who was now a Vimpress. Cormac is as easy as he will ever be. I suppose when he reaches adolescence, we'll have to conquer another world, because he won't want to share the same world with us. Della went around the edge to the desk and sat down on Ymir's lap. She kissed his neck, his cheek, his lips. Then she gazed into his eyes. The Midnight Guild was right to fear you. The White Rose Society was foolish to underestimate you. Both are gone. The world has changed. And the old demon lords are dead. The world is free of the withering. Not bad for a fucking barbarian with a douja. Not bad at all, Ymir grinned. That night, the dreams of sex started again. Even as the wolf moon blazed in the night sky, a bloody orb of passion, danger, and more troubles to come. Chapter 55 A year later, the wolf moon sank into the sea for the last time. It would be another five years before it returned. Ymir woke from the dream. It had been a year of erotic dreams, of war of love. In the dream, Lily had woken him up by easing herself down on his face. He couldn't see her face because of her swelling belly. Jenny Bell woke him up as well by sucking on his oot. Like Lily, Jenny was also pregnant. Ymir wasn't surprised that the dream had become reality. Lily straddled his face while Jenny lowered her lovely oheezy down onto his oot. Ymir thrust up into the swamp woman while he shoved his tongue into the elf's tight sex. He knew the two pregnant women were kissing. Their bellies were big, but so were their breasts. Jenny was already chesty, but pregnant, those mounds swelled even more. It wasn't long before Jenny Bell was coming on his cock. Then Lily came, and then Ymir forced his tongue deep into Lily's sex, wanting it as deep as his cock was in Jenny. He came hard, filling her, like he'd done on the night he'd gotten her pregnant. With each orgasm, Ymir felt the power fill him. Now, when he had sex, he felt the animus part of his core drink in the magic. Because he was wearing the Ring of the Awakened, his wives felt it too. It was like when they had sex with Ribby. They were all so connected, it made sex better. It also made it oddly strategic. It was a way of filling their cores with power. Ymir hadn't done much killing since the Night of Blood, but he'd done some. And when he took the life of an enemy, that also gave him power. But he was like Curry now. He preferred the bedroom to the battlefield. That night, when the wolf moon set, Ymir laughed with Lily and Jenny when they heard Ribby's snores coming up through their palace rooms. Ymir was brought back to swimming with Ribby as a merman and fighting against a rogue Aquaterab family on the dawn coast of Ethra. The Brinib family had formed a coalition with some other merfolk families, and their goal was to take over the entire Weeping Sea. Ymir and his Sharab stopped their conquest. The battle ended quickly, with Ymir encasing whole regiments in ice, or boiling them in the water. At one point, he turned into his dragon form and chewed through the Aquaterab forces in a splash of bubbles and blood. Seeing Ribby's homeland in the dark blue had been an amazing experience, and while Lily and Jenny Bell couldn't keep their flow magic working, Ymir had slept many nights alone with Ribby in her sleeping nets. Around them glimmered the underwater city, 
with any number of sea creatures swimming through the watery avenues between the buildings. Their travels eventually took them to Reta, where Ymir and everyone in his harem fought the Snake King, freeing Sweetleaf and the Silvicor dwarves, and letting them decide if they wanted to join the Yakiric Empire or not. For now, there was much debate, and most were waiting for Axel Dracaris to return to get his opinion. Ymir thought they simply wanted to buy time. He'd let them. He already had most of the world under his control, and the control of his wives. He recalled one night when Ribby kissed him in the glow of their strange underwater magic, and told him that she wanted to have his children. She hoped for a boy, as fierce and as strong as Cormac. When Ymir had first met Ribby, she would have made a horrible mother. Now Ribby would be an angelic mother, especially to a boy. Ribby said she wasn't ready just yet, and besides, Lily and Jenny wanted to be next. Now, months later, Ymir lay on his bed, with Jenny on his right and Lily on his left. The sunrise glowed in the big window of their palace room. He heard Tori up and making breakfast, and he had memories of their visit to the Ruby Stonehold. Her Amr and Uber were far kinder to Tori. It seemed that Tori becoming a queen was enough for them to be more accepting of her appearance. And when she led their forces against the demons in the dark caves, using her powerful form magic, that also made them rethink the exiled dwab. With Fluffy towering over her, Tori commanded respect, if not awe. Ymir had walked with Tori through the caves, over ornate bridges, onto subterranean balconies that showed how wonderful the dwarven underground kingdom was. Every stone was carved into beautiful sculptures, and there was a subtle play between the shadows and their sunfire lanterns. Minerals in the stones gleamed. It was also striking that the caves went so deep. For the most part, they kept Fluffy in her abyss, but during a fight, they would summon the hellhound, and she would fight next to them. Without her daily baths, though, Fluffy was very smelly. That helped fill her enemies with terror. When the fight was over, Ymir would send Fluffy away using the veiled tear ring. Ymir's travels didn't end with the underwater and the underground kingdoms. He went south to Reta, also known as Urinland, to the Jataksha. There, he'd fought eagle screams in the sky castles of Curry's homeland. He slept in Wassies, next to a fire burning to keep them warm against the chill air of the heavens. Curry also said she wanted to have a baby with him, but she would go after Ribby. Those two were getting along so well. Curry loved the sweet fruit of her fate, and she would light candles in memory of Serena Sia. From the sky cities to the south, Ymir had traveled to the shadow-haunted streets and wrought-iron railings of Josentown. There, in a new mansion built for them, Jenny Bell asked for a night alone with Ymir. They ate a fried seafood meal, drank powerful red wine, and then Jenny Bell had taken him to bed. It was clear what she wanted, a baby in her belly. Ymir was more than happy to help her with that. From Josentown, they used a portal to reach the elven forests to the east. Queen Ellen Velia had stepped down, and Lily was the new elven queen. Yes, she did cause a controversy, but she preached love and tolerance, and the people listened. Those that wanted to wear their esses wore it. Those that didn't joined the cult of chaos and desire without fear, and enjoyed their bodies to the fullest. Ymir and Lily had made love in a treetop bed, up in the highest branches of a sanctum tree, with the cool wind making the leaves dance. Greenholm was every bit as beautiful as the stories said, with waterfalls and fountains mingling with the hills and trees of the landscape. The Vale Tear Ring had shown Ymir when the Mirren pirates would attack the port city of Starshine, and so he and his harem were ready. Again, the Olira had created such a beautiful place, an oceanside city of sculpted marble, clean streets, and delicate docks that kissed the water. That port city became their battleground. Blood filled the water. Spellfire filled the sky. 
Ymir had mastered his first exhalant, Inferno, and he turned the Mirren ships into torches. The battle was quick, but in the end, the threat remained, for the Pirate King hadn't joined his navy for the attack. The Pirate King had warding magic to keep himself hidden, but he'd probably think twice about attacking the Olyra again. Ymir was taking his time learning the dragon magic, but when Axel Dracarys returned, he would show Ymir more. The flow portal magic only took them to places on Raxid. With dragon magic, they could go to other worlds. For now, though, Raxid was all the world Ymir wanted. From Greenholm, they traveled to the Blood Steps, where Ymir finally ate sweet cream in the arena seats of the Sunash Pits. He watched fierce warriors fight on the sands, but it wasn't to the death. The gladiatorial games were more about the spectacle than anything else. He and Gatha, though, did see some fighting in the Gruel Lands. They hunted down outlaw orcs who'd been raiding farms and ranches, not unlike Golnash the Betrayer. But like Golnash, they were killed by Ymir in the flash of his axe. He felt their dujas dwindle as he drank in their life energy to add to his animus core. He didn't get their spirits. Those would go on to the afterlife. After restoring peace to the Blood Steps, Ymir and his wives traveled to Castle Skyreach and Four Roads. Once again, Ymir and his harem enjoyed that busy place, with its casinos, markets, and parties. Ymir knew enough of the bloody history of Castle Skyreach that he preferred to stay in the suites of the Undergem Guild. They visited Edrin Hyendel's house, which had been repaired. It was now a library in its own right, and contained the old elf's less controversial works. Ymir took numerous trips to other cities to see the university at Pansaloka, the museums of Crean, the big courtrooms in Kingwater, in what had been the Farmington Collective. The Viscount, Roger Nelnap, gave them the tour. Then a simple portal magic spell later, they were home, in the palace citadel. Lily and Jenny had swelled as new life grew inside them. They weren't alone in being pregnant. The entire world had changed since the withering was no more. In some places, people talked of embracing monogamy between two people. In others, they knew it would take a generation for there to be enough boys, and so harems continued, and probably would continue for a long time. Throughout all their adventures, in every city, nearly every night, Ymir and his wives had the erotic dreams. They all had their theories. Laying in their bed after the sex, Ymir stroked the swollen bellies of his two pregnant wives. The erotic dreams are probably just an echo of the night when we had the ritual sex to forge the first part of the Ring of the Awakened. We cracked the entrance to the stair. So don't it make sense that something happened down there? We need to go down there. Lily had her doubts. But we've checked there before. Jenny Bell touched her cheek. Yes, but the Reveler's Moon is gone. And I felt something shift last night. Something is different. Between you and me, I'm hoping for a miracle. Lily's doubt turned to hope. They were wise enough to trust Jenny Bell's feelings. The three of them dressed, and Ymir had memories of them in Jenny Bell's suite in the flow apartments. Those days seemed both so long ago, and just like yesterday. When they walked through their kitchen, Tilly was up, trying to help her mother with Kaif and breakfast. Tori threw them a glance. And where are you three headed? She knew something was up, but Ymir didn't want to go into detail. The little dwab could worry so. We'll be back, Ymir said simply. What are you doing up so early? Me, Daddy, Tilly said in a happy little voice. I wanted to help with breakfast, Tori chuckled. She likes to work as much as she likes to eat. Ymir left the dwab, but she wasn't the only one awake. Gatha was reshelving some books she'd removed. When she saw them, the she-orc librarian went over and hugged them all. I woke early from a dream. 
I think I know where you are going. Join us, Ymir said. The she-orc stared into Ymir's eyes. I will. Gara won't be up for another couple of hours. Tori said she'd listen for her. Ymir wasn't surprised to see Della at her desk, working. She rose. I know my school enough to know when a morning starts out restless. Are we going down into the scrollery? Deeper than that, Ymir said. Della smiled. I like going deeper. Curry came flying through the dragon archway. She landed. Dreams. We're here because of the dreams. She wore her armor and her short swords. She was ready for trouble. Ymir thought she was overdressed, though he wasn't going to say a word. He just hugged her and kissed her cheek. Ribby came flying after her, water dripping from her body. Moon's magic let her fly, though it was strange to see her zooming about with tentacles instead of wings. Beryl Delfino had stepped down, and now Ribby was the Ocean Mother Divine. Ribby used her tentacles to roll across the floor. Curry woke up to fly. I went to swim. I better fucking enjoy my freedom while I can. When I have babies, I'll be trapped like all those other unlucky bitches. I am not unlucky, Gatha growled. Ribby hugged the she-orc with her tentacles. You know what I mean. You do have less freedom. And what are we scheming? And what are we doing? Ziziva zoomed around them, covering them in sparkles, before she dropped down and shifted into her verum self. And my little Gertie is the best thing ever, mean old Rib Rib. She's a sleepy sleep right now. Ymir grinned. Is Tori also listening for Gertie? The Dwab is the bestest of the bestest, Ziziva replied. When I realized it was all a party, I came flying down. Ymir couldn't help but see the similarities between that morning and his life. He'd started with just Lily and Jenny Bell, and soon the two women had become three, four, five, all the way up to eight. We've checked down there before, Gatha snapped out her tusks. Let's hurry and get back so we can help Tori. Della gripped Ymir's hand. Down the steps to the scrollery they went. They took the special staircase down even farther, down through the catacombs to the natural caves, and across the petrified wood bridge until they entered the underground room. The entrance to the stair. The golden archway was the same, as was the cracked black rock underneath. The place was dark and empty, and the only light was the light they brought with them. Della and Gatha lit the sunfire torches. The furniture wasn't dusty at all, but it was still lush and beautiful. But the chamber was empty, dark, silent. Ymir approached the archway. He traced the cracks that had appeared on that fateful night. Jenny Bell scowled. I really thought something had changed down here. I really thought that... A tear trickled down Lily's cheek. We thought there might be a miracle. One of the sunfire torches flickered, but there wasn't any kind of breeze. Then Ymir smelled it, the familiar perfume, the musk of Serena Sia. The cracks in the black rock vanished, and the inky darkness of the stone seemed to grow even darker. Then the surface of the wall shimmered, as if the stone had liquefied. A pale hand emerged, and then an arm and then the dark hair and pretty face of Serena Sia herself. She was naked, tall, and proud. She was not the shadowy ghost she'd been for much of Ymir's time at the school. The dark liquefied stone became a bright, shining light. Ymir put a hand up to his face to block some of the glare. Through that gateway into the universe, he could see a series of staircases and bridges, covering vast distances over an unimaginable abyss of stars. Della approached her sister, Princept. Della took Serena's hand. You're warm. You can't be alive, Serena. You can't be. I'm not alive, Serena whispered. Then she laughed, a full, lusty laugh.
The dark-haired elf stepped back and raised her hand. From her hands descended shadows that soon became a dress to cover her nakedness. But I am not dead either, Della. As always, Ymir, your adventures have given me such an odd existence. I can exist down here, near the stair, for I am its guardian, as well as the protector of this world. The stair leads to heavenly worlds and hellish realms. There are angels, and there are devils, far more powerful than Egil Acrador could ever hope to be. It took over five years for me to realize I wasn't dead. Then, with the rising of the wolf moon last year, I started the journey. I was lonely, full of desire, and I know you felt me through the dreams. It took another year for me to walk here, to be here, for this moment. I can't stray from the entrance to the stair, so I hope you all will visit often. Oh, Serena, we have so much to show you. Jenny Bell spun up a portal into the kitchen of their palace room. All the kids were up, and Tori was a bit frazzled, but the dwab got them through the portal and into the stairs' entrance room. Ymir turned to see his family, his eight wives, his four children, all bathed in the flickering light of the ultimate doorway. So much beauty, so much life, so much love. Serena slid up next to him. Her hand found his. Don't be like King Thurin and go running off to explore the mysteries of the universe just yet, Ymir. I didn't translate that last section of Egil's book for a reason. You need to stay right here on Raxid. You have two wives with babies on the way, and you have other children, which, judging by their parentage, won't be easy to raise. They will be headstrong and as stubborn as their father, and as wonderful. Then the little children grabbed Ymir, tackling him, and he glanced up to see Curry and Serena embracing. Curry was crying. Of course she was. Della was all smiles, and the rest of his wives were laughing at this turn of events. Lily had mentioned a miracle, and this was truly miraculous. You may remember that Octavado had said eight was the perfect number of wives. However, Ymir had always liked the number nine. Serena wouldn't be able to leave the room. This was her life now, guarding the entrance to the stair. They would all have to come down to visit her. Ymir lifted his babies off him, and they toddled back to their mothers. Della and Serena stood with the women and the children. Ymir's children. He turned to look at the shimmering doorway into infinity, how many worlds would he visit? How many adventures would he have? What books were there? What other languages? What other histories existed? He was curious, and he longed for new experiences. However, he turned away from the entrance to the stair. Yes, there were whole universes to explore. But right then, he was staring at a universe all of its own his wives, his children, his life.